the piazza. With fairest flowers, whilst summer lasts, and I live here, fidele. When I removed into the country, it was to occupy an old-fashioned farmhouse which had no piazza, a deficiency the more regretted because not only did I like piazzas, as somehow combining the coziness of indoors with the freedom of outdoors, and it is so pleasant to inspect your thermometer there, but the country round about was such a picture that in berry time no boy climbs hill or crosses vale without coming upon easels planted in every nook and sunburnt painters painting there, a very paradise of painters, the circle of the stars cut by the circle of the mountains, at least so looks it from the house, though once upon the mountains no circle of them can you see. Had the site been chosen five rods off, this charmed ring would not have been. The house is old, Seventy years since, from the heart of the hearthstone hills, they quarried the Kaaba, or holy stone, to which, each Thanksgiving, the social pilgrims used to come. So long ago that, in digging for the foundation, the workmen used both spade and axe, fighting the troglodytes of those subterranean parts, sturdy roots of sturdy wood, encamped upon what is now a long landslide of sleeping meadow, sloping away from my poppy-bed. Of that knit wood but one survivor stands, an elm, lonely through steadfastness. Whoever built the house, he builded better than he knew, or else Orion, in the zenith, flashed down his Damocles' sword to him some starry night, and said, build there, for how otherwise could it have entered the builder's mind that, upon the clearing being made, such a purple prospect would be his? Nothing less than Greylock, with all his hills about him, like Charlemagne among his peers. Now, for a house so situated in such a country, to have no piazza for the convenience of those who might desire to feast upon the view, and take their time and ease about it, seemed as much of an omission as if a picture-gallery should have no bench. For what but picture-galleries are the marble halls of these same limestone hills? Galleries hung, month after month anew, with pictures ever fading into pictures ever fresh. And beauty is like piety. You cannot run and read it, tranquillity and constancy with, nowadays, an easy chair are needed. For though of old, when reverence was in vogue, and indolence was not, the devotees of nature, doubtless, used to stand and adore, just as in the cathedrals of those ages the worshippers of a higher power did, yet in these times of failing faith and feeble knees, we have the piazzas and the pew. During the first year of my residence, the more leisurely to witness the coronation of Charlemagne, weather permitting, they crown him every sunrise and sunset, I chose me, on the hillside bank nearby, a royal lounge of turf, a green velvet lounge with long moss-padded back, while at the head, strangely enough, there grew, but I suppose for heraldry, three tufts of blue violets, in a field argent of wild strawberries, and a trellis with honeysuckle I set for canopy. Very majestical lounge, indeed, so much so that here, as with the reclining majesty of Denmark in his orchard, a sly earache invaded me but if damps abound at times in Westminster Abbey, because it is so old, why not within this monastery of mountains, which is older? A piazza must be had. The house was wide, my fortune narrow, so that to build a panoramic piazza 
one round and round, it could not be. Although, indeed, considering the matter by rule and square, the carpenters, in the kindest way, were anxious to gratify my furthest wishes at I've forgotten how much a foot. Upon but one of the four sides would prudence grant me what I wanted. Now which side? To the east, that long camp of the hearthstone hills fading far away towards Quito, and every fall a small white flake of something peering suddenly, of a coolish morning, from the topmost cliff, the season's new-dropped lamb, its earliest fleece, and then the Christmas dawn, draping those dim highlands with red-barred plaids and tartans, goodly sight from your piazza that. Goodly sight. But to the north is Charlemagne. Can't have the hearthstone hills with Charlemagne. Well, the south side. Apple trees are there, pleasant of a balmy morning in the month of May, to sit and see that orchard, white budded as for a bridal, and in October one green arsenal yard, such piles of ruddy shot. Very fine, I grant, but to the north is Charlemagne. The west side, look, an upland pasture, alleying away into a maple wood at top, sweet in opening spring, to trace upon the hillside, otherwise gray and bare, to trace, I say, the oldest paths by their streaks of earliest green. Sweet indeed, I can't deny, but to the north is Charlemagne. So Charlemagne he carried it. It was not long after 1848, and somehow about that time, all round the world, these kings, uh, they had the casting vote, and voted for themselves. No sooner was ground broken than all the neighborhood, neighbor dives in particular, broke, too, into a laugh. Piazza to the north, winter piazza, wants of winter midnights to watch the aurora borealis, I suppose. Hope he's laid in good store of polar muffs and mittens, that was in the lion month of March. Not forgotten are the blue noses of the carpenters, and how they scouted at the greenness of the sit, who would build his sole piazza to the north. But March don't last forever. Patience, and August comes, and then in the cool Elysium of my northern bower I, Lazarus, in Abraham's bosom, cast down the hill a pitying glance on poor old Dives, tormented in the purgatory of his piazza to the south. But even in December this northern piazza does not repel, nipping cold and gusty though it be, and the north wind, like any miller, bolting by the snow, in finest flower, for then, once more, with frosted beard, I pace the sleety deck, weathering Cape Horn. In summer, too, canute-like, sitting here, one is often reminded of the sea, for not only do long ground swells roll the slanting grain, and little wavelets of the grass ripple over upon the low piazza as their beach, and the blown down of dandelions is wafted like the spray, and the purple of the mountains is just the purple of the billows and a still August noon broods upon the deep meadows, as a calm upon the line. But the vastness and the lonesomeness are so oceanic, and the silence and the sameness, too, that the first peep of a strange house, rising beyond the trees, is, for all the world, like spying on the Barbary coast an unknown sail. And this recalls my inland voyage to fairyland, a true voyage, but, take it all in all, interesting as if invented. From the piazza, some uncertain object I had caught, mysteriously snugged away, to all appearance, in a sort of purpled breast pocket, high up in a hopper-like hollow or sunken angle, 
among the northwestern mountains, yet whether really it was on the mountainside or the mountain top could not be determined, because, though viewed from favorable points, a blue summit, peering up away behind the rest, will, as it were, talk to you over their heads, and plainly tell you that, though he, the blue summit, seems among them, he is not of them, God forbid, and indeed would have you know that he considers himself, as to say truth, he has good right, by several cubits their superior, nevertheless, certain ranges here and there double-filed as in platoons, so shoulder and follow up upon one another, with their irregular shapes and heights, that from the piazza a nigher and lower mountain will, in most states of the atmosphere, effacingly shade itself away into a higher and further one, that an object bleak on the former's crest will, for all that, appear nested in the latter's flank. These mountains, somehow, they play at hide-and-seek, and all before one's eyes. But be that as it may, the spot in question was, at all events, so situated as to be only visible, and then but vaguely, under certain witching conditions of light and shadow. Indeed, for a year or more I knew not there was such a spot, and might perhaps have never known, had it not been for a wizard afternoon in autumn, late in autumn, a mad poet's afternoon, when the turned maple woods in the broad basin below me, having lost their first vermilion tint, dully smoked like smoldering towns when flames expire upon their prey, and rumor had it that this smokiness in the general air was not all Indian summer, which was not used to be so sick a thing, however mild, but in great part was blown from far-off forests, for weeks on fire in Vermont, so that no wonder the sky was ominous as Hecate's cauldron, and two sportsmen, crossing a red stubble buckwheat field, seemed guilty Macbeth and foreboding Banquo, and the hermit's son, hutted in an Adelum cave, well towards the south, according to his season, did little else but, by indirect reflection of narrow rays, shot down a simplon pass among the clouds, just steadily paint one small, round, strawberry mole upon the wan cheek of northwestern hills. Signal as a candle, one spot of radiance, where all else was shade. Fairies there, thought I, some haunted ring where fairies dance. Time passed, and the following May, after a gentle shower upon the mountains, a little shower islanded in misty seas of sunshine, such a distant shower, and sometimes two and three and four of them all visible together in different parts, as I loved to watch from the piazza, instead of thunderstorms, as I used to, which wrap old Greylock like a Sinai, till one thinks swart Moses must be climbing among scathed hemlocks there. After, I say, that gentle shower, I saw a rainbow, resting its furtive end just where, in autumn, I had marked the mole. Fairies there, thought I, remembering that rainbows bring out the blooms, and that if one can but get to the rainbow's end, his fortune is made in a bag of gold. Yon rainbow's end, would I were there, thought I, and none the less I wished it, for now first noticing what seemed some sort of glen or grotto in the mountainside, at least whatever it was, viewed through the rainbow's medium, it glowed like the Potosi mine. But a workaday neighbor said no doubt it was but some old barn, an abandoned one, its broadside beaten in, the acclivity its background. But I, though I had never been there, I knew better. A few days after, a cheery sunrise kindled a golden sparkle in the same spot as before. The sparkle was of that vividness, it seemed as if it could only come from glass. 
the building then if building after all it was could at least not be a barn much less an abandoned one stale hay ten years musting in it no if aught built by mortal it must be a cottage perhaps long vacant and dismantled but this very spring magically fitted up and glazed again one noon in the same direction i marked over dimmed tops of terraced foliage a broader gleam as of a silver buckler held sunward over some croucher's head which gleam experience in like cases taught must come from a roof newly shingled this to me made pretty sure the recent occupancy of that far cot in fairyland day after day now full of interest in my discovery what time i could spare from reading the midsummer night's dream and all about titania wishfully i gazed off towards the hills but in vain either troops of shadows an imperial guard with slow pace and solemn defiled along the steeps or routed by pursuing light fled broadcast from east to west old wars of lucifer and michael or the mountains though unvexed by these mirrored sham fights in the sky had an atmosphere otherwise unfavorable for fairy views i was sorry the more so because i had to keep my chamber for some time after which chamber did not face those hills at length when pretty well again and sitting out in the september morning upon the piazza and thinking to myself when just after a little flock of sheep the farmer's banded children passed a nutting and said how sweet a day it was after all but what their fathers call a weather breeder and indeed was become so sensitive through my illness as that i could not bear to look upon a chinese creeper of my adoption and which to my delight climbing a post of the piazza had burst out in starry bloom but now if you removed the leaves a little showed millions of strange cankerous worms which feeding upon those blossoms so shared their blessed hue as to make it unblessed evermore worms whose germs had doubtless lurked in the very bulb which so hopefully i had planted in this ingrate peevishness of my weary convalescence was i sitting there when suddenly looking off i saw the golden mountain window dazzling like a deep sea dolphin fairies there thought i once more the queen of fairies at her fairy window at any rate some glad mountain girl it will do me good it will cure this weariness to look on her no more i'll launch my yawl ho cheerly heart and push away for fairyland for rainbow's end in fairyland how to get to fairyland by what road i did not know nor could any one inform me not even one edmund spencer who had been there so he wrote me further than that to reach fairyland it must be voyage to and with faith i took the fairy mountain's bearings and the first fine day when strength permitted got into my yawl high-pummeled leather one cast off the fast and away i sailed free voyager as an autumn leaf early dawn and sallying westward i sowed the morning before me some miles brought me nigh the hills but out of present sight of them i was not lost for roadside goldenrods as guide-posts pointed i doubted not the way to the golden window following them i came to a lone and languid region where the grass-grown ways were travelled but by drowsy cattle that less waked than stirred by day seemed to walk in sleep browse they did not the enchanted never eat at least so says don quixote that sagest sage that ever lived on i went and gained at last the fairy mountain's base but saw yet no fairy ring a pasture rose before me 
letting down five moldering bars, so moistly green they seemed fished up from some sunken wreck, a wicked old Ares, long-visaged and with crumpled horn, came snuffing up, and then retreating, decorously led on along a milky way of white weed, past dim clustering Pleiades and Hyades of small forget-me-nots, and would have led me further still his astral path, but for golden flights of yellow birds, pilots, surely, to the golden window, to one side flying before me from bush to bush towards deep woods, which woods themselves were luring, and somehow lured, too, by their fence, banning a dark road, which, however dark, led up. I pushed through, when Ares, renouncing me now for some lost soul, wheeled, and went his wiser way, forbidding and forbidden ground to him. A winter wood road, matted all along with winter green, by the side of pebbly waters, waters the cheerier for their solitude. Beneath swaying fir boughs, petted by no season, but still green in all, on I journeyed, my horse and I, on by an old sawmill, bound down and hushed with vines, that his grating voice no more was heard, on by a deep flume clove through snowy marble, vermil-tinted, where freshet eddies had on each side spun out empty chapels in the living rock, on where jacks in the pulpit, like their Baptist namesake, preached but to the wilderness, on where a huge cross-grain block, fern-bedded, showed where, in forgotten times, man after man had tried to split it, but lost his wedges for his pains, which wedges yet rusted in their holes, on where ages past in step-like ledges of a cascade skull-hollow pots had been churned out by ceaseless whirling of a flintstone, ever wearing, but itself unworn, on by wild rapids pouring into a secret pool, but soothed by circling there a while, issued forth serenely, on to less broken ground, and by a little ring where, truly, fairies must have danced, or else some wheel-tire been heated, for all was bare, still on and up and out into a hanging orchard, where maidenly looked down upon me a crescent moon from morning. My horse hitched low his head, red apples rolled before him, Eve's apples seek no furthers. He tasted one, I another. It tasted of the ground. Fairyland not yet, thought I, flinging my bridle to a humped old tree that crooked out an arm to catch it. For the way now lay where path was none, and none might go but by himself, and only go by daring, through blackberry brakes that tried to pluck me back, though I but strained towards fruitless growths of mountain laurel, up slippery steeps to barren heights, where stood none to welcome. Fairyland not yet, thought I, though the morning is here before me. Foot sore enough and weary, I gained not then my journey's end, but came ere long to a craggy pass, dipping towards growing regions still beyond. A zigzag road, half overgrown with blueberry bushes, here turned among the cliffs. A rent was in their ragged sides, through it a little track branched off, which, upwards, threading that short defile, came breezily out above to where the mountain-top, part sheltered northward by a taller brother, sloped gently off a space, ere darkly plunging. And here among fantastic rocks, reposing in a herd, the foot-track wound, half-beaten, up to a little, low-storied, grayish cottage, capped, nun-like, with a peaked roof. On one slope the roof was deeply weather-stained, and nigh the turfy eaves-trough all velvet napped. No doubt the snail monks founded mossy priories there. The other slope was newly shingled, on the north side, doorless and windowless, 
the clabbards innocent of paint were yet green as the north side of lichened pines or copperless hulls of japanese junks becalmed the whole base like those of the neighboring rocks was rimmed about with shaded streaks of richest sod for with hearthstones in fairyland the natural rock though housed preserves to the last just as in open fields its fertilizing charm only by necessity working now at a remove to the sward without so at least says oberon grave authority in fairy lore though setting oberon aside certain it is that even in the common world the soil close up to farmhouses as close up to pasture rocks is even though untended ever richer than it is a few rods off such gentle nurturing heat is radiated there but with this cottage the shaded streaks were richest in its front and about its entrance where the ground sill and especially the door sill had through long eld quietly settled down no fence was seen no enclosure nearby ferns 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 further woods 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 beyond mountains 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 then sky 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 turned out in aerial commons pasture for the mountain moon nature and but nature house and all even a low cross pile of silver birch piled openly to season up among whose silvery sticks as through the fencing of some sequestered grave sprang vagrant raspberry bushes willful asserters of their right of way the foot track so dainty narrow just like a sheep track led through long ferns that lodged fairyland at last thought i una and her lamb dwell here truly a small abode mere palanquin set down on the summit in a pass between two worlds participant of neither a sultry hour and i wore a light hat of yellow sinnet with white duck trousers both relics of my tropic sea-going clogged in the muffling ferns i softly stumbled staining the knees a sea-green pausing at the threshold or rather where threshold once had been i saw through the open doorway a lonely girl sewing at a lonely window a pale-cheeked girl a fly-specked window with wasps about the mended upper panes i spoke she shyly started like some tahiti girl secreted for a sacrifice first catching sight through palms of captain cook recovering she bade me enter with her apron brushed off a stool then silently resumed her own with thanks i took the stool but now for a space i too was mute this then is the fairy mountain house and here the fairy queen sitting at her fairy window i went up to it downwards directed by the tunneled pass as through a leveled telescope i caught sight of a far-off soft azure world i hardly knew it though i came from it you must find this view very pleasant said i at last oh sir tears starting in her eyes the first time i looked out of this window i said never never shall i weary of this and what wearies you of it now i don't know while a tear fell but it is not the view it is mariana some months back her brother only seventeen had come hither a long way from the other side to cut wood and burn coal and she elder sister had accompanied him long had they been orphans and now sole inhabitants of the sole house upon the mountain no guest came no traveler passed the zigzag perilous road was only used at seasons by the coal wagons the brother was absent the entire day sometimes the entire night 
when at evening fagged out he did come home he soon left his bench poor fellow for his bed just as one at last wearily quits that too for still deeper rest the bench the bed the grave silent i stood by the fairy window while these things were being told do you know she said at last as stealing from her story do you know who lives yonder i have never been down into that country away off there i mean that house that marble one pointing far across the lower landscape have you not caught it there on the long hillside the field before the woods behind the white shines out against their blue don't you mark it the only house in sight i looked and after a time to my surprise recognized more by its position than its aspect or mariana's description my own abode glimmering much like this mountain one from the piazza the mirage haze made it appear less a farmhouse than king charming's palace i have often wondered who lives there but it must be some happy one again this morning was i thinking so some happy one returned i starting and why do you think that you judge some rich one lives there rich or not i never thought but it looks so happy i can't tell how and it is so far away sometimes i think i do but dream it is there you should see it in the sunset no doubt the sunset gilds it finely but not more than the sunrise does this house perhaps this house the sun is a good sun but it never gilds this house why should it this old house is rotting that makes it so mossy in the morning the sun comes in at this old window to be sure boarded up when first we came a window i can't keep clean do what i may and half burns and nearly blinds me at my sewing besides setting the flies and wasps astir such flies and wasps as only lone mountain houses know see here is the curtain this apron i try to shut it out with then it fades it you see the sun gild this house not that ever mariana saw because when this roof is gilded most then you stay here within the hottest weariest hour of the day you mean sir the sun gilds not this roof it leaked so brother newly shingled all one side did you not see it the north side where the sun strikes most on what the rain has wetted the sun is a good sun but this roof it first scorches and then rots an old house they went west and are long dead they say who built it a mountain house in winter no fox could den in it that chimney-place has been blocked up with snow just like a hollow stump yours are strange fancies mariana they but reflect the things then i should have said these are strange things rather than yours are strange fancies as you will and took up her sewing something in those quiet words or in that quiet act it made me mute again while noting through the fairy window a broad shadow stealing on as cast by some gigantic condor floating at brooding poise on outstretched wings i marked how by its deeper and inclusive dusk it wiped away into itself all lesser shades of rock or fern you watch the cloud said mariana no a shadow a cloud's no doubt though i cannot see it how did you know it your eyes are on your work it dusked my work there now the cloud is gone tray comes back how the dog the shaggy dog at noon he steals off of himself to change his shape returns and lies down a while nigh the door don't you see him his head is turned round at you though when you came he looked before him your eyes rest but on your work what do you speak of 
by the window crossing. You mean this shaggy shadow, the nigh one? And yes, now that I mark it, it is not unlike a large black Newfoundland dog. The invading shadow gone, the invaded one returns. But I do not see what casts it. For that you must go without. One of those grassy rocks, no doubt. You see his head, his face, the shadows. You speak as if you saw it, and all the time your eyes are on your work. Trey looks at you still without glancing up. This is his hour. I see him. Have you then so long sat at this mountain window where but clouds and vapors pass that to you shadows are as things, though you speak of them as of phantoms, that by familiar knowledge working like a second sight you can without looking for them tell just where they are, though as having mice-like feet they creep about and come and go, that to you these lifeless shadows are as living friends, who though out of sight are not out of mind, even in their faces, is it so? That way I never thought of it, but the friendliest one, that used to soothe my weariness so much, coolly quivering on the ferns, it was taken from me never to return, as Trey did just now, the shadow of a birch. The tree was struck by lightning, and brother cut it up. You saw the cross-pile outdoors, the buried root lies under it, but not the shadow. That is flown, and never will come back, nor ever anywhere stir again. Another cloud here stole along, once more blotting out the dog, and blackening all the mountain, while the stillness was so still, deafness might have forgot itself, or else believed that noiseless shadow spoke. Birds, Mariana, singing birds, I hear none. I hear nothing. Boys and bobolinks, do they never come a-burying up here? Birds, I seldom hear. Boys, never. The berries mostly ripe and fall, few but me the wiser. But Yellowbird showed me the way, part way at least, and then flew back. I guess they play about the mountainside, but don't make the top their home. And no doubt you think that living so lonesome here, knowing nothing, hearing nothing, little at least, but sound of thunder and the fall of trees, never reading, seldom speaking, yet ever wakeful, this is what gives me my strange thoughts, for, so you call them, this weariness and wakefulness together brother, who stands and works in open air, would I could rest like him, but mine is mostly but dull woman's work, sitting, sitting, restless sitting. But do you not go walk at times, these woods are wide, and lonesome, lonesome, because so wide. Sometimes tis true of afternoons I go a little way, but soon come back again. Better feel lone by hearth than rock. The shadows hereabouts I know, those in the woods, are strangers. But the night? Just like the day, thinking, thinking. A wheel I cannot stop. Pure want of sleep it is that turns it. I have heard that, for this wakeful weariness, to say one's prayers, and then lay one's head upon a fresh hop pillow. Look! Through the fairy window she pointed down the steep to a small garden patch nearby, mere pot of rifled loam, half rounded in by sheltering rocks, where, side by side, some feet apart, nipped and puny, two hop-vines climbed two poles, and, gaining their tip-ends, would have then joined over in an upward clasp, but the baffled shoots, groping a while in empty air, trailed back whence they sprung. You have tried the pillow, then? Yes. And prayer? Prayer and pillow. Is there no other cure or charm? Oh, if I could but once get to yonder house and but look upon whoever the happy being is that lives there, a foolish thought, why do I think it? Is it 
that I live so lonesome and know nothing? I, too, know nothing, and therefore cannot answer, but for your sake, Mariana, well could wish that I were that happy one of the happy house you dream you see, for then you would behold him now, and, as you say, this weariness might leave you. Enough. Launching my yawl no more for fairyland, I stick to the piazza. It is my box royal, and this amphitheater, my theater of San Carlo. Yes, the scenery is magical, the illusion so complete. And Madame Meadowlark, my prima donna, plays her grand engagement here, and, drinking in her sunrise note, which, memnon-like, seems struck from the golden window, how far from me the weary face behind it. But every night, when the curtain falls, truth comes in with darkness. No light shows from the mountain. To and fro I walk the piazza deck, haunted by Mariana's face, and many as real a story. End of section one. Bartleby, part one. I am a rather elderly man. The nature of my avocations for the last thirty years has brought me into more than ordinary contact with what would seem an interesting and somewhat singular set of men of whom, as yet, nothing that I know of has ever been written. I mean, the law copyists or scriveners. I have known very many of them professionally and privately, and, if I pleased, could relate divers histories at which good-natured gentlemen might smile and sentimental souls might weep. But I waive the biographies of all other scriveners for a few passages in the life of Bartleby, who was a scrivener the strangest I ever saw or heard of, while of other law copyists I might write the complete life, of Bartleby nothing of that sort can be done. I believe that no materials exist for a full and satisfactory biography of this man. It is an irreparable loss to literature. Bartleby was one of those beings of whom nothing is ascertainable except from the original sources, and in his case those are very small. What my own astonished eyes saw of Bartleby, that is all I know of him, except, indeed, one vague report which will appear in the sequel. Ere introducing the Scrivener, as he first appeared to me, it is fit I make some mention of myself, my employé, my business my chambers, and general surroundings, because some such description is indispensable to an adequate understanding of the chief character about to be presented. Imprimus, I am a man who, from his youth upwards, has been filled with a profound conviction that the easiest way of life is the best. Hence, Though I belong to a profession proverbially energetic and nervous, even to turbulence at times, yet nothing of that sort have I ever suffered to invade my peace. I am one of those unambitious lawyers who never addresses a jury, or in any way draws down public applause. But in the cool tranquility of a snug retreat, do a snug business among rich men's bonds and mortgages and title deeds. All who know me consider me an eminently safe man. The late John Jacob Astor, a personage little given to poetic enthusiasm, had no hesitation in pronouncing my first grand point to be prudence. My next method I do not speak it in vanity, but simply record the fact that I was not unemployed in my profession by the late John Jacob Astor, a name which, I admit, I love to repeat, for it hath a rounded and orbicular sound to it, and rings like unto bullion. I will freely add that I was not insensible to the late 
John Jacob Astor's good opinion. Some time prior to the period at which this little history begins, my avocations had been largely increased. The good old office, now extinct in the state of New York, of a Master of Chancery, had been conferred upon me. It was not a very arduous office, but very pleasantly remunerative. I seldom lose my temper, much more seldom indulge in dangerous indignation at wrongs and outrages, but I must be permitted to be rash here, and declare that I consider the sudden and violent abrogation of the office of master in chancery by the new constitution as a blank, blank, premature act. Inasmuch as I had counted upon a life lease of the profits, whereas I only received those of a few short years. But this is by the way. My chambers were upstairs at number blank, blank, Wall Street. At one end they looked upon the white wall of the interior of a spacious skylight shaft, penetrating the building from top to bottom. This view might have been considered rather tame than otherwise, deficient in what landscape painters call life. But if so, the view from the other end of my chambers offered, at least, a contrast, if nothing more. In that direction my windows commanded an unobstructed view of a lofty brick wall, black by age and everlasting shade, which wall required no spyglass to bring out its lurking beauties, but for the benefit of all near-sighted spectators, was pushed up to within ten feet of my window panes. Owing to the great height of the surrounding buildings, and my chambers being on the second floor, the interval between this wall and mine not a little resembled a huge square cistern. At the period just preceding the advent of Bartleby, I had two persons as copyists in my employment, and a promising lad as an office boy. First, turkey. Second, nippers. Third, ginger nut. These may seem names the like of which are not usually found in the directory. In truth, they were nicknames, mutually conferred upon each other by my three clerks, and were deemed expressive of their respective persons, or characters. Turkey was a short, pursy, Englishman, of about my own age, that is, somewhere not far from sixty. In the morning, one might say, his face was of a fine, florid hue, but after twelve o'clock, meridian, his dinner hour, it blazed like a grate full of Christmas coals, and continued blazing, but, as it were, with a gradual wane, till six o'clock p.m. or thereabouts, after which I saw no more of the proprietor of the face, which, gaining its meridian with the sun, seemed to set with it, to rise, culminate, and decline the following day, with the like regularity and undiminished glory. There are many singular coincidences I have known in the course of my life, not the least among which was the fact that exactly when Turkey displayed his fullest beams from his red and radiant countenance, just then, too, at that critical moment, began the daily period when I considered his business capacities as seriously disturbed for the remainder of the twenty-four hours. Not that he was absolutely idle or averse to business then, far from it. The difficulty was he was apt to be altogether too energetic. There was a strange, inflamed, flurried, flighty recklessness of activity about him. He would be incautious in dipping his pen into his inkstand. All his blots upon my documents were dropped there after twelve o'clock meridian. Indeed, not only would he be reckless and sadly given to making blots in the afternoon, but some days he went further and was rather noisy. At such times, too, his face flamed with augmented blazonry, as if cannel coal had been heaped on anthracite. He made an unpleasant racket with his chair, spilled his sandbox, in mending his pens impatiently split them all to pieces, and 
threw them on the floor in a sudden passion, stood up and leaned over his table, boxing his papers about in a most indecorous manner, very sad to behold in an elderly man like him. Nevertheless, as he was in many ways a most valuable person to me, and all the time before twelve o'clock meridian, was the quickest, steadiest creature, too, accomplishing a great deal of work in a style not easily to be matched. For these reasons I was willing to overlook his eccentricities, though, indeed, occasionally I remonstrated with him. I did this very gently, however, because, though the civilest, nay, the blandest and most reverential of men in the morning, yet in the afternoon he was disposed upon provocation to be slightly rash with his tongue, in fact insolent. Now, valuing his morning services as I did, and resolved not to lose them, yet at the same time made uncomfortable by his inflamed ways after twelve o'clock, and being a man of peace, unwilling by my admonitions to call forth unseemly retorts from him, I took upon me one Saturday noon, he was always worse on Saturdays, to hint to him very kindly that perhaps, now that he was growing old, it might be well to abridge his labors. In short, he need not come to my chambers after twelve o'clock, but dinner over, had best go home to his lodgings, and rest himself till tea-time. But no, he insisted upon his afternoon devotions. His countenance became intolerably fervid, as he oratorically assured me, gesticulating with a long ruler at the other end of the room, that if his services in the morning were useful, how indispensable then in the afternoon! With submission, sir, said Turkey, on this occasion, I consider myself your right-hand man. In the morning I but marshal and deploy my columns, but in the afternoon I put myself at their head, and gallantly charge the foe, thus. And he made a violent thrust with the ruler. But the blots, Turkey, intimated I. True, but with submission, sir, behold these hairs. I am getting old. Surely, sir, a blot or two of a warm afternoon is not to be severely urged against gray hairs. Old age, even if it blot the page, is honorable. With submission, sir, we both are getting old. This appeal to my fellow feeling was hardly to be resisted. At all events I saw that go he would not so I made up my mind to let him stay, resolving, nevertheless, to see to it that during the afternoon he had to do with my less important papers. Nippers, the second on my list, was a whiskered, sallow, and, upon the whole, rather piratical-looking young man of about five-and-twenty. I always deemed him the victim of two evil powers, ambition and indigestion. The ambition was evinced by a certain impatience of the duties of a mere copyist, an unwarrantable usurpation of strictly professional affairs, such as the original drawing up of legal documents. The indigestion seemed betokened in an occasional nervous testiness and grinning irritability, causing the teeth to audibly grind together over mistakes committed in copying, unnecessary maledictions hissed rather than spoken in the heat of business, and especially by a continual discontent with the height of the table where he worked. Though of a very ingenious mechanical turn, Nippers could never get this table to suit him. He put chips under it, blocks of various sorts, bits of pasteboard, and at last went so far as to attempt an exquisite adjustment by final pieces of folded blotting paper but no invention would answer. If for the sake of easing his back he brought the table lid at a sharp angle well up towards his chin, and wrote there like a man using the steep roof of a Dutch house for his desk, then he declared that it stopped the circulation in his arms. If now he lowered the table to his waistbands, and stooped over it in writing, then there was a sore aching in his back. In short, the truth of the matter was, 
Nippers knew not what he wanted. Or if he wanted anything, it was to be rid of a Scrivener's table altogether. Among the manifestations of his diseased ambition was a fondness he had for receiving visits from certain ambiguous-looking fellows in seedy coats whom he called his clients. Indeed, I was aware that not only was he, at times, considerable of a ward politician, but he occasionally did a little business at the justices' courts, and was not unknown on the steps of the tombs. I have good reason to believe, however, that one individual who called upon him at my chambers, and who, with a grand air he insisted was his client, was no other than a dun, and the alleged title-deed a bill. But with all his failings, and the annoyances he caused me, Nippers, like his compatriot Turkey, was a very useful man to me, wrote a neat, swift hand, and when he chose was not deficient in a gentlemanly sort of deportment. Added to this, he always dressed in a gentlemanly sort of way, and so, incidentally, reflected credit upon my chambers. Whereas, with respect to Turkey, I had much ado to keep him from being a reproach to me. His clothes were apt to look oily, and smell of eating-houses. He wore his pantaloons very loose and baggy in summer. His coats were execrable, his hat not to be handled. But, while the hat was a thing of indifference to me, inasmuch as his natural civility and deference, as a dependent Englishman, always led him to doff it the moment he entered the room, yet his coat was another matter. Concerning his coats I reasoned with him, but with no effect. The truth was, I suppose, that a man with so small an income could not afford to sport such a lustrous face and a lustrous coat at one and the same time. As Nippers once observed, Turkey's money went chiefly for red ink. One winter day I presented Turkey with a highly respectable-looking coat of my own, a padded gray coat of a most comfortable warmth, and which buttoned straight up from the knee to the neck. I thought Turkey would appreciate the favor, and abate his rashness and obstreperousness of afternoons. But no, I verily believe that buttoning himself up in so downy and blanket-like a coat had a pernicious effect upon him, upon the same principle that too much oats are bad for horses. In fact, precisely as a rash, restive horse is said to feel his oats, so Turkey felt his coat. It made him insolent. He was a man whom prosperity harmed. Though concerning the self-indulgent habits of Turkey I had my own private surmises, yet, touching nippers, I was well persuaded that whatever might be his faults in other respects, he was, at least, a temperate young man. But, indeed, nature herself seemed to have been his vintner, and, at his birth, charged him so thoroughly with an irritable, brandy-like disposition that all subsequent potations were needless. When I consider how, amid the stillness of my chambers, Nippers would sometimes impatiently rise from his seat and, stooping over his table, spread his arms wide apart, seize the whole desk, and move it, and jerk it with a grim, grinding motion on the floor, as if the table were a perverse voluntary agent, intent on thwarting and vexing him, I plainly perceive that, for nippers, brandy and water were altogether superfluous. It was fortunate for me that, owing to its peculiar cause, indigestion, the irritability and consequent nervousness of nippers were mainly observable in the morning, while in the afternoon he was comparatively mild so that Turkey's paroxysms only coming on about twelve o'clock, I never had to do with their eccentricities at one time. Their fits relieved each other, like guards. When Nippers was on, Turkey's was off, and vice versa. This was a good natural arrangement under the circumstances. Ginger Nut, the third on my list, was a lad some twelve years old. His father was a carman, 
ambitious of seeing his son on the bench instead of a cart, before he died. So he sent him to my office as a student at law, errand boy, cleaner and sweeper, at the rate of one dollar a week. He had a little desk to himself, but he did not use it much. Upon inspection the drawer exhibited a great array of the shells of various sorts of nuts. Indeed, to this quick-witted youth the whole noble science of the law was contained in a nutshell. Not the least among the employments of Ginger Nut, as well as one which he discharged with the most alacrity, was his duty as cake and apple purveyor for turkey and nippers, copying law papers being proverbially a dry, husky sort of business. My two scriveners were fain to moisten their mouths very often with Spitzenbergs, to be had at the numerous stalls nigh the custom-house and post-office. Also they sent Ginger Nut very frequently for that peculiar cake, small, flat, round, and very spicy, after which he had been named by them. Of a cold morning, when business was but dull, Turkey would gobble up scores of these cakes, as if they were mere wafers. Indeed, they sell them at the rate of six or eight for a penny, the scrape of his pen blending with the crunching of the crisp particles in his mouth. Of all the fiery afternoon blunders and flurried rashnesses of Turkey was his once moistening a ginger cake between his lips and clapping it on to a mortgage for a seal. I came within an ace of dismissing him then, but he mollified me by making an oriental bow and saying, With submission, sir, it was generous of me to find you in stationery on my own account. Now, my original business, that of a conveyancer and title-hunter, and drawer up of recondite documents of all sorts, was considerably increased by receiving the master's office. There was now great work for Scriveners. Not only must I push the clerks already with me, but I must have additional help. In answer to my advertisement, a motionless young man one morning stood upon my office threshold, the door being open, for it was summer. I can see that figure now, pallidly neat, pitiably respectable, incurably forlorn. It was Bartleby. After a few words touching his qualifications, I engaged him, glad to have among my corps of copyists a man of so singularly sedate an aspect, which I thought might operate beneficially upon the flighty temper of turkey and the fiery one of nippers. I should have stated before that ground-glass folding doors divided my premises into two parts, one of which was occupied by my scriveners, the other by myself. According to my humor, I threw open these doors, or closed them. I resolved to assign Bartleby a corner by the folding doors, but on my side of them, so as to have this quiet man within easy call, in case any trifling thing was to be done. I placed his desk close up to a small side window in that part of the room, a window which originally had afforded a lateral view of certain grimy backyards and bricks, but which, owing to subsequent erections, commanded at present no view at all, though it gave some light. Within three feet of the panes was a wall, and the light came down from far above between two lofty buildings, as from a very small opening in a dome. Still further to a satisfactory arrangement, I procured a high green folding screen which might entirely isolate Bartleby from my sight, though not remove him from my voice, and thus, in a manner, privacy and society were conjoined. At first Bartleby did an extraordinary quantity of writing. As if long famished for something to copy, he seemed to gorge himself on my documents. There was no pause for digestion. He ran a day and night line, copying by sunlight and by candlelight. I should have been quite delighted with his application, had he been cheerfully industrious. But he wrote on silently, palely, mechanically. 
It is, of course, an indispensable part of a Scribner's business to verify the accuracy of his copy word by word. Where there are two or more Scriveners in an office, they assist each other in this examination, one reading from the copy, the other holding the original. It is a very dull, wearisome, and lethargic affair. I can readily imagine that to some sanguine temperaments it would be altogether intolerable. For example, I cannot credit that the meddlesome poet Byron would have contentedly sat down with Bartleby to examine a law document of, say, five hundred pages, closely written in a crimpy hand. Now and then, in the haste of business, it had been my habit to assist in comparing some brief document myself, calling turkey or nippers for this purpose. One object I had in placing Bartleby so handy to me behind the screen was to avail myself of his services on such trivial occasions. It was on the third day, I think, of his being with me, and before any necessity had arisen for having his own writing examined, that, being much hurried to complete a small affair I had in hand, I abruptly called to Bartleby. In my haste and natural expectancy of instant compliance, I sat with my head bent over the original on my desk, and my right hand sideways and somewhat nervously extended with the copy, so that, immediately upon emerging from his retreat, Bartleby might snatch it and proceed to business without the least delay. In this very attitude did I sit when I called to him, rapidly stating what it was I wanted him to do, namely to examine a small paper with me. Imagine my surprise, nay, my consternation, when, without moving from his privacy, Bartleby, in a singularly mild, firm voice, replied, I would prefer not to. I sat a while in perfect silence, relaying my stunned faculties. Immediately it occurred to me that my ears had deceived me, or Bartleby had entirely misunderstood my meaning. I repeated my request in the clearest tone I could assume, but in quite as clear a one came the previous reply. I would prefer not to. Prefer not to, echoed I, rising in high excitement and crossing the room with a stride. What do you mean? Are you moonstruck? I want you to help me compare this sheet here. Take it. And I thrust it toward him. I would prefer not to, said he. I looked at him steadfastly. His face was leanly composed, his gray eye dimly calm. Not a wrinkle of agitation rippled him. Had there been the least uneasiness, anger, impatience, or impertinence in his manner, in other words, had there been anything ordinarily human about him, doubtless I should have violently dismissed him from the premises. But as it was, I should have as soon thought of turning my pale plaster of Paris bust of Cicero out of doors. I stood gazing at him a while, as he went on with his own writing, and then reseated myself at my desk. This is very strange, thought I. What had one best do? But my business hurried me. I concluded to forget the matter for the present, reserving it for my future leisure. So, calling nippers from the other room, the paper was speedily examined. A few days after this, Bartleby concluded four lengthy documents, being quadruplicates of a week's testimony taken before me in my high court of chancery. It became necessary to examine them. It was an important suit, and great accuracy was imperative. Having all things arranged, I called turkey, nippers, and ginger nut from the next room, meaning to place the four copies in the hands of my four clerks, which I should read from the original. Accordingly, Turkey, Nippers, and Ginger Nut had taken their seats in a row, each with his document in his hand, when I called to Bartleby to join this interesting group. Bartleby, quick, I am waiting. I heard a slow scrape of his chair legs on the uncarpeted floor, and soon he appeared standing at the entrance of his hermitage. "'What is wanted?' said he mildly. "'The copies, the copies,' said I hurriedly. "'We are going to examine them. There.' And I held towards him the fourth quadruplicate. 
I would prefer not to, he said, and gently disappeared behind the screen. For a few moments I was turned into a pillar of salt, standing at the head of my seated column of clerks. Recovering myself, I advanced toward the screen and demanded the reason for such extraordinary conduct. Why do you refuse? I would prefer not to. With any other man I should have flown outright into a dreadful passion, scorned all further words, and thrust him ignominiously from my presence. But there was something about Bartleby that not only strangely disarmed me, but in a wonderful manner touched and disconcerted me. I began to reason with him. These are your own copies we are about to examine. It is labor-saving to you, because one examination will answer for your four papers. It is common usage. Every copyist is bound to help examine his copy, is it not so? Will you not speak? Answer. I prefer not to, he replied in a flute-like tone. It seemed to me that while I had been addressing him, he carefully resolved every statement that I made, fully comprehended the meaning, could not gainsay the irresistible conclusion, but at the same time some paramount consideration prevailed with him to reply as he did. You are decided, then, not to comply with my request, a request made according to common usage and common sense? He briefly gave me to understand that on that point my judgment was sound, yes, his decision was irreversible. It is not seldom the case that when a man is brow-beaten in some unprecedented and violently unreasonable way, he begins to stagger in his own plainest faith. He begins, as it were, vaguely to surmise that, wonderful as it may be, all the justice and all the reason is on the other side. Accordingly, if any disinterested persons are present, he turns to them for some reinforcement for his own faltering mind. Turkey, said I, what do you think of this? Am I not right? With submission, sir, said Turkey in his blandest tone, I think that you are. Nippers, said I, what do you think of it? I think I should kick him out of the office. The reader of nice perceptions will here perceive that, it being morning, Turkey's answer is couched in polite and tranquil terms, but Nippers replies in ill-tempered ones, or, to repeat a previous sentence, Nippers ugly mood was on duty and Turkey's off. Gingernet, said I, willing to enlist the smallest suffrage in my behalf, what do you think of it? I think, sir, he's a little loony, replied Ginger Nut with a grin. You hear what they say, said I, turning towards the screen. Come forth and do your duty. But he vouchsafed no reply. I pondered a moment in sore perplexity, but once more business hurried me. I determined again to postpone the consideration of this dilemma to my future leisure. With a little trouble we made out to examine the papers without Bartleby, though at every page or two Turkey deferentially dropped his opinion that this proceeding was quite out of the common, while Nippers, twitching in his chair with dyspeptic nervousness, ground out between his set teeth occasional hissing maledictions against the stubborn oaf behind the screen. As for his, Nippers, part, this was the first and the last time he would do another man's business without pay. Meanwhile, Bartleby sat in his hermitage, oblivious to everything but his own peculiar business there. Some days passed, the Scrivener being employed upon another lengthy work. His late remarkable conduct led me to regard his ways narrowly. I observed that he never went to dinner, indeed that he never went anywhere. As yet I had never, of my personal knowledge, known him to be outside of my office. He was a perpetual sentry in the corner. At about eleven o'clock, though, in the morning, I noticed that Ginger Nut would advance toward the opening in Bartleby's screen, as if silently beckoned thither by a gesture invisible to me where I sat. The boy would then leave the office, jingling a few pence, 
and reappear with a handful of ginger-nuts, which he delivered in the hermitage, receiving two of the cakes for his trouble. He lives then on ginger-nuts, thought I, never eats a dinner, properly speaking. He must be a vegetarian then. But no, he never eats even vegetables. He eats nothing but ginger-nuts. My mind then ran on in reveries concerning the probable effects upon the human constitution of living entirely on ginger-nuts. Ginger-nuts are so called because they contain ginger as one of their peculiar constituents, and the final flavoring one. Now, what was ginger? A hot, spicy thing. Was Bartleby hot and spicy? Not at all. Ginger then had no effect upon Bartleby. Probably he preferred it should have none. Nothing so aggravates an earnest person as a passive resistance. If the individual so resisted be of a not inhuman temper, and the resisting one perfectly harmless in his passivity, then in the better moods of the former he will endeavor charitably to construe to his imagination what proves impossible to be solved by his judgment. Even so, for the most part, I regarded Bartleby and his ways. Poor fellow, thought I, he means no mischief. It is plain he intends no insolence. His aspect sufficiently evinces that his eccentricities are involuntary. He is useful to me. I can get along with him. If I turn him away, the chances are he will fall in with some less indulgent employer, and then he will be rudely treated, and perhaps driven forth miserably to starve. Yes, here I can cheaply purchase a delicious self-approval, to befriend Bartleby, to humor him in his strange willfulness, will cost me little or nothing, while I lay up in my soul what will eventually prove a sweet morsel for my conscience. But this mood was not invariable with me. The passiveness of Bartleby sometimes irritated me. I felt strangely goaded on to encounter him in new opposition, to elicit some angry spark from him answerable to my own. But, indeed, I might as well have essayed to strike fire with my knuckles against a bit of Windsor soap. But one afternoon the evil impulse in me mastered me, and the following little scene ensued. Bartleby, said I, when those papers are all copied, I will compare them with you. I would prefer not to. How? Surely you do not mean to persist in that mulish vagary? No answer. I threw open the folding doors nearby, and, turning upon Turkey and Nippers, exclaimed, Bartleby a second time says he won't examine his papers. What do you think of it, Turkey? It was afternoon, be it remembered. Turkey sat glowing like a brass boiler, his bald head steaming, his hands reeling among his blotted papers. Think of it, roared Turkey. I think I'll just step behind his screen and black his eyes for him. So saying, Turkey rose to his feet and threw his arms into a pugilistic position. He was hurrying away to make good his promise when I detained him, alarmed at the effect of incautiously rousing Turkey's combativeness after dinner. "'Sit down, Turkey,' said I, "'and hear what Nippers has to say. What do you think of it, Nippers? Would I not be justified in immediately dismissing Bartleby?' "'Excuse me, that is for you to decide, sir. I think his conduct quite unusual, and, indeed, unjust, as regards Turkey and myself, but it may only be a passing whim.' "'Ah!' exclaimed I. "'You have strangely changed your mind, then. You speak very gently of him now.' "'All beer!' cried Turkey. "'Gentleness is effects of beer. Nippers and I dined together to-day. You see how gentle I am, sir. Shall I go and black his eyes?' "'You refer to Bartleby, I suppose?' "'No, not to-day, Turkey,' I replied. "'Pray, put up your fists.' I closed the doors, and again advanced towards Bartleby. I felt additional incentives tempting me to my fate. I burned to be rebelled against again. I remembered that Bartleby never left the office. "'Bartleby,' said I, "'Ginger Nut is away. 
Just step around to the post office, won't you? It was but a three minutes' walk. And see if there is anything for me. I would prefer not to. You will not? I prefer not. I staggered to my desk and sat there in a deep study. My blind inveteracy returned. Was there any other thing in which I could procure myself to be ignominiously repulsed by this lean, penniless white, my hired clerk? What added thing is there perfectly reasonable that he will be sure to refuse to do? Bartleby. No answer. Bartleby, in a louder tone. No answer. Bartleby, I roared like a very ghost agreeably to the laws of magical invocation at the third summons he appeared at the entrance of his hermitage go to the next room and tell nippers to come to me i prefer not to he respectfully and slowly said and mildly disappeared very good bartleby said i in a quiet sort of serenely severe self-possessed tone intimating the unalterable purpose of some terrible retribution very close at hand at the moment i half intended something of the kind but upon the whole as it was drawing towards my dinner hour i thought it best to put on my hat and walk home for the day suffering much from perplexity and distress of mind shall i acknowledge it the conclusion of this whole business was that it soon became a fixed fact of my chambers that a pale young scrivener by the name of Bartleby had a desk there, that he copied for me at the usual rate of four cents a folio, one hundred words, but he was permanently exempt from examining the work done by him, that duty being transferred to turkey and nippers out of compliment, doubtless, to their superior acuteness. Moreover, said Bartleby was never on any account to be dispatched on the most trivial errand of any sort, and that even if entreated to take upon him such a matter, it was generally understood that he would prefer not to, in other words, that he would refuse point-blank. As days passed on I became considerably reconciled to Bartleby. His steadiness, his freedom from all dissipation, his incessant industry, except when he chose to throw himself into a standing reverie behind his screen, his great stillness, his unalterableness of demeanor under all circumstances, made him a valuable acquisition. One prime thing was this. He was always there, first in the morning, continually, through the day, and the last at night. I had a singular confidence in his honesty. I felt my most precious papers perfectly safe in his hands. Sometimes, to be sure, I could not, for the very soul of me, avoid falling into sudden spasmodic passions with him, for it was exceeding difficult to bear in mind all the time those strange peculiarities, privileges, and unheard-of exemptions forming the tacit stipulations on Bartleby's part under which he remained in my office. Now and then, in the eagerness of dispatching pressing business, I would inadvertently summon Bartleby, in a short, rapid tone, to put his finger, say, on the incipient tie of a bit of red tape with which I was about compressing some papers. Of course, from behind the screen the usual answer, I prefer not to, was sure to come. And then how could a human creature, with the common infirmities of our nature, refrain from bitterly exclaiming upon such perverseness, such unreasonableness? However, every added repulse of this sort which I received only tended to lessen the probability of my repeating the inadvertence. Here it must be said that, according to the custom of most legal gentlemen occupying chambers in densely populated law buildings, there were several keys to my door. One was kept by a woman residing in the attic, which person weekly scrubbed and daily swept and dusted my apartments. Another was kept by Turkey for convenience sake, the third I sometimes carried in my own pocket, the fourth I knew not who had. Now one Sunday morning I happened to go to Trinity Church to hear a celebrated preacher, and finding myself rather early on the ground, I thought I would walk round to my chambers for a while. Luckily I had my key with me, 
but upon applying it to the lock I found it resisted by something inserted from the inside. Quite surprised, I called out, when to my consternation a key was turned from within, and thrusting his lean visage at me and holding the door ajar, the apparition of Bartleby appeared in his shirt-sleeves, and otherwise in a strangely tattered dishabille, saying quietly that he was sorry, but he was deeply engaged just then, and preferred not admitting me at present. In a brief word or two he moreover added that perhaps I had better walk round the block two or three times, and by that time he would probably have concluded his affairs. Now the utterly unsurmised appearance of Bartleby, tenanting my law chambers on a Sunday morning with his cadaverously gentlemanly nonchalance, yet withal firm and self-possessed, had such a strange effect upon me that incontinently I slunk away from my own door and did as desired, but not without sundry twinges of impotent rebellion against the mild effrontery of this unaccountable scrivener. Indeed, it was his wonderful mildness chiefly which not only disarmed me, but unmanned me, as it were. For I consider that one, for the time, is a sort of unmanned when he tranquilly permits his hired clerk to dictate to him and order him away from his own premises. Furthermore, I was full of uneasiness as to what Bartleby could possibly be doing in my office in his shirt-sleeves, and in an otherwise dismantled condition of a Sunday morning. Was anything amiss going on? Nay, that was out of the question. It was not to be thought of for a moment that Bartleby was an immoral person. But what could he be doing there? Copying? Nay, again, whatever might be his eccentricities, Bartleby was an eminently decorous person. He would be the last man to sit down to his desk in any state approaching to nudity. Besides, it was Sunday and there was something about Bartleby that forbade the supposition that he would by any circular occupation violate the proprieties of the day. Nevertheless my mind was not pacified, and full of a restless curiosity, at last I returned to the door. Without hindrance I inserted my key, opened it, and entered. Bartleby was not to be seen. I looked round anxiously, peeped behind his screen, but it was very plain that he was gone. Upon more closely examining the place I surmised that for an indefinite period Bartleby must have ate, dressed, and slept in my office, and that, too, without plate, mirror, or bed. The cushioned seat of a rickety old sofa in one corner bore the faint impress of a lean, reclining form. Rolled away under his desk I found a blanket. Under the empty grate a blacking box and brush, on a chair a tin basin with soap and a ragged towel, in a newspaper a few crumbs of ginger nuts and a morsel of cheese. Yes, thought I, it is evident enough that Bartleby has been making his home here, keeping Bachelor's Hall all by himself. Immediately then the thought came sweeping across me, what miserable friendlessness and loneliness are here revealed. His poverty is great, but his solitude how horrible! Think of it. Of a Sunday, Wall Street is deserted as Petra, and every night of every day it is an emptiness. This building, too, which of weekdays hums with industry and life, at nightfall echoes with sheer vacancy, and all through Sunday is forlorn. And here Bartleby makes his home sole spectator of a solitude which he has seen all populous, a sort of innocent and transformed Marius, brooding among the ruins of Carthage. For the first time in my life a feeling of overpowering stinging melancholy seized me. Before I had never experienced aught but a not unpleasing sadness. The bond of a common humanity now drew me irresistibly to gloom a fraternal melancholy, for both I and Bartleby were sons of Adam. I remembered the bright silks and sparkling faces I had seen that day, in gala trim, swan-like sailing down the Mississippi of Broadway, and I contrasted them with the pallid copyist, and thought to myself, 
Ah, happiness courts the light, so we deem the world is gay. But misery hides aloof, so we deem that misery there is none. These sad fancyings, chimeras, doubtless, of a sick and silly brain, led on to other and more special thoughts concerning the eccentricities of Bartleby. Presentiments of strange discoveries hovered round me. The Scrivener's pale form appeared to me laid out among uncaring strangers in its shivering winding sheet. Suddenly I was attracted by Bartleby's closed desk, the key in open sight left in the lock. I mean no mischief, seek the gratification of no heartless curiosity, thought I. Besides, the desk is mine, and its contents too, so I will make bold to look within. Everything was methodically arranged, the papers smoothly placed, the pigeonholes were deep, and removing the files of documents I groped into their recesses. Presently I felt something there, and dragged it out. It was an old bandana handkerchief, heavy and knotted. I opened it, and saw it was a savings bank. I now recalled all the quiet mysteries which I had noted in the man. I remembered that he never spoke but to answer, that, though at intervals he had considerable time to himself, yet I had never seen him reading, no, not even a newspaper, that for long periods he would stand looking out at his pale window behind the screen upon the dead brick wall. I was quite sure he never visited any refectory or eating-house. While his pale face clearly indicated that he never drank beer like turkey, or tea and coffee even, like other men, he had never went anywhere in particular that I could learn, never went out for a walk, unless, indeed, that was the case at present, that he had declined telling who he was or whence he came, or whether he had any relatives in the world that though so thin and pale he never complained of ill health. And more than all, I remembered a certain unconscious air of pallid, how shall I call it, of pallid haughtiness, say, or rather an austere reserve about him, which had positively awed me into my tame compliance with his eccentricities, when I had feared to ask him to do the slightest incidental thing for me, even though I might know from his long-continued motionless that behind his screen he must be standing in one of those dead-wall reveries of his. Revolving all these things and coupling them with the recently discovered fact that he had made my office his constant abiding place and home, and not forgetful of his morbid moodiness, revolving all these things, a prudential feeling began to steal over me. My first emotions had been those of pure melancholy and sincerest pity, but just in proportion as the forlornness of Bartleby grew and grew to my imagination did that same melancholy merge into fear, that pity into repulsion. So true it is, and so terrible too, that up to a certain point the thought or sight of misery enlists our best affections but in certain special cases, beyond that point, it does not. They err who would assert that invariably this is owing to the inherent selfishness of the human heart. It rather proceeds from a certain hopelessness of remedying excessive and organic ill. To a sensitive being, pity is not seldom pain and when at last it is perceived that such pity cannot lead to effectual succor, common sense bids the soul be rid of it. What I say that morning persuaded me that the Scrivener was the victim of innate and incurable disorder. I might give alms to his body, but his body did not pain him. It was his soul that suffered, and his soul I could not reach." I did not accomplish the purpose of going to Trinity Church that morning. Somehow the things I had seen disqualified me for the time from church-going. I walked homeward, thinking what I would do with Bartleby. Finally I resolved upon this. I would put certain calm questions to him the next morning, 
touching his history, etc., and if he declined to answer them openly and unreservedly, and I supposed he would prefer not, then to give him a twenty-dollar bill over and above whatever I might owe him, and tell him his services were no longer required, but that if in any other way I could assist him, I would be happy to do so, especially if he desired to return to his native place, wherever that might be. I would willingly help to defray the expenses. Moreover, if after reaching home he found himself at a time in want of aid, a letter from him would be sure of a reply. The next morning came. Bartleby, said I, gently calling to him behind his screen. No reply. Bartleby, said I, in a still gentler tone, come here. I am not going to ask you to do anything you would prefer not to do. I simply wish to speak to you. Upon this he noiselessly slid into view. Will you tell me, Bartleby, where you were born? I would prefer not to. Will you tell me anything about yourself? I would prefer not to. But what reasonable objection can you have to speak to me? I feel friendly towards you. He did not look at me while I spoke, but kept his glance fixed upon my bust of Cicero, which, as I then sat, was directly behind me, some six inches above my head. "'What is your answer, Bartleby?' said I, after waiting a considerable time for a reply during which his countenance remained immovable. Only there was the faintest conceivable tremor of the white, attenuated mouth. "'At present I prefer to give no answer,' he said, and retired into his hermitage. It was rather weak in me, I confess, but his manner on this occasion nettled me. Not only did there seem to lurk in it a certain calm disdain, but his perverseness seemed ungrateful, considering the undeniable good usage and indulgence he had received from me. Again I sat ruminating what I should do. Mortified as I was at his behavior, and resolved as I had been to dismiss him when I entered my office, Nevertheless, I strangely felt something superstitious knocking at my heart, and forbidding me to carry out my purpose, and denouncing me for a villain if I dared to breathe one bitter word against this forlornest of mankind. At last, familiarly drawing my chair behind his screen, I sat down and said, Bartleby, never mind then about revealing your history, but let me entreat you, as a friend, to comply as far as may be with the usages of this office. Say now, you will help to examine papers tomorrow or next day. In short, say now that in a day or two you will begin to be a little reasonable. Say so, Bartleby. At present I would prefer not to be a little reasonable, was his mildly cadaverous reply. Just then, the folding doors opened, and Nippers approached. He seemed suffering from an unusually bad night's rest, induced by severer indigestion than common. He overheard those final words of Bartleby. "'Prefer not to, eh?' gritted Nippers. "'I'd prefer him if I were you, sir,' addressing me. "'I'd prefer him. I'd give him preferences, the stubborn mule. What is it, sir, pray, that he prefers not to do now?' Bartleby moved not a limb. Mr. Nippers, said I, I'd prefer that you would withdraw for the present. End of section. Bartleby, part two. Somehow of late I had got into the way of involuntarily using this word prefer upon all sorts of not exactly suitable occasions, and I trembled to think that my contact with the Scrivener had already and seriously affected me in a mental way and what further and deeper aberration might it not yet produce? This apprehension had not been without efficacy in determining me to summary measures. As Nippers looked very sour and sulky was departing, Turkey blandly and deferentially approached. "'With submission, sir,' said he, "'yesterday I was thinking about Bartleby here, and I think that if he would but prefer to take a quart of good ale every day, 
it would do much towards mending him and enabling him to assist in examining his papers so you have got the word too said i slightly excited with submission what word sir asked turkey respectfully crowding himself into the contracted space behind the screen and by doing so making me jostle the scrivener what word sir i would prefer to be left alone here said bartleby as if offended at being mobbed in his privacy that's the word turkey said i that's it oh prefer oh yes queer word i never use it myself but sir as i was saying if he would prefer turkey interrupted i you will please withdraw oh certainly sir if you prefer that i should as he opened the folding door to retire nippers at his desk caught a glimpse of me and asked whether i would prefer to have a certain paper copied on blue paper or white he did not in the least roguishly accent the word prefer it was plain that it involuntarily rolled from his tongue i thought to myself surely i must get rid of a demented man who already has in some degree turned the tongues if not the heads of myself and clerks but i thought it prudent not to break the dismission at once the next day i noticed that bartleby did nothing but stand at his window in his dead wall reverie upon asking him why he did not write he said that he had decided upon doing no more writing why how now what next exclaimed i do no more writing no more and what is the reason do you not see the reason for yourself he inadvertently replied i looked steadfastly at him and perceived that his eyes looked dull and glazed instantly it occurred to me that his unexampled diligence in copying by his dim window for the first few weeks of his stay with me might have temporarily impaired his vision i was touched i said something in condolence with him i hinted that of course he did wisely in abstaining from writing for a while and urged him to embrace that opportunity of taking wholesome exercise in the open air this however he did not do a few days after this my other clerks being absent and being in a great hurry to dispatch certain letters by the mail i thought that having nothing else earthly to do bartleby would surely be less inflexible than usual and carry these letters to the post office but he blankly declined so much to my inconvenience i went myself still added days went by whether bartleby's eyes improved or not i could not say to all appearance i thought they did but when i asked him if they did he vouchsafed no answer at all events he would do no copying at last in reply to my urgings he informed me that he had permanently given up copying what exclaimed i suppose your eyes should get entirely well better than ever before would you not copy then i have given up copying he answered and slid aside he remained as ever a fixture in my chamber nay if that were possible he became still more of a fixture than before what was to be done he would do nothing in the office why should he stay there in plain fact he had now become a millstone to me not only useless as a necklace but afflictive to bear yet i was sorry for him i speak less than truth when i say that on his own account he occasioned me uneasiness if he would but have named a single relative or friend i would instantly have written and urged their taking the poor fellow away to some convenient retreat but he seemed alone absolutely alone in the universe a bit of wreck in the mid-atlantic at length necessities connected with my business tyrannized over all other considerations decently as i could i told bartleby that in six days time he must unconditionally leave the office i warned him to take measures in the interval for procuring some other abode i offered to assist him in this endeavor if he himself would but take the first step towards a removal 
"'And when you finally quit me, Bartleby,' added I, "'I shall see that you go not away entirely unprovided. Six days from this hour, remember.' At the expiration of that period I peeped behind the screen, and lo, Bartleby was there. I buttoned up my coat, balanced myself, advanced slowly toward him, touched his collar, and said, "'The time has come. You must quit this place. I am sorry for you. Here is money, but you must go.' "'I would prefer not,' he replied, with his back still toward me. "'You must.' He remained silent. Now I had an unbounded confidence in this man's common honesty. He had frequently restored to me sixpences and shillings carelessly dropped upon the floor, for I am apt to be very reckless in such shirt-button affairs. The proceeding, then, which followed, will not be deemed extraordinary. Bartleby, said I, I owe you twelve dollars on account. Here are thirty-two. The odd twenty are yours. Will you take it? And I handed the bills towards him. But he made no motion. I will leave them here, then, putting them under a weight on the table. Then, taking my hat and cane and going to the door, I tranquilly turned and added, After you have removed your things from these offices, Bartleby, you will, of course, lock the door, since every one is now gone for the day but you, and if you please slip your key underneath the mat so that I may have it in the morning. I shall not see you again, so good-bye to you. If hereafter in your new place of abode I can be of any service to you, do not fail to advise me by letter. Good-bye, Bartleby, and fare you well. But he answered not a word like the last column of some ruined temple, he remained standing mute and solitary in the middle of the otherwise deserted room. As I walked home in a pensive mood, my vanity got the better of my pity. I could not but highly plume myself on my masterly management in getting rid of Bartleby. Masterly, I call it, and such it must appear to any dispassionate thinker. The beauty of my procedure seemed to consist in its perfect quietness. There was no vulgar bullying, no bravado of any sort, no choleric hectoring, and striding to and fro across the apartment, jerking out vehement commands for Bartleby to bundle himself off with his beggarly traps. Nothing of the kind. Without loudly bidding Bartleby depart, as an inferior genius might have done, I assumed the ground that depart he must, and upon that assumption built all I had to say. The more I thought over my procedure, the more I was charmed with it. Nevertheless, next morning, upon awakening, I had my doubts. I had somehow slept off the fumes of vanity. One of the coolest and wisest hours a man has is just after he awakes in the morning. My procedure seemed as sagacious as ever but only in theory. How it would prove in practice, there was the rub. It was truly a beautiful thought to have assumed Bartleby's departure, but after all that assumption was simply my own, and none of Bartleby's. The great point was not whether I had assumed that he would quit me, but whether he would prefer so to do. He was more a man of preferences than assumptions. After breakfast I walked downtown arguing the probabilities pro and con. One moment I thought it would prove a miserable failure, and Bartleby would be found all alive at my office as usual. The next moment it seemed certain that I should find his chair empty, and so I kept veering about. At the corner of Broadway and Canal Street I saw quite an excited group of people standing in earnest conversation. "'I'll take odds he doesn't said a voice as I passed. "'Doesn't go?' "'Done,' said I. "'Put up your money.' I was instinctively putting my hand in my pocket to produce my own when I remembered that this was an election day. The words I had heard bore no reference to Bartleby, but to the success or non-success of some candidate for the mayoralty. In my intent frame of mind I had, as it were, imagined that all Broadway shared in my excitement and were debating the same question with me. 
I passed on very thankful that the uproar of the street screened my momentary absent-mindedness. As I had intended, I was earlier than usual at my office door. I stood listening for a moment. All was still. He must be gone. I tried the knob. The door was locked. Yes, my procedure had worked to a charm. He indeed must be vanished. Yet a certain melancholy mixed with this. I was almost sorry for my brilliant success. I was fumbling under the doormat for the key which Bartleby was to have left there for me, when accidentally my knee knocked against a panel, producing a summoning sound, and in response a voice came to me from within, "'Not yet. I am occupied.' It was Bartleby. I was thunderstruck. For an instant I stood like the man who, pipe in mouth, was killed one cloudless afternoon long ago in Virginia by summer lightning. At his own warm open window he was killed, and remained leaning out there upon the dreamy afternoon till someone touched him when he fell. "'Not gone,' I murmured at last. But again obeying that wondrous ascendancy with the inscrutable Scrivener head over me, and from which ascendancy for all my chafing I could not completely escape, I slowly went downstairs and out into the street, and, while walking round the block, considered what I should next do in this unheard of perplexity. Turn the man out by an actual thrusting I could not. To drive him away by calling him hard names would not do. Calling in the police was an unpleasant idea, and yet, permit him to enjoy his cadaverous triumph over me, this, too, I could not think of. What was to be done? Or, if nothing could be done, was there anything further that I could assume in the matter? Yes, as before, I had prospectively assumed that Bartleby would depart, so now I might retrospectively assume that departed he was. In the legitimate carrying out of this assumption, I might enter my office in a great hurry, and, pretending not to see Bartleby at all, walk straight against him as if he were heir. Such a proceeding would in a singular degree have the appearance of a home thrust. It was hardly possible that Bartleby could withstand such an application of the doctrine of assumptions. But upon second thoughts the success of the plan seemed rather dubious. I resolved to argue the matter over with him again. Bartleby, said I, entering the office with a quietly severe expression, I am seriously displeased. I am pained, Bartleby. I had thought better of you. I had imagined you of such a gentlemanly organization that in my delicate dilemma a slight hint would suffice, in short, an assumption. But it appears I am deceived. Why, I added, unaffectedly starting, you have not even touched that money yet, pointing to it, just where I had left it the evening previous. He answered nothing. Will you, or will you not, quit me? I now demanded, in a sudden passion, advancing close to him. I would prefer not to quit you, he replied gently, emphasizing the not. What earthly right have you to stay here? Do you pay any rent? Do you pay my taxes, or is this property yours?" He answered nothing. Are you ready to go on and write now? Are your eyes recovered? Could you copy a small paper for me this morning, or help examine a few lines, or step round to the post office? In a word, will you do anything at all to give a coloring to your refusal to depart the premises? He silently retired into his hermitage. I was now in such a state of nervous resentment that I thought it but prudent to check myself at present from further demonstrations. Bartleby and I were alone. I remembered the tragedy of the unfortunate Adams and the still more unfortunate Colt in the solitary office of the latter, and how poor Colt, being dreadfully incensed by Adams, and imprudently permitting himself to get wildly excited, was at unawares hurried into his fatal act, an act which certainly no man could possibly deplore more than the actor himself. Often it had occurred to me in my ponderings upon the subject 
that had that altercation taken place in the public street or at a private residence, it would not have terminated as it did. It was the circumstance of being alone in a solitary office, upstairs, of a building entirely unhallowed by humanizing domestic associations, an uncarpeted office, doubtless, of a dusty, haggard sort of appearance. This it must have been, which greatly helped to enhance the irritable desperation of the hapless colt. But when this old atom of resentment rose in me and tempted me concerning Bartleby, I grappled him and threw him. How? Why, simply by recalling the divine injunction, A new commandment give I unto you, that ye love one another. Yes, this it was that saved me. Aside from higher considerations, charity often operates as a vastly wise and prudent principle, a great safeguard to its possessor. Men have committed murder for jealousy's sake, and anger's sake, and hatred's sake, and selfishness's sake, and spiritual pride's sake. But no man that ever I heard of ever committed a diabolical murder for sweet charity's sake. Mere self-interest, then, if no better motive can be enlisted, should, especially with high-tempered men, prompt all beings to charity and philanthropy. At any rate, upon the occasion in question, I strove to drown my exasperated feelings toward the Scrivener by benevolently construing his conduct. Poor fellow, poor fellow, thought I, he don't mean anything, and besides, he has seen hard times and ought to be indulged. I endeavored also immediately to occupy myself, and at the same time to comfort my despondency. I tried to fancy that in the course of the morning, at such time as might prove agreeable to him, Bartleby of his own free accord would emerge from his hermitage and take up some decided line of march in the direction of the door. But no, half-past twelve o'clock came, Turkey began to glow in the face, overturn his inkstand, and become generally obstreperous. Nippers abated down into quietude and courtesy. Ginger Nut munched his noon apple, and Bartleby remained standing at his window in one of his profoundest dead-wall reveries. Will it be credited? Ought I to acknowledge it? That afternoon I left the office without saying one further word to him. Some days now passed, during which, at leisure intervals, I looked a little into Edwards on the will, and Priestley on necessity. Under the circumstances those books induced a salutary feeling. Gradually I slid into the persuasion that these troubles of mine, touching the Scrivener, had been all predestinated from eternity and Bartleby was billeted upon me for some mysterious person of an all-wise providence which it was not for a mere mortal like me to fathom. Yes, Bartleby, stay there behind your screen, thought I. I shall persecute you no more. You are harmless and noiseless as any of these old chairs. In short, I never feel so private as when I know you are here. At last I see it. I feel it. I penetrate to the predestinated purpose of my life. I am content. Others may have loftier parts to enact, but my mission in this world, Bartleby, is to furnish you with office room for such period as you may see fit to remain. I believe that this wise and blessed frame of mind would have continued with me had it not been for the unsolicited and uncharitable remarks obtruded upon me by my professional friends who visited the rooms. But thus it often is that the constant friction of illiberal minds wears out at last the best resolves of the more generous. Though, to be sure, when I reflected upon it, it was not strange that people entering my office should be struck by the peculiar aspect of the unaccountable Bartleby, and so be tempted to throw out some sinister observations concerning him. Sometimes an attorney, having business with me and calling at my office, and finding no one but the Scrivener there, would undertake to obtain some sort of precise information from him touching my whereabouts, but without heeding his idle talk, 
Bartleby would remain standing immovable in the middle of the room. So, after contemplating him in that position for a time, the attorney would depart no wiser than he came. Also, when a reference was going on, and the room full of lawyers and witnesses, and business was driving fast, some deeply occupied legal gentleman present, seeing Bartleby wholly unemployed, would request him to run round to his legal gentleman's office and fetch some papers for him. Thereupon Bartleby would tranquilly decline, and yet remain idle as before. Then the lawyer would give a great stare and turn to me, and what could I say? At last I was made aware that all through the circle of my professional acquaintance a whisper of wonder was running round, having reference to this strange creature I kept at my office. This worried me very much, and as the idea came upon me of his possibly turning out a long-lived man, and keep occupying my chambers, and denying my authority, and perplexing my visitors, and scandalizing my professional reputation, and casting a general gloom over the premises, keeping soul and body together to the last upon his savings, for doubtless he spent but half a dime a day, and in the end perhaps outlive me and claim possession of my office by right of his perpetual occupancy. As all these dark anticipations crowded upon me more and more, and my friends continually intruded their relentless remarks upon the apparition in my room, a great change was wrought in me. I resolved to gather all my faculties together and forever rid me of this intolerable incubus. Ere revolving any complicated project, however, adapted to this end, I first simply suggested to Bartleby the propriety of his permanent departure. In a calm and serious tone I commanded the idea to his careful and mature consideration. But having taken three days to meditate upon it, he apprised me that his original determination remained the same, in short that he still preferred to abide with me. What shall I do? I now said to myself, buttoning up my coat to the last button, what shall I do? What ought I to do? What does conscience say I should do with this man, or rather ghost? Rid myself of him I must. Go he shall. But how? You will not thrust him, the poor pale passive mortal. You will not thrust such a helpless creature out of your door. You will not dishonor yourself by such cruelty? No, I will not. I cannot do that. Rather would I let him live and die here, and then mason up his remains in the wall. What then will you do? For all your coaxing he will not budge. Bribes he leaves under your own paperweight on your table. In short, it is quite plain that he prefers to cling to you. Then something severe, something unusual must be done. What? Surely you will not have him collared by a constable and commit his innocent pallor to the common jail? And upon what ground could you procure such a thing to be done? A vagrant, is he? What? He a vagrant, a wanderer, who refuses to budge? It is because he will not be a vagrant, then, that you seek to count him as a vagrant. That is too absurd. No visible means of support. There. I have him. Wrong again, for indubitably he does support himself, and that is the only unanswerable proof that any man can show of his possession the means so to do, no more than, since he will not quit me, I must quit him. I will change my offices. I will move elsewhere, and give him fair notice, that if I find him on my new premises I will then proceed against him as a common trespasser." Acting accordingly next day, I thus addressed him. I find these chambers too far from the city hall. The air is unwholesome. In a word, I propose to remove my offices next week, and shall no longer require your services. I tell you this now, in order that you may seek another place. He made no reply, and nothing more was said. On the appointed day I engaged carts and men, proceeded to my chambers, and having but little furniture everything was removed in a few hours. 
Throughout, the scrivener remained standing behind the screen, which I directed to be removed the last thing. It was withdrawn, and being folded up like a huge folio, left him the motionless occupant of a naked room. I stood in the entry watching him a moment, while something from within me upbraided me. I re-entered, with my hand in my pocket and, and my heart in my mouth. Good-bye, Bartleby. I am going. Good-bye, and God some way bless you. And take that, slipping something in his hand, but it dropped upon the floor. And then, strange to say, I tore myself from him whom I had so long to be rid of. Established in my new quarters for a day or two, I kept the door locked, and started at every footfall in the passages. When I returned to my rooms, after any little absence, I would pause at the threshold for an instant, and attentively listen, ere applying my key. But these fears were needless, Bartleby never came nigh me. I thought all was going well when a perturbed-looking stranger visited me, inquiring whether I was the person who had recently occupied rooms number blank blank Wall Street. Full of forebodings, I replied that I was. Then, sir, said the stranger, who proved a lawyer, you are responsible for the man you left there. He refuses to do any copying. He refuses to do anything. He says he prefers not to, and he refuses to quit the premises. I am very sorry, sir, said I, with assumed tranquillity, but an inward tremor. But really, the man you allude to is nothing to me. He is no relation or apprentice of mine that you should hold me responsible for him. In mercy's name, who is he? I certainly cannot inform you. I know nothing about him. Formerly I employed him as a copyist, but he has done nothing for me now for some time past. I shall settle him then. Good morning, sir. Several days passed, and I heard nothing more and, though I often felt a charitable prompting to call at the place and see poor Bartleby, yet a certain squeamishness, of I know not what, withheld me. All is over with him by this time, thought I, at last, when, through another week, no further intelligence reached me. But coming to my room the day after, I found several persons waiting at my door in a high state of nervous excitement. "'That's the man! Here he comes!' cried the foremost one whom I recognized as the lawyer who had previously called upon me alone. "'You must take him away, sir, at once,' cried a portly person among them, advancing upon me, and whom I knew to be the landlord of number blank blank Wall Street. "'These gentlemen, my tenants, cannot stand it any longer. Mr. B. blank blank, pointing to the lawyer, has turned him out of his room, and he now persists in haunting the building generally, sitting upon the banisters of the stairs by day, and sleeping in the entry by night. Everybody is concerned. Clients are leaving the offices. Some fears are entertained of a mob. Something you must do, and that without delay. Aghast at this torrent, I fell back before it, and would fain have locked myself in my new quarters. In vain I persisted that Bartleby was nothing to me, no more than to any one else. In vain... I was the last person known to have anything to do with him, and they held me to the terrible account. Fearful, then, of being exposed in the papers, as one person presently obscurely threatened, I considered the matter, and at length said that if the lawyer would give me a confidential interview with the scrivener in his, the lawyer's, own room, I would that afternoon strive my best to rid them of the nuisance they complained of. Going upstairs to my old haunt, there was Bartleby, silently sitting upon the banister at the landing. "'What are you doing here, Bartleby?' said I. "'Sitting upon the banister,' he mildly replied. I motioned him into the lawyer's room, who then left us. "'Bartleby,' said I, are you aware that you are the cause of great tribulation to me by persisting in occupying the entry after being dismissed from the office? No answer. Now, one of two things must take place. Either you must do something, or something must be done to you. 
Now, what sort of business would you like to engage in? Would you like to re-engage in copying for someone? No, I would prefer not to take any change. Would you like a clerkship in a dry goods store? There is too much confinement about that. No, I would not like a clerkship, but I am not particular. Too much confinement, I cried. Why, you keep yourself confined all the time. I would prefer not to take a clerkship, he rejoined, as if to settle that little item at once. How would a bartender's business suit you? There is no trying of the eyesight in that. I would not like it at all, though, as I said before, I am not particular. His unwanted wordiness inspired me. I returned to the charge. Well, then, would you like to travel through the country collecting bills for the merchants? That would improve your health. No, I would prefer to be doing something else. How, then, would going as a companion to Europe, to entertain some young gentleman with your conversation, how would that suit you? Not at all. It does not strike me that there is anything definite about that. I like to be stationary, but I am not particular. Stationary you shall be, then, I cried, now losing all patience, and for the first time in all my exasperating connection with him fairly flying into a passion. If you do not go away from these premises before night, I shall feel bound, indeed I am bound, to, to, to quit the premises myself. I rather absurdly concluded, knowing not with what possible threat to try to frighten his immobility into compliance. Despairing of all further efforts, I was precipitately leaving him when a final thought occurred to me, one which had not been wholly unindulged before. Bartleby, said I, in the kindest tone I could assume under such exciting circumstances, will you go home with me now, not to my office, but my dwelling, and remain there till we can conclude upon some convenient arrangement for you at our leisure? Come, let us start now, right away. No, at present I would prefer not to make any change at all. I answered nothing but effectually dodging every one by the suddenness and rapidity of my flight, rushed from the building, ran up Wall Street towards Broadway, and, jumping into the first omnibus, was soon removed from pursuit. As soon as tranquility returned, I distinctly perceived that I had now done all that I possibly could, both in respect to the demands of the landlord and his tenants, and with regard to my own desire and sense of duty to benefit Bartleby and shield him from rude persecution, I now strove to be entirely carefree and quiescent, and my conscience justified me in the attempt, though indeed it was not so successful as I could have wished. So fearful was I of being again hunted out by the incensed landlord and his exasperated tenants that surrendering my business to nippers for a few days, I drove about the upper part of the town and through the suburbs in my rockaway, crossed over to Jersey City and Hoboken, and paid fugitive visits to Manhattanville and Astoria. In fact, I almost lived in my rockaway for the time. When again I entered my office, lo, a note from the landlord lay upon the desk. I opened it with trembling hands, it informed me that the writer had sent to the police and had Bartleby removed to the tombs as a vagrant. Moreover, since I knew more about him than anyone else, he wished me to appear at that place and make a suitable statement of the facts. These tidings had a conflicting effect upon me. At first I was indignant, but at last almost approved. The landlord's energetic, summary disposition had led him to adopt a procedure which I do not think I would have decided upon myself, and yet as a last resort, under such peculiar circumstances, it seemed the only plan. As I afterwards learned, the poor Scrivener, when told that he must be conducted to the tombs, offered not the slightest obstacle, but in his pale, unmoving way silently acquiesced. Some of the compassionate and curious bystanders joined the party, and headed by one of the constables arm-in-arm arm with Bartleby, 
the silent procession filed its way through all the noise and heat and joy of the roaring thoroughfares at noon. The same day I received the note I went to the tombs, or, to speak more properly, the halls of justice. Seeking the right officer, I stated the purpose of my call, and was informed that the individual I described was indeed within. I then assured the functionary that Bartleby was a perfectly honest man, and greatly to be compassionated, however unaccountably eccentric. I narrated all I knew, and closed by suggesting the idea of letting him remain in as indulgent confinement as possible, till something less harsh might be done, though indeed I hardly knew what. At all events, if nothing else could be decided upon, the almshouse must receive him. I then begged to have an interview. Being under no disgraceful charge, and quite serene and harmless in all his ways, they had permitted him freely to wander about the prison, and especially in the enclosed grass-platted yards thereof. And so I found him there, standing all alone in the quietest of the yards, his face towards a high wall, while all around, from the narrow slits of the jail windows, I thought I saw peering out upon him the eyes of murderers and thieves. Bartleby! I know you, he said, without looking round, and I want nothing to say to you. It was not I that brought you here, Bartleby, said I, keenly pained at his implied suspicion, and to you this should not be so vile a place. Nothing reproachful attaches to you by being here, and see, it is not so sad a place as one might think. Look, there is the sky, and here is the grass. I know where I am, he replied, but would say nothing more. And so I left him. As I entered the corridor again, a broad, meat-like man in an apron accosted me, and jerking his thumb over his shoulder said, Is that your friend? Yes. Does he want to starve? If he does, let him live on the prison fare, that's all. Who are you? asked I, not knowing what to make of such an unofficially speaking person in such a place. I am the grub man. Such gentlemen as have friends here hire me to provide them with something good to eat. Is this so? said I, turning to the turnkey. He said it was. Well, then, said I, slipping some silver into the grub men's hands, for so they called him, I want you to give particular attention to my friend there. Let him have the best dinner you can get, and you must be as polite to him as possible. Introduce me, will you? said the grub man, looking at me with an expression which seemed to say he was all impatience for an opportunity to give a specimen of his breeding. Thinking it would prove of benefit to the scrivener, I acquiesced, and, asking the grub man his name, went up with him to Bartleby. Bartleby, this is a friend. You will find him very useful to you. Your servant, sir, your servant, said the grub man, making a low salutation behind his apron. Hope you find it pleasant here, sir. Nice grounds, cool apartments. Hope you'll stay with us some time. Try to make it agreeable. What will you have for dinner today? I prefer not to dine today, said Bartleby, turning away. It would disagree with me. I am unused to dinners. So saying, he slowly moved to the other side of the enclosure, and took up a position fronting the dead wall. How's this? said the grub man, addressing me with a stare of astonishment. He's odds, ain't he? I think he is a little deranged, said I sadly. Deranged? Deranged, is it? Well, now, upon my word, I thought that friend of yourn was a gentleman forger. They are always pale and genteel like them forgers. I can't help pity em. Can't help it, sir. Do you know Monroe Edwards? He added touchingly, and paused. Then, laying his hand piteously on my shoulder, sighed, He died of consumption at Sing Sing. So you weren't acquainted with Monroe? No, I was never socially acquainted with any forgers. But I cannot stop longer. Uh, look to my friend yonder. You will not lose by it. I will see you again. Some few days after this I again obtained admission to the tombs, and went through the corridors in quest of Bartleby, but without finding him, 
"'I saw him coming from his cell not long ago,' said a turnkey. "'Maybe he's gone to loiter in the yards.' So I went in that direction. "'Are you looking for the silent man?' said another turnkey, passing me. "'Yonder he lies, sleeping in the yard there. "'Tis not twenty minutes since I saw him lie down.' The yard was entirely quiet. It was not accessible to the common prisoners. The surrounding walls of amazing thickness kept off all sounds behind them. The Egyptian character of the masonry weighed upon me with its gloom. But a soft, imprisoned turf grew underfoot. The heart of the eternal pyramids, it seemed, wherein, by some strange magic, through the clefts, grass seed dropped by birds had sprung. Strangely huddled at the base of the wall, his knees drawn up and lying on his side, his head touching the cold stones, I saw the wasted Bartleby. But nothing stirred. I paused, then went close up to him, stooped over and saw that his dim eyes were open, otherwise he seemed profoundly sleeping. Something prompted me to touch him. I felt his hand, when a tingling shiver ran up my arm and down my spine to my feet. The round face of the grub-man peered upon me now. "'His dinner is ready. Won't he dine today, either? Or does he live without dining?' "'Lives without dining,' said I, and closed the eyes. "'Eh? He's asleep, ain't he?' "'With kings and counselors,' murmured I." There would seem little need for proceeding further in this history. Imagination will readily supply the meager recital of poor Bartleby's internment. But, ere parting with the reader, let me say that, if this little narrative has sufficiently interested him to awaken curiosity as to who Bartleby was, and what manner of life he led prior to the present narrator's making his acquaintance, I can only reply that, in such curiosity I fully share, but am wholly unable to gratify it. Yet here I hardly know whether I should indulge one little item of rumor which came to my ear a few months after the Scribner's death. Upon what basis it rested I could never ascertain, and hence how true it is I cannot now tell. But inasmuch as this vague report has not been without a certain suggestive interest to me, however sad, it may prove the same with some others, and so I will briefly mention it. The report was this, that Bartleby had been a subordinate clerk in the dead-letter office at Washington, from which he had been suddenly removed by a change in the administration. When I think over this rumor, hardly can I express the emotions which seize me. Dead letters! Does it not sound like dead men? Conceive a man by nature and misfortune prone to a pallid hopelessness, can any business seem more fitted to heighten it than that of continually handling these dead letters and assorting them for the flames? For by the cartload they are annually burned. Sometimes from out the folded paper the pale clerk takes a ring. The finger it was meant for, perhaps, molders in the grave. A banknote sent in swiftest charity. He whom it would relieve, nor eats nor hungers any more. Pardon for those who died despairing. Hope for those who died unhoping. Good tidings for those who died stifled by unrelieved calamities. On errands of life these letters speed to death. Ah, Bartleby! Ah, humanity! End of section. Benito Sereno, Part One. In the year 1799, Captain Amasa Delano of Dukesbury, Massachusetts, commanding a large sealer and general trader lay at anchor with a valuable cargo in the harbor of Santa Maria, a small, desert, uninhabited island toward the southern extremity of the long coast of Chile. There he had touched for water. On the second day, not long after dawn, while lying in his berth, his mate came below, informing him that a strange sail was coming into the bay. Ships were then not so plenty in those waters as now. He rose, dressed, 
and went on deck. The morning was one peculiar to that coast. Everything was mute and calm, everything gray. The sea, though undulated into long roods of swells, seemed fixed, and was sleeked at the surface like waved lead that has cooled and set in the smelter's mold. The sky seemed a gray surtout. Flights of troubled gray fowl, kith and kin with flights of troubled gray vapors among which they were mixed, skimmed low and fitfully over the waters, as swallows over meadows before storms shadows present, foreshadowing deeper shadows to come. To Captain Delano's surprise, the stranger viewed through the glass showed no colors, though to do so upon entering a haven, however uninhabited in its shores, where but a single other ship might be lying, was the custom among peaceful seamen of all nations. Considering the lawlessness and loneliness of the spot, and the sort of stories at that day associated with those seas, Captain Delano's surprise might have deepened into some uneasiness had he not been a person of a singularly undistrustful good nature, not liable, except on extraordinary and repeated incentives, and hardly then, to indulge in personal alarms any way involving the imputation of malign evil in man. Whether, in view of what humanity is capable, such a trait implies, along with a benevolent heart, more than ordinary quickness and accuracy of intellectual perception, may be left to the wise to determine. But whatever misgivings might have obtruded on first seeing the stranger would almost, in any seaman's mind, have been dissipated by observing that the ship, in navigating into the harbor, was drawing too near the land, a sunken reef making out off her bow. This seemed to prove her a stranger indeed, not only to the sealer, but the island. Consequently she could be no wanted freebooter on that ocean. With no small interest Captain Delano continued to watch her, a proceeding not much facilitated by the vapors partly mantling the hull, through which the far matin light from her cabin streamed equivocally enough, much like the sun, by this time hemisphered on the rim of the horizon, and apparently in company with the strange ship entering the harbor, which, wimpled by the same low creeping clouds, showed not unlike a Lima Intrigante's one sinister eye peering across the plaza from the Indian loophole of her dusk, Saya Imanta. It might have been but a deception of the vapors, but the longer the stranger was watched, the more singular appeared her maneuvers. Ere long it seemed hard to decide whether she meant to come in or no, what she wanted, or what she was about. The wind, which had breezed up a little during the night, was now extremely light and baffling, which the more increased the apparent uncertainty of her movements. Surmising at last that it might be a ship in distress, Captain Delano ordered his whaleboat to be dropped, and much to the wary opposition of his mate, prepared to board her, and at the least pilot her in. On the night previous a fishing party of the seamen had gone a long distance to some detached rocks out of sight from the sealer, and an hour or two before daybreak had returned, having met with no small success. Presuming that the stranger might have been long off soundings, the good captain put several baskets of the fish for presents into his boat, and so pulled away. From her continuing too near the sunken reef, deeming her in danger, calling to his men, he made all haste to apprise those on board of their situation. But some time ere the boat came up, the wind, light though it was, having shifted, had headed the vessel off, as well as partly broken the vapors from about her. Upon gaining a less remote view, the ship, when made signally visible on the verge of the leaden-hued swells, with the shreds of fog here and there raggedly furring her, appeared like a whitewashed monastery after a thunderstorm, seen perched upon some dun cliff among the Pyrenees, 
but it was no purely fanciful resemblance which now for a moment almost led captain delano to think that nothing less than a shipload of monks was before him peering over the bulwarks were what really seemed in the hazy distance throngs of dark cowls while fitfully revealed through the open portholes other dark moving figures were dimly descried as of black friars pacing the cloisters upon a still nigher approach this appearance was modified and the true character of the vessel was plain a spanish merchantman of the first class carrying negro slaves amongst other valuable freight from one colonial port to another a very large and in its time a very fine vessel such as in those days were at intervals encountered along that main sometimes superseded acapulco treasure ships or retired frigates of the spanish king's navy which like superannuated italian palaces still under a decline of masters preserved signs of former state as the whaleboat drew more and more nigh the cause of the peculiar pipe-clayed aspect of the stranger was seen in the slovenly neglect pervading her the spars ropes and great part of the bulwarks looked woolly from long unacquaintance with the scraper tar and the brush her keel seemed laid her ribs put together and she launched from ezekiel's valley of dry bones in the present business in which she was engaged the ship's general model and rig appeared to have undergone no material change from their original warlike and froissart pattern however no guns were seen the tops were large and were railed about with what had once been octagonal network all now in sad disrepair these tops hung overhead like three ruinous aviaries in one of which was seen perched on a rattlin a white noddy a strange fowl so called from its lethargic somnambulistic character being frequently caught by hand at sea battered and mouldy the castellated forecastle seemed some ancient turret long ago taken by assault and then left to decay toward the stern two high-raised quarter galleries the balustrades here and there covered with dry tindery sea moss opening out from the unoccupied state cabin whose dead lights for all the mild weather were hermetically closed and caulked these tenantless balconies hung over the sea as if it were the grand venetian canal but the principal relic of the faded grandeur was the ample oval of the shield-like sternpiece intricately carved with the arms of castile and leon medallioned about by groups of mythological or symbolical devices uppermost and central of which was a dark satyr in a mask holding his foot on the prostrate neck of a writhing figure likewise masked whether the ship had a figurehead or only a plain beak was not quite certain owing to canvas wrapped about that part either to protect it while undergoing a refurbishing or else decently to hide its decay rudely painted or chalked as in a sailor freak along the forward side of a sort of pedestal below the canvas was the sentence seguid vuestro jefe follow your leader while upon the tarnished headboards near by appeared in stately capitals once gilt the ship's name san dominique each letter streakingly corroded with tricklings of copper spike rust while like morning weeds dark festoons of sea grass slimily swept to and fro over the name with every hearse-like roll of the hull as at last the boat was hooked from the bow along toward the gangway amidship its keel while yet some inches separated from the hull harshly grated as on sunken coral reef it proved a huge bunch of conglobated barnacles adhering below the water to the side like a wen a token of baffling airs and long calms passed somewhere in those seas climbing the side the visitor was at once surrounded by a clamorous throng of whites and blacks 
but the latter outnumbered the former more than could have been expected, negro transportation ship as the stranger in port was. But in one language, and as with one voice, all poured out a common tale of suffering, in which the negresses, of whom there were not a few, exceeded the others in their dolorous vehemence. The scurvy, together with the fever, had swept off a great part of their number, more especially the Spaniards. Off Cape Horn they had narrowly escaped shipwreck. Then for days together they had lain tranced without wind. Their provisions were low, their water next to none, their lips that moment were baked. While Captain Delano was thus made the mark of all eager tongues, his one eager glance took in all the faces with every other object about him. Always upon first boarding a large and populous ship at sea, especially a foreign one with a nondescript crew such as Lascars or Manila men, the impression varies in a peculiar way from that produced by first entering a strange house with strange inmates in a strange land. Both house and ship, the one by its walls and blinds, the other by its high bulwarks like ramparts, hoard from view their interiors till the last moment. But in the case of the ship there is this addition, that the living spectacle it contains, upon its sudden and complete disclosure, has, in contrast with the blank ocean which zones it, something of the effect of enchantment. The ship seems unreal. These strange costumes, gestures, and faces but a shadowy tableau just emerged from the deep, which directly must receive back what it gave. Perhaps it was some such influence as above is attempted to be described, which in Captain Delano's mind heightened whatever, upon a staid scrutiny, might have seemed unusual, especially the conspicuous figures of four elderly grizzled negroes, their heads like black dotted willow-tops, who, in venerable contrast to the tumult below them, were couched sphinx-like, one on the starboard cathead, another on the larboard, and the remaining pair face to face on the opposite bulwarks above the main chains. They each had bits of unstranded old junk in their hands, and, with a sort of stoical self-content, were picking the junk into oakum, a small heap of which lay by their sides. They accompanied the task with a continuous, low, monotonous chant, droning and drilling away like so many gray-headed bagpipers playing a funeral march. The quarter-deck rose into an ample elevated poop, upon the forward verge of which lifted, like the oakum pickers, some eight feet above the general throng, sat along in a row, separated by regular spaces, the cross-legged figures of six other blacks, each with a rusty hatchet in his hand, which, with a bit of brick and a rag, he was engaged like a scullion in scouring, while between each two was a small stack of hatchets, their rusted edges turned forward, awaiting a like operation. Though occasionally the four oakum pickers would briefly address some person or persons in the crowd below, yet the six hatchet polishers, neither spoke to others, nor breathed a whisper among themselves, but sat intent upon their task, except at intervals when, with the peculiar love in negroes of uniting industry with pastime, two and two they sideways clashed their hatchets together, like symbols, with a barbarous din. All six, unlike the generality, had the raw aspect of unsophisticated Africans. But that first comprehensive glance which took in those ten figures, with scores less conspicuous, rested but an instant upon them, as, impatient of the hubbub of voices, the visitor turned in quest of whomsoever it might be that commanded the ship. But as if not unwilling to let nature make known her own case among his suffering charge, or else in despair of restraining it for the time, the Spanish captain, a gentlemanly, reserved-looking, and rather young man to a stranger's eye, dressed with singular richness, but bearing plain traces of recent sleepless cares and disquietudes, 
stood passively by, leaning against the mainmast at one moment casting a dreary, spiritless look upon his excited people, at the next an unhappy glance toward his visitor. By his side stood a black of small stature, in whose rude face, as occasionally, like a shepherd's dog, he mutely turned it up into the Spaniards, sorrow and affection were equally blended. Struggling through the throng, the American advanced to the Spaniard, assuring him of his sympathies, and offering to render whatever assistance might be in his power to which the Spaniard returned for the present, but grave and ceremonious acknowledgments, his national formality dusked by the saturnine mood of ill health. But losing no time in mere compliments, Captain Delano, returning to the gangway, had his basket of fish brought up, and as the wind still continued light, so that some hours at least must elapse ere the ship could be brought to the anchorage, he bade his men return to the sealer, and fetch back as much water as the whaleboat could carry, with whatever soft bread the steward might have, all the remaining pumpkins on board, with a box of sugar, and a dozen of his private bottles of cider. Not many minutes after the boat's pushing off, to the vexation of all, the wind entirely died away, and the tide, turning, began drifting back the ship helplessly seaward. But trusting this would not long last, Captain Delano sought, with good hopes, to cheer up the strangers, feeling no small satisfaction that, with persons in their condition, he could, thanks to his frequent voyages along the Spanish main, converse with some freedom in their native tongue. While left alone with them, he was not long in observing some things tending to heighten his first impressions, but surprise was lost in pity both for the Spaniards and blacks, alike evidently reduced from scarcity of water and provisions, while long-continued suffering seemed to have brought out the less good-natured qualities of the negroes, besides, at the same time, impairing the Spaniards' authority over them. But under the circumstances precisely this condition of things was to have been anticipated. In armies, navies, cities or families in nature herself. Nothing more relaxes good order than misery. Still, Captain Delano was not without the idea that, had Benito Sereno been a man of greater energy, misrule would hardly have come to the present pass. But the debility, constitutional or induced by hardships, bodily and mental, of the Spanish captain, was too obvious to be overlooked. A prey to settled dejection, as if long mocked with hope he would not now indulge it, even when it had ceased to be a mock, the prospect of that day, or evening at furthest, lying at anchor, with plenty of water for his people and a brother captain to counsel and befriend, seemed in no perceptible degree to encourage him. His mind appeared unstrung, if not still more seriously affected shut up in these oaken walls, chained to one dull round of command whose unconditionality cloyed him, like some hypochondriac abbot he moved slowly about, at times suddenly pausing, starting or staring, biting his lip, biting his fingernail, flushing, paling, twitching his beard, with other symptoms of an absent or moody mind. This distempered spirit was lodged, as before hinted, in as distempered a frame. He was rather tall, but seemed never to have been robust, and now with nervous suffering was almost worn to a skeleton. A tendency to some pulmonary complaint appeared to have been lately confirmed. His voice was like that of one with lungs half gone, hoarsely suppressed, a husky whisper. No wonder that as in this state he tottered about, his private servant apprehensively followed him. Sometimes the negro gave his master his arm, or took his handkerchief out of his pocket for him, performing these and similar offices with that affectionate zeal which transmutes into something filial, or fraternal acts in themselves, but menial, and which has gained for the negro the repute of making the most pleasing body-servant in the world 
one, too, whom a master need to be on no stiffly superior terms with, but may treat with familiar trust, less a servant than a devoted companion. Marking the noisy indocility of the blacks in general, as well as what seemed the sullen inefficiency of the whites, it was not without humane satisfaction that Captain Delano witnessed the steady good conduct of Babot. But the good conduct of Babot, hardly more than the ill behavior of others, seemed to withdraw the half-lunatic Don Benito from his cloudy languor. Not that such precisely was the impression made by the Spaniard on the mind of his visitor. The Spaniard's individual unrest was, for the present, but noted as a conspicuous feature in the ship's general affliction. Still Captain Delano was not a little concerned at what he could not help taking, for the time to be, Don Benito's unfriendly indifference toward himself. The Spaniard's manner, too, conveyed a sort of sour and gloomy disdain, which he seemed at no pains to disguise. But this the American in charity ascribed to the harassing effects of sickness, since in former instances he had noted that there are peculiar natures on whom prolonged physical suffering seems to cancel every social instinct of kindness, as if forced to black bread themselves they deemed it but equity that each person coming nigh them should, indirectly, by some slight or affront, be made to partake of their fare. But ere long Captain Delano bethought him that, indulgent as he was at the first in judging the Spaniard, he might not, after all, have exercised charity enough. At bottom it was Don Benito's reserve which displeased him, but the same reserve was shown towards all but his faithful personal attendant. Even the formal reports, which, according to sea usage, were, at stated times, made to him by some petty underling, either a white, mulatto, or black, he hardly had patience enough to listen to, without betraying contemptuous aversion. His manner upon such occasions was, in its degree, not unlike that which might be supposed to have been his imperial countryman's, Charles V, just previous to the anchorage retirement of that monarch from the throne. This splenetic disrelish of his place was evinced in almost every function pertaining to it. Proud as he was, moody, he condescended to no personal mandate. Whatever special orders were necessary, their delivery was delegated to his body-servant, who in turn transferred them to their ultimate destination through runners, alert Spanish boys or slave boys, like pages or pilot fish within easy call, continually hovering round Don Benito. So that to have beheld this undemonstrative invalid gliding about, apathetic and mute, no landsman could have dreamed that in him was lodged a dictatorship beyond which, while at sea, there was no earthly appeal. Thus the Spaniard, regarded in his reserve, seemed the involuntary victim of mental disorder. But in fact his reserve might in some degree have proceeded from design. If so, then here was evinced the unhealthy climax of that icy, though conscientious, policy, more or less adopted by all commanders of large ships, which, except in signal emergencies, obliterates alike the manifestation of sway with every trace of sociality, transforming the man into a block, or rather into a loaded cannon, which until there is call for thunder has nothing to say. Viewing him in this light, it seemed but a natural token of the perverse habit induced by a long course of such hard self-restraint that, notwithstanding the present condition of his ship, the Spaniard should still persist in a demeanor which, however harmless, or, it may be, appropriate, in a well-appointed vessel, such as the San Dominique, might have been at the outset of the voyage, was anything but judicious now. But the Spaniard, perhaps, thought that it was with captains as with gods. Reserve, under all events, must still be their cue but probably this appearance of slumbering dominion might have been but an attempted disguise to conscious imbecility 
not deep policy, but shallow device. But be all this as it might, whether Don Benito's manner was designed or not, the more Captain Delano noted its pervading reserve, the less he felt uneasiness at any particular manifestation of that reserve towards himself. Neither were his thoughts taken up by the captain alone, wanted to the quiet orderliness of the sealer's comfortable family of a crew, the noisy confusion of the San Dominic's suffering host repeatedly challenged his eye. Some prominent breaches, not only of discipline but of decency, were observed. These Captain Delano could not but describe in the main to the absence of those subordinate deck officers to whom, along with higher duties, is entrusted what may be styled the police department of a populous ship. True, the old oakum pickers appeared at times to act the part of monitorial constables to their countrymen, the blacks, but though occasionally succeeding in allaying trifling outbreaks now and then between man and man, they could do little or nothing toward establishing general quiet. The San Dominique was in the condition of a transatlantic emigrant ship among whose multitude of living freight are some individuals, doubtless, as little troublesome as crates and bales, but the friendly remonstrances of such with their ruder companions are of not so much avail as the unfriendly arm of the mate. What the San Dominique wanted was what the emigrant ship has, stern superior officers, but on these decks not so much as a fourth mate was to be seen. The visitor's curiosity was roused to learn the particulars of those mishaps which had brought about such absenteeism with its consequences, because though deriving some inkling of the voyage from the wails which at the first moment had greeted him, yet of the details no clear understanding had been had. The best account would, doubtless, be given by the captain. Yet, at first, the visitor was loath to ask it, unwilling to provoke some distant rebuff. But, plucking up courage, he at last accosted Don Benito, renewing the expression of his benevolent interest, adding that did he, Captain Delano, but know the particulars of the ship's misfortunes, he would perhaps be better able in the end to relieve them. Would Don Benito favor him with the whole story? Don Benito faltered. Then, like some somnambulist suddenly interfered with, vacantly stared at his visitor, and ended by looking down on the deck. He maintained this posture so long that Captain Delano, almost equally disconcerted and involuntarily almost as rude, turned suddenly from him, walking forward to accost one of the Spanish seamen for the desired information. But he had hardly gone five paces when, with a sort of eagerness, Don Benito invited him back regretting his momentary absence of mind, and professing readiness to gratify him. While most part of the story was being given, the two captains stood on the after part of the main deck, a privileged spot, no one being near but the servant. "'It is now a hundred and ninety days,' began the Spaniard, in his husky whisper, "'that this ship, well officered and well manned, with several cabin passengers, some fifty Spaniards in all, sailed from Buenos Aires, bound to Lima, with a general cargo, hardware, Paraguay tea and the like, and, pointing forward, that parcel of negroes, now not more than a hundred and fifty, as you see, but then numbering over three hundred souls. Off Cape Horn we had heavy gales. In one moment, by night, three of my best officers with fifteen sailors were lost, with the main yard, the spars snapping under them in the slings, as they sought with heavers to beat down the icy sail. To lighten the hull, the heavier sacks of mata were thrown into the sea, with most of the water-pipes lashed on deck at the time, and this last necessity it was, combined with the prolonged detections afterwards experienced, which eventually brought about our chief causes of suffering, when here there was a sudden fainting attack of his cough, brought on no doubt by his mental distress, 
His servant sustained him, and, drawing a cordial from his pocket, placed it to his lips. He, a little, revived, but unwilling to leave him unsupported while yet imperfectly restored, the black, with one arm still encircled his master, at the same time keeping his eye fixed on his face, as if to watch for the first sign of complete restoration, or relapse, as the event might prove. The Spaniard proceeded, but brokenly and obscurely as one in a dream. Oh, my God! Rather than pass through what I have, with joy I would have hailed the most terrible gales. But— His cough returned, and with increased violence. This subsiding, with reddened lips and closed eyes, he fell heavily against his supporter. His mind wanders. He was thinking of the plague that followed the gales, plaintively sighed the servant. My poor, poor master, wringing one hand and with the other wiping the mouth. But uh, be patient, senor, again turning to Captain Delano. These fits do not last long. Master will soon be himself. Don Benito, reviving, went on, but as this portion of the story was very brokenly delivered, the substance only will here be set down. It appeared that after the ship had been many days tossed in storms off the Cape, the scurvy broke out, carrying off numbers of the whites and blacks. When at last they had worked round into the Pacific, their spars and sails were so damaged and so inadequately handled by the surviving mariners, most of whom were become invalids, that unable to lay her northerly course by the wind, which was powerful, the unmanageable ship, for successive days and nights, was blown northwestward, where the breeze suddenly deserted her, in unknown waters, to sultry calms. The absence of the water-pipes now proved as fatal to life as before their presence had menaced it, induced, or at least aggravated by the more than scanty allowance of water, a malignant fever followed the scurvy, with the excessive heat of the lengthened calm making such short work of it as to sweep away, as by billows, whole families of the Africans, and yet a larger number, proportionately, of the Spaniards, including, by a luckless fatality, every remaining officer on board. Consequently, in the smart west winds eventually following the calm, the already rent sails, having to be simply dropped, not furled at need, had been gradually reduced to the beggar's rags they were now. To procure substitutes for his lost sailors, as well as supplies of water and sails, the captain at the earliest opportunity had made for Baltivia, the southernmost civilized port of Chile and South America. But upon nearing the coast, the thick weather had prevented him from so much as sighting that harbor, since which period, almost without a crew, and almost without canvas, and almost without water, and at intervals giving its added dead to the sea, the San Dominic had been battledored about by contrary winds, inveigled by currents, or grown weedy in calms. Like a man lost in woods, more than once, she had doubled upon her own track. But throughout these calamities, huskily continued Don Benito, painfully returning in the half-embrace of his servant, I have to thank those negroes, you see, who, though to your inexperienced eyes appearing unruly, have indeed conducted themselves with less of restlessness than even their owner could have thought possible under such circumstances. Here again he fell faintly back. Again his mind wandered, but he rallied, and less obscurely proceeded. Yes, their owner was quite right in assuring me that no fetters would be needed with his blacks, so that while, as is wont in this transportation, those negroes have always remained upon deck, not thrust below as in the guinea men, they have also from the beginning been freely permitted to range within given bounds at their pleasure. Once more the faintness returned, his mind roved, but, recovering, he resumed. 
but it is babo here to whom under god i owe not only my own preservation but likewise to him chiefly the merit is due of pacifying his more ignorant brethren when at intervals tempted to murmurings ah master sighed the black bowing his face don't speak of me babo is nothing what babo has done was but duty faithful fellow cried captain delano don benito i envy you such a friend slave i cannot call him as master and man stood before him the black upholding the white captain delano could not but bethink him of the beauty of that relationship which could present such a spectacle of fidelity on the one hand and confidence on the other the scene was heightened by the contrast in dress denoting their relative positions the spaniard wore a loose chilly jacket of dark velvet white smallcloths and stockings with silver buckles at the knee and instep a high-crowned sombrero of fine grass a slender sword silver mounted hung from a knot in his sash the last being an almost invariable adjunct more for utility than ornament of a south american gentleman's dress to this hour excepting when his occasional nervous contortions brought about disarray there was a certain precision in his attire curiously at variance with the unsightly disorder around especially in the belittered ghetto forward of the main mast wholly occupied by the blacks the servant wore nothing but wide trousers apparently from their coarseness and patches made out of some old topsail they were clean and confined at the waist by a bit of unstranded rope which with his composed deprecatory air at times made him look something like a begging friar of st francis however unsuitable for the time and place at least in the blunt thinking of americans eyes and however strangely surviving in the midst of all his afflictions the toilette of don benito might not in fashion at least have gone beyond the style of the day among south americans of his class though on the present voyage sailing from buenos aires he had avowed himself a native and resident of chile whose inhabitants had not so generally adopted the plain coat and once plebeian pantaloons but with a becoming modification adhered to their provincial costume picturesque as any in the world still relatively to the pale history of the voyage and his own pale face there seemed something so incongruous in the spaniard's apparel as almost to suggest the image of an invalid courtier tottering about london streets in the time of the plague the portion of the narrative which perhaps most excited interest as well as some surprise considering the latitudes in question was the long calm spoken of and more particularly the ships so long drifting about without communicating the opinion of course the american could not but impute at least part of the detentions both to clumsy seamanship and faulty navigation eyeing don benito's small yellow hands he easily inferred that the young captain had not got into command at the hawse hole but the cabin window and if so why wonder at incompetence in youth sickness and gentility united but drowning criticism in compassion after a fresh repetition of his sympathies captain delano having heard out his story not only engaged as in the first place to see don benito and his people supplied in their immediate bodily needs but also now farther promised to assist him in procuring a large permanent supply of water as well as some sails and rigging and though it would involve no small embarrassment to himself yet he would spare three of his best seamen for temporary deck officers so that without delay the ship might proceed to concepcion there fully to refit for lima her destined port such generosity was not without its effect even upon the invalid his face lighted up eager and hectic he met the honest glance of his visitor with gratitude he seemed overcome this excitement is bad for master whispered the servant taking his arm and with soothing words gently drawing him aside 
when don benito returned the american was pained to observe that his hopefulness like the sudden kindling in his cheek was but febrile and transient ere long with a joyless mien looking up towards the poop the host invited his guests to accompany him there for the benefit of what little breath of wind might be stirring as during the telling of the story Captain Delano had once or twice started at the occasional symboling of the hatchet-polishers, wondering why such an interruption should be allowed, especially in that part of the ship, and in the ears of an invalid, and moreover as the hatchets had anything but an attractive look, and the handlers of them still less so, it was, therefore, to tell the truth, not without some lurking reluctance or even shrinking, it may be, Captain Delano, with apparent complacence, acquiesced in his host's invitation. The more so, since, with an untimely caprice of punctilio, rendered distressing by his cadaverous aspect, Don Benito, with Castilian bows, solemnly insisted upon his guests preceding him up the ladder leading to the elevation, where, one on each side of the last step, sat for armorial supporters and sentries two of the ominous file. Gingerly enough stepped good Captain Delano between them, and in the instant of leaving them behind, like one running the gauntlet, he felt an apprehensive twitch in the calves of his legs. But when facing about he saw the whole file, like so many organ-grinders, still stupidly intent on their work, unmindful of everything beside, he could not but smile at his late fidgety panic. Presently, while standing with his host, looking forward upon the decks below, he was struck by one of those instances of insubordination previously alluded to. Three black boys, with two Spanish boys, were sitting together on the hatches, scraping a rude wooden platter in which some scanty mess had recently been cooked. Suddenly one of the black boys, enraged at a word dropped by one of his white companions, seized a knife, and, though called to forbear by one of the oakum pickers, struck the lad over the head, inflicting a gash from which blood flowed. In amazement Captain Delano inquired what this meant, to which the pale Don Benito dully muttered that it was merely the sport of the lad. "'Pretty serious sport, truly,' rejoined Captain Delano. Had such a thing happened on board the bachelor's delight, instant punishment would have followed. At these words the Spaniard turned upon the American one of his sudden, staring, half-lunatic looks. Then, relapsing into his torpor, answered, Doubtless, doubtless, senor. Is it, thought Captain Delano, that this hapless man is one of those paper captains I've known, who by policy wink at what by power they cannot put down? I know no sadder sight than a commander who has little of command but the name. I should think, Don Benito, he now said, glancing towards the oakum picker who had sought to interfere with the boys, that you would find it advantageous to keep all your blacks employed, especially the younger ones, no matter at what useless task, and no matter what happens to the ship. Why, even with my little band I find such a course indispensable. I once kept a crew on my quarter-deck thrumming mats for my cabin, when for three days I had given up my ship, mats, men and all, for a speedy loss, owing to the violence of a gale, in which we could do nothing but helplessly drive before it. Doubtless, doubtless, muttered Don Benito. But, continued Captain Delano, again glancing upon the oakum pickers and then at the hatchet polishers nearby, I see you keep some, at least, of your host employed. Yes, was again the vacant response. Those old men there, shaking their pows from their pulpits, continued Captain Delano, pointing to the oakum pickers, seem to act the part of old dominies to the rest little heeded as their admonitions are at times. Is this voluntary on their part, Don Benito, or have you appointed them shepherds to your flock of black sheep? What posts they fill, I appointed them, rejoined the Spaniard, in an acrid tone, as if resenting some supposed satiric reflection. And these others, these Ashanti conjurers here, 
continued Captain Delano, rather uneasily eyeing the brandished steel of the hatchet-polishers, where, in spots, it had been brought to a shine. This seems a curious business they are at, Don Benito. In the gales we met, answered the Spaniard, what of our general cargo was not thrown overboard was much damaged by the brine. Since coming into calm weather, I have had several cases of knives and hatchets daily brought up for overhauling and cleaning. A prudent idea, Don Benito. You are part owner of ship and cargo, I presume, but none of the slaves, perhaps? I am owner of all you see, impatiently returned Don Benito, except the main company of blacks, who belong to my late friend Alexandro Aranda. As he mentioned this name, his air was heartbroken, his knees shook, his servant supported him. Thinking he divined the cause of such unusual emotion, to confirm his surmise, Captain Delano, after a pause, said, And may I ask, Don Benito, whether, since a while ago you spoke of some cabin passengers, the friend whose loss so afflicts you, at the outset of the voyage accompanied his blacks? Yes but died of the fever? Died of the fever. Oh, could I but... Again quivering, the Spaniard paused. Pardon me, said Captain Delano slowly, but I think that, by a sympathetic experience, I conjecture, Don Benito, what it is that gives the keener edge to your grief. It was once my hard fortune to lose at sea a dear friend, my own brother, then supercargo. Assured of the welfare of his spirit, its departure I could have borne like a man, but that honest eye, that honest hand, both of which had so often met mine, and that warm heart, all, all, like scraps to the dogs, to throw all to the sharks. It was then I vowed never to have for fellow voyager a man I loved, unless, unbeknown to him, I had provided every requisite, in case of a fatality, for embalming his mortal part for internment on shore. Were your friend's remains now on board this ship, Don Benito, not thus strangely would the mention of his name affect you. On board this ship, echoed the Spaniard. Then with horrified gestures as directed against some spectre, he unconsciously fell into the ready arms of his attendant who, with a silent appeal toward Captain Delano, seemed beseeching him not again to broach a theme so unspeakably distressing to his master. This poor fellow now, thought the pained American, is the victim of that sad superstition which associates goblins with the deserted body of man as ghosts with an abandoned house. How unlike are we made! what to me, in like case, would have been a solemn satisfaction, the bare suggestion even terrifies the Spaniard into this trance. Poor Alejandro Aranda, what would you say could you hear, see, your friend, who on former voyages, when you for months were left behind, has, I dare say, often longed and longed for one peep at you, now transported with terror at the least thought of having you anyway nigh him. At this moment, with a dreary graveyard toll betokening a flaw, the ship's forecastle bell, smote by one of the grizzled oakum pickers, proclaimed ten o'clock through the leaden calm, when Captain Delano's attention was caught by the moving figure of a gigantic black emerging from the general crowd below and slowly advancing towards the elevated poop. An iron collar was about his neck, from which depended a chain thrice wound round his body, the terminating links padlocked together at a broad band of iron his girdle. "'How like a mute Ataful moves!' murmured the servant. The black mounted the steps of the poop, and, like a brave prisoner brought up to receive sentence, stood in unquailing muteness before Don Benito, now recovered from his attack. At the first glimpse of his approach, Don Benito had started, a resentful shadow swept over his face, and, as with the sudden memory of bootless rage, 
his white lips glued together. This is some mulish mutineer, thought Captain Delano, surveying, not without a mixture of admiration, the colossal form of the negro. See, he waits your question, master, said the servant. Thus reminded, Don Benito, nervously averting his glance, as if shunning by anticipation some rebellious response, in a disconcerted voice, thus spoke. Atafa, will you ask my pardon now? The black was silent. Again, master, murmured the servant, with bitter upbraiding, eyeing his countryman. Again, master, he will bend to master yet. Answer, said Don Benito, still averting his glance. Say but the one word, pardon, and your chains shall be off. Upon this the black, slowly raising both arms, let them lifelessly fall, his links clanking, his head bowed, as much as to say, No, I am content. Go, said Don Benito, with inkept and unknown emotion. Deliberately as he had come, the black obeyed. Excuse me, Don Benito, said Captain Delano, but this scene surprises me. What means it, pray? It means that that negro alone of all the band has given me peculiar cause of offense. I have put him in chains. I... Here he paused, his hand to his head, as if there were a swimming there, or a sudden bewilderment of memory had come over him. But meeting his servant's kindly glance seemed reassured and proceeded. I could not scourge such a form, but I told him he must ask my pardon, as yet he has not. At my command every two hours he stands before me. And how long has this been? Some sixty days. And obedient in all else, and respectful? Yes. Upon my conscience, then, exclaimed Captain Delano impulsively, he has a royal spirit in him, this fellow. He may have some right to it bitterly returned Don Benito. He says he was a king in his own land. Yes, said the servant, entering a word, those slits in Atafu's ears once held wedges of gold, but poor Babo here in his own land was only a poor slave. A black man's slave was Babo, who now is the white's. Somewhat annoyed by these conversational familiarities, Captain Delano turned curiously upon the attendant, then glanced inquiringly at his master, but as if long wanted to these little informalities, neither master nor man seemed to understand him. What, pray, was Atafu's offense, Don Benito? asked Captain Delano. If it was not something very serious, take a fool's advice, and in view of his general docility, as well as in some natural respect for his spirit, remit him his penalty. No, no, master, never will do that, here murmured the servant to himself. Proud Atafu must first ask master's pardon. The slave there carries the padlock, but master here carries the key. His attention thus directed, Captain Delano now noticed for the first that Suspended by a slender silken cord from Don Benito's neck hung a key. At once from the servant's muttered syllables divining the key's purpose he smiled and said, So, Don Benito, padlock and key, significant symbols truly. Biting his lip, Don Benito faltered. Though the remark of Captain Delano, a man of such native simplicity as to be incapable of satire or irony, had been dropped in playful allusion to the Spaniard's singularly evidenced lordship over the black, yet the hypochondriac seemed some way to have taken it as a malicious reflection upon his confessed inability thus far to break down, at least on a verbal summons, the entrenched will of the slave. Deploring this supposed misconception, yet despairing of correcting it, Captain Delano shifted the subject but finding his companion more than ever withdrawn, as if still sourly digesting the lees of the presumed affront above mentioned, by and by Captain Delano likewise became less talkative, oppressed, against his own will, 
by what seemed the secret vindictiveness of the morbidly sensitive Spaniard. But the good sailor, himself of a quite contrary disposition, refrained on his part, alike from the appearance as from the feeling of resentment, and if silent, was only so from contagion. Presently the Spaniard, assisted by his servant, somewhat discourteously crossed over from his guest, a procedure which, sensibly enough, might have been allowed to pass for idle caprice of ill-humor, had not master and man, lingering round the corner of the elevated skylight, began whispering together in low voices. This was unpleasing, and more, the moody air of the Spaniard, which at times had not been without a sort of valetudinarian stateliness, now seemed anything but dignified, while the menial familiarity of the servant lost its original charm of simple-hearted attachment. In his embarrassment the visitor turned his face to the other side of the ship. By so doing his glance accidentally fell on a young Spanish sailor, a coil of rope in his hand, just stepped from the deck to the first round of the mizzen-rigging. Perhaps the man would not have been particularly noticed were it not that, during his ascent to one of the yards, he, with a sort of covert intentness, kept his eye fixed on Captain Delano, from whom presently it passed, as if by a natural sequence, to the two whisperers. His own attention thus redirected to that quarter, Captain Delano gave a slight start. From something in Don Benito's manner just then, it seemed as if the visitor had, at least partly, been the subject of the withdrawn consultation going on, a conjecture as little agreeable to the guest as it was little flattering to the host. The singular alternations of courtesy and ill-breeding in the Spanish captain were unaccountable, except on one of two suppositions, innocent lunacy or wicked imposture. But the first idea, though it might naturally have occurred to an indifferent observer, and, in some respect, had not hitherto been wholly a stranger to Captain Delano's mind, yet now that, in an incipient way, he began to regard the stranger's conduct something in the light of an intentional affront. Of course the idea of lunacy was virtually vacated. But if not a lunatic, what then? Under the circumstances would a gentleman, nay, any honest boor, act the part now acted by his host? The man was an impostor, some low-born adventurer, masquerading as an oceanic grandee. Yet so ignorant of the first requisites of mere gentlemanhood as to be betrayed into the present remarkable indecorum. That strange ceremoniousness, too, at other times evinced, seemed not uncharacteristic of one playing a part above his real level. Benito Serrano, Don Benito Serrano, a sounding name, one too, at that period, not unknown in the surname to supercargoes and sea captains trading along the Spanish main, as belonging to one of the most enterprising and extensive mercantile families in all those provinces, several members of it having titles, a sort of Castilian Rothschild, with a noble brother or cousin in every great trading town of South America. The alleged Don Benito was in early manhood, about twenty-nine or thirty. To assume a sort of roving cadetship in the maritime affairs of such a house, what more likely scheme for a young knave of talent and spirit? But the Spaniard was a pale invalid. Never mind, for even to the degree of simulating mortal disease, the craft of some tricksters had been known to attain. To think that, under the aspect of infantile weakness, the most savage energies might be couched. Those velvets of the Spaniard, but the silky paw to his fangs. From no train of thought did these fancies come, not from within, but from without. Suddenly, too, and in one throng, like hoarfrost, yet as soon to vanish as the mild sun of Captain Delano's good nature regained its meridian. Glancing over once more towards his host, whose side-face revealed above the skylight was now turned toward him, 
he was struck by the profile whose clearness of cut was refined by the thinness incident to ill health as well as ennobled about the chin by the beard away with suspicion he was a true offshoot of a true hidalgo serrano relieved by these and other better thoughts the visitor lightly humming a tune now began indifferently pacing the poop so as not to betray to don benito that he had at all mistrusted incivility much less duplicity for such mistrust would yet be proved illusory and by the event though for the present the circumstance which had provoked that distrust remained unexplained but when that little mystery should have been cleared up captain delano thought he might extremely regret it did he allow don benito to become aware that he had indulged in ungenerous surmises in short to the spaniard's black-letter text it was best for a while to leave open margin end of section four chapter three a benito sereno part one benito sereno part two presently his pale face twitching and overcast the spaniard still supported by his attendant moved over towards his guest when with even more than his usual embarrassment and a strange sort of intriguing intonation in his husky whisper the following conversation began senor may i ask how long you have lain at this isle oh but a day or two don benito and from what port are you last canton and there senor you exchanged your sealskins for teas and silks i think you said yes silks mostly and the balance you took in specie perhaps captain delano fidgeting a little answered yes some silver not a very great deal though ah well may i ask how many men have you senor captain delano slightly started but answered about five-and-twenty all told and at present senor all on board i suppose all on board don benito replied the captain now with satisfaction and will be to-night senor at this last question following so many pertinacious ones for the soul of him captain delano could not but look very earnestly at the questioner who instead of meeting the glance with every token of craven discomposure dropped his eyes to the deck presenting an unworthy contrast to his servant who just then was kneeling at his feet adjusting a loose shoe-buckle his disengaged face meantime with humble curiosity turned openly up into his master's downcast one the spaniard still with a guilty shuffle repeated his question and and will be to-night senor yes for aught i know returned captain delano but nay rallying himself into fearless truth some of them talked of going off on another fishing party about midnight your ships generally go uh, go more or less armed i believe senor oh a six-pounder or two in case of emergency was the intrepidly indifferent reply with a small stock of muskets sealing spears and cutlasses you know as he thus responded captain delano again glanced at don benito but the latter's eyes were averted while abruptly and awkwardly shifting the subject he made some peevish allusion to the calm and then without apology once more with his attendant withdrew to the opposite bulwarks where the whispering was resumed at this moment and ere captain delano could cast a cool thought upon what had just passed the young spanish sailor before mentioned was seen descending from the rigging in act of stooping over to bring in board to the deck his voluminous unconfined frock or shirt of coarse woolen much spotted with tar opened out far down the chest revealing a soiled undergarment of what seemed the finest linen edged about the neck with a narrow blue ribbon sadly faded and worn at this moment the young sailor's eye was again fixed on the whisperers and captain delano thought he observed a lurking significance in it as if 
silent signs of some Freemason sort had at that instant been interchanged. This once more impelled his own glance in the direction of Don Benito, and, as before, he could not but infer that himself formed the subject of the conference. He paused. The sound of the hatchet polishing fell on his ears. He cast another swift side look at the two. They had the air of conspirators. In connection with the late questionings and the incident of the young sailor, these things now begat such return of involuntary suspicion that the singular guilelessness of the American could not endure it. Plucking up a gay and humorous expression, he crossed over to the two rapidly, saying, <laughs> Don Benito, your black here seems high in your trust, a sort of privy counselor, in fact. Upon this the servant looked up with a good-natured grin, but the master started, as from a venomous bite. It was a moment or two before the Spaniard sufficiently recovered himself to reply, which he did at last with cold constraint. Yes, senor, I have trust in Babo. Here Babo, changing his previous grin of mere animal humor into an intelligent smile, not ungratefully eyed his master. Finding that the Spaniard now stood silent and reserved, as if involuntarily or purposefully giving hint that his guest's proximity was inconvenient just then, Captain Delano, unwilling to appear uncivil even to incivility itself, made some trivial remark and moved off, again and again turning over in his mind the mysterious demeanor of Don Benito Serrano. He had descended from the poop, and, wrapped in thought, was passing near a dark hatchway leading down into the steerage, when, perceiving motion there, he looked to see what moved. The same instant there was a sparkle in the shadowy hatchway, and he saw one of the Spanish sailors prowling there, hurriedly placing his hand in the bosom of his frock, as if hiding something. Before the man could have been certain who it was that was passing, he slunk below out of sight. But enough was seen of him to make it sure that he was the same young sailor before noticed in the rigging. What was that which so sparkled, thought Captain Delano? It was no lamp, no match, no live coal. Could it have been a jewel? But how come sailors with jewels? Or with silk-trimmed undershirts, either? Has he been robbing the trunks of the dead cabin passengers? But if so, he would hardly wear one of the stolen articles on board ship here. Ah, ah! If, now, that was indeed a secret sign I saw passing between this suspicious fellow and his captain a while since, if I could only be certain that, in my uneasiness, my senses did not deceive me, then, here, passing from one suspicious thing to another, his mind revolved these strange questions put to him concerning his ship. By a curious coincidence, as each point was recalled, the black wizards of Ashanti would strike up with their hatchets, as in ominous comment on the white stranger's thoughts. Pressed by such enigmas and portents, it would have been almost against nature had not even into the least distrustful heart some ugly misgivings obtruded. Observing the ship, now helplessly fallen into a current with enchanted sails, drifting with increased rapidity seaward, and noting that from a lately intercepted projection of the land the sealer was hidden, the stout mariner began to quake at thoughts which he barely durst confess to himself. Above all, he began to feel a ghostly dread of Don Benito. And yet, when he roused himself, dilated his chest, felt himself strong on his legs, and coolly considered it, what did all these phantoms amount to? Had the Spaniard any sinister scheme, it must have reference not so much to him, Captain Delano, as to his ship, the Bachelor's Delight. Hence the present drifting away of the one ship from the other, instead of favoring any such possible scheme, was, for the time at least, opposed to it. Clearly any suspicion combining such contradictions must need be delusive. Beside, 
Was it not absurd to think of a vessel in distress, a vessel by sickness almost dismanned of her crew, a vessel whose inmates were parched for water? Was it not a thousand times absurd that such a craft should, at present, be of a piratical character, or her commander, either for himself or those under him, cherish any desire but for speedy relief and refreshment? But then might not general distress and thirst in particular be affected? And might not that same undiminished Spanish crew, alleged to have perished off to a remnant, be at that very moment lurking in the hold, on heart-broken pretense of entreating a cup of cold water, fiends in human form had got into lonely dwellings, nor retired until a dark deed had been done. And among the Malay pirates it was no unusual thing to lure ships after them into their treacherous harbors, or entice boarders from a declared enemy at sea by the spectacle of thinly manned or vacant decks beneath which prowled a hundred spears with yellow arms ready to upthrust them through the mats. Not that Captain Delano had entirely credited such things. He had heard of them, and now, as stories, they recurred. The present destination of the ship was the anchorage. There she would be near his own vessel. Upon gaining that vicinity, might not the San Dominique, like a slumbering volcano, suddenly let loose energies now hid? He recalled the Spaniard's manner while telling his story. There was a gloomy hesitancy and subterfuge about it. It was just the manner of one making up his tale for evil purposes as he goes. But if that story was not true, what was the truth? That the ship had unlawfully come into the Spaniard's possession? but in many of its details, especially in reference to the more calamitous parts, such as the fatalities among the seamen, the consequent prolonged beating about, the past sufferings from obstinate calms, and still continued suffering from thirst, in all these points, as well as others, Don Benito's story had corroborated not only the wailing ejaculations of the indiscriminate multitude, white and black, but likewise what seemed impossible to be counterfeit, by the very expression and play of every human feature which Captain Delano saw. If Don Benito's story was throughout an invention, then every soul on board, down to the youngest negress, was his carefully drilled recruit in the plot, an incredible inference. And yet, if there was ground for mistrusting his veracity, that inference was a legitimate one. But those questions of the Spaniard, there, indeed, one might pause. Did they not seem put with much the same object with which the burglar or assassin by daytime reconnoiters the walls of a house, but with ill purposes to solicit such information openly of the chief person endangered, and so, in effect, setting him on his guard, how unlikely a procedure was that? Absurd, then, to suppose that those questions had been prompted by evil designs. Thus the same conduct which, in this instance, had raised the alarm served to dispel it. In short, scarce any suspicion or uneasiness, however apparently reasonable at the time, which was not now, with equal apparent reason, dismissed. At last he began to laugh at his former forebodings, and laugh at the strange ship, for, in its aspect, some way siding with them, as it were, and laugh, too, at the odd-looking blacks, particularly those old scissors-grinders, the ashentis, and those bedridden old knitting-women, the oakum-pickers, and almost at the dark Spaniard himself, the central hobgoblin of all. For the rest, whatever in a serious way seemed enigmatical, was now good-naturedly explained away by the thought that, for the most part, the poor invalid scarcely knew what he was about, either sulking in black vapors or putting idle questions without sense or object. Evidently, for the present, the man was not fit to be entrusted with a ship. 
on some benevolent plea withdrawing the command from him, Captain Delano would yet have to send her to Conception in charge of his second mate, a worthy person and good navigator, a plan not more convenient for the San Dominic than for Don Benito, for, relieved from all anxiety, keeping wholly to his cabin, the sick man, under the good nursing of his servant, would probably by the end of the passage be in a measure restored to health, and with that he should also be restored to authority. Such were the Americans' thoughts. They were tranquilizing. There was a difference between the idea of Don Benito's darkly preordaining Captain Delano's fate and Captain Delano's lightly arranging Don Benito's. Nevertheless, it was not without something of relief that the good seaman presently perceived his whaleboat in the distance. Its absence had been prolonged by unexpected detention at the sealer's side, as well as its returning trip lengthened by the continual recession of the goal. The advancing speck was observed by the blacks. Their shouts attracted the attention of Don Benito, who, with a return of courtesy approaching Captain Delano, expressed satisfaction at the coming of some supplies, slight and temporary, as they must necessarily prove. Captain Delano responded, but while doing so his attention was drawn to something passing on the deck below. Among the crowd, climbing the landward bulwarks, anxiously watching the coming boat, two blacks, to all appearances accidentally incommoded by one of the sailors, violently pushed him aside which the sailor some way resenting, they dashed him to the deck, despite the earnest cries of the oakum pickers. Don Benito, said Captain Delano quickly, do you see what is going on there? Look. But seized by his cough, the Spaniard staggered with both hands to his face on the point of falling. Captain Delano would have supported him, but the servant was more alert, who, with one hand sustaining his master, with the other applied the cordial. Don Benito restored. The black withdrew his support, slipping aside a little, but dutifully remaining within call of a whisper. Such discretion was here evinced as quite wiped away in the visitor's eyes any blemish of impropriety which might have attached to the attendant from the indecorous conferences before mentioned, showing, too, that if the servant were to blame, it might be more the master's fault than his own, since, when left to himself, he could conduct thus well. His glance called away from the spectacle of disorder to the more pleasing one before him, Captain Delano could not avoid again congratulating his host upon possessing such a servant, who, though perhaps a little too forward now and then, must upon the whole be invaluable to one in the invalid situation. "'Tell me, Don Benito,' he added with a smile, "'I should like to have your man here myself. What will you take for him? Would uh, fifty doubloons be any object?' "'Master wouldn't part with Babel for a thousand doubloons,' murmured the black, overhearing the offer, and taking it in earnest, and with the strange vanity of a faithful slave, appreciated by his master, scorning to hear so paltry a valuation put upon him by a stranger. But Don Benito, apparently hardly yet completely restored, and again interrupted by his cough, made but some broken reply. Soon his physical distress became so great, affecting his mind too, apparently, that as if to screen the sad spectacle, the servant gently conducted his master below. Left to himself, the American, to while away the time till his boat should arrive, would have pleasantly accosted some one of the few Spanish seamen he saw. But recalling something that Don Benito had said touching their ill conduct, he refrained, as a shipmaster indisposed to countenance cowardice or unfaithfulness in seamen. While with these thoughts, standing with eye directed forward towards that handful of sailors, Suddenly he thought that one or two of them returned the glance, and with a sort of meaning. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, but again seemed to see the same thing. Under a new form, but more obscure than any previous one, the old suspicions recurred, but in the absence of Don Benito with less of panic than before. 
Despite the bad account given of the sailors, Captain Delano resolved forthwith to accost one of them. Descending the poop, he made his way through the blacks, his movement drawing a queer cry from the oakum pickers, prompted by whom the negroes, twitching each other aside, divided before him. But as if curious to see what was the object of this deliberate visit to their ghetto, closing in behind, in tolerable order, followed the white stranger up. His progress thus proclaimed as by mounted kings at arms, and escorted as by a Kafra guard of honor, Captain Delano, assuming a good-humored, off-handed air, continued to advance, now and then saying a blithe word to the negroes, and his eye curiously surveying the white faces, here and there sparsely mixed in with the blacks, like stray white pawns, venturously involved in the ranks of the chessmen opposed. While thinking which of them to select for his purpose, he chanced to observe a sailor seated on the deck engaged in tarring the strap of a large block. A circle of blacks squatted round him, inquisitively eyeing the process. The mean employment of the man was in contrast with something superior in his figure. His hand, black with continually thrusting it into the tar-pot held for him by a negro, seemed not naturally allied to his face, a face which would have been a very fine one but for its haggardness. Whether this haggardness had aught to do with criminality could not be determined, since as intense heat and cold, though unlike, produce like sensations, so innocence and guilt, when through casual association with mental pain, stamping any visible impress, use one seal, a hacked one. Not again that this reflection occurred to Captain Delano at the time, charitable man as he was, rather another idea. Because observing so singular a haggardness combined with a dark eye, averted as in trouble and shame, and then again recalling Don Benito's confessed ill opinion of his crew, insensibly he was operated upon by certain general notions which, while disconnecting pain and abashment from virtue, invariably link them with vice. If, indeed, there be any wickedness on board this ship, thought Captain Delano, be sure that man there has fouled his hand in it, even as now he fouls it in the pitch. I don't like to accost him. I will speak to this other, this old Jack here on the windlass. He advanced to an old Barcelona tar, in ragged red breeches and dirty nightcap, cheeks trenched and bronzed, whiskers dense as thorn hedges. Seated between two sleepy-looking Africans, this mariner, like his younger shipmate, was employed upon some rigging, splicing a cable, the sleepy-looking blacks performing the inferior function of holding the outer parts of the rope for him. Upon Captain Delano's approach, the man at once hung his head below its previous level, the one necessary for business. It appeared as if he desired to be thought absorbed, with more than common fidelity, in his task. Being addressed, he glanced up, but with what seemed a furtive, diffident air, which sat strangely enough on his weather-beaten visage, much as if a grizzly bear, instead of growling and biting, should simper and cast sheep's eyes. He was asked several questions concerning the voyage, questions purposely referring to several particulars in Don Benito's narrative, not previously corroborated by those impulsive cries greeting the visitor on first coming on board. The questions were briefly answered, confirming all that remained to be confirmed of the story. The negroes about the windlass joined in with the old sailor, but as they became talkative, he by degrees became mute, and at length quite glum, seemed morosely unwilling to answer more questions, and yet, all the while, this ursine air was somehow mixed with his sheepish one. Despairing of getting into unembarrassed talk with such a centaur, Captain Delano, after glancing round for a more promising countenance, but seeing none, spoke pleasantly to the blacks to make way for him and so, amid various grins and grimaces, returned to the poop, 
feeling a little strange at first, he could hardly tell why, but upon the whole with regained confidence in Benito Sereno. How plainly, thought he, did that old whiskerando yonder betray a consciousness of ill desert. No doubt when he saw me coming he dreaded lest I, apprised by his captain of the crew's general misbehavior, came with sharp words for him, and so down with his head. And yet, and yet, now that I think of it, that very old fellow, if I err not, was one of those who seemed so earnestly eyeing me here a while since. Ah, these currents spin one's head round almost as much as they do the ship. Ha! There now's a pleasant sort of sunny sight, quite sociable, too. His attention had been drawn to a slumbering negress, partly disclosed through the lacework of some rigging, lying, with youthful limbs carelessly disposed, under the lee of the bulwarks, like a doe in the shade of a woodland rock. Sprawling at her lapped breasts was her wide-awake fawn, stark naked, its black little body half lifted from the deck, crosswise with its dams, its hands, like two paws, clambering upon her, its mouth and nose ineffectually rooting to get at the mark, and meantime giving a vexatious half-grunt, blending with the composed snore of the negress. The uncommon vigor of the child at length roused the mother. She started up at a distance facing Captain Delano, but as if not at all concerned at the attitude in which she had been caught, delightedly she caught the child up with maternal transports, covering it with kisses. There's naked nature now, pure tenderness and love, thought Captain Delano, well pleased. This incident prompted him to remark the other negresses more particularly than before. He was gratified with their manners. Like most uncivilized women, they seemed at once tender of heart and tough of constitution, equally ready to die for their infants or fight for them, unsophisticated as leopardesses, loving as doves. Ah, thought Captain Delano, these, perhaps, are some of the very women whom Ledyard saw in Africa and gave such a noble account of. These natural sights somehow insensibly deepened his confidence and ease. At last he looked to see how his boat was getting on, but it was still pretty remote. He turned to see if Don Benito had returned, but he had not. To change the scene, as well as to please himself with a leisurely observation of the coming boat, stepping over into the mizzen chains, he clambered his way into the starboard quarter-gallery, one of those abandoned Venetian-looking water-balconies previously mentioned, retreats cut off from the deck. As his foot pressed the half-damp, half-dry sea-mosses matting the place, and a chance phantom cat's paw, an islet of breeze, unheralded, unfollowed, as this ghostly cat's paw came fanning his cheek. As his glance fell upon the row of small round deadlights, all closed like coppered eyes of the coffined, and the state cabin door, once connecting with the gallery, even as the deadlights had once looked out upon it, but now caulked fast like a sarcophagus lid, and to a purple-black tarred-over panel, threshold, and post, and he bethought him of the time when that state cabin and this state balcony had heard the voices of the Spanish king's officers, and the forms of the Lima viceroy's daughters had perhaps leaned where he stood, as these and other images flitted through his mind, as the cat's paw through the calm, gradually he felt rising a dreamy inquietude like that of one who alone on the prairie feels unrest from the repose of the noon. He leaned against the carved balustrade, again looking off toward his boat, but found his eye falling upon the ribbon grass, trailing along the ship's waterline, straight as a border of green box, and parterres of seaweed, broad ovals and crescents floating nigh and far, with what seemed long formal alleys between, crossing the terraces of swells, and sweeping round as if leading to the grottoes below. 
and overhanging all was the balustrade by his arm, which, partly stained with pitch and partly embossed with moss, seemed the charred ruin of some summer-house in a grand garden long running to waste. Trying to break one charm, he was but becharmed anew, though upon the wide sea he seemed in some far inland country, prisoner in some deserted chateau, left to stare at empty grounds and peer out at vague roads where never wagon or wayfarer passed. But these enchantments were a little disenchanted as his eye fell on the corroded main-chains, of an ancient style, massy and rusty in link, shackle and bolt, they seemed even more fit for the ship's present business than the one for which she had been built. Presently he thought something moved nigh the chains. He rubbed his eyes and looked hard. Groves of rigging were about the chains, and there, peering from behind a great stay like an Indian from behind a hemlock, a Spanish sailor, a marlin spike in his hand, was seen, who made what seemed an imperfect gesture towards the balcony, but immediately, as if alarmed by some advancing step along the deck within, vanished into the recesses of the hempen forest, like a poacher. What meant this? Something the man had sought to communicate unbeknown to any one, even to his captain. Did the secret involve aught unfavorable to his captain? Were those previous misgivings of Captain Delano's about to be verified? Or, in his haunted mood at the moment, had some random unintentional motion of the man, while busy with the stay, as if repairing it, been mistaken for a significant beckoning? Not unbewildered, again he gazed off for his boat, but it was temporarily hidden by a rocky spur of the isle. As with some eagerness he bent forward watching for the first shooting view of its beak, the balustrade gave way before him like charcoal. Had he not clutched an outreaching rope, he would have fallen into the sea. The crash, though feeble, and the fall, though hollow, of the rotten fragments must have been overheard. He glanced up. With sober curiosity peering down upon him was one of the old oakum pickers, slipped from his perch to an outside boom, while below the old negro, and invisible to him reconnoitering from a porthole like a fox from the mouth of its den, crouched the Spanish sailor again. From something suddenly suggested by the man's air, the mad idea now darted into Captain Delano's mind, that Don Benito's plea of indisposition, in withdrawing below, was but a pretense, that he was engaged there maturing his plot, of which the sailor, by some means gaining an inkling, had a mind to warn the stranger against incited, it may be, by gratitude for a kind word on first boarding the ship. Was it from foreseeing some possible interference like this that Don Benito had beforehand given such a bad character of his sailors, while praising the negroes, though indeed the former seemed as docile as the latter the contrary? The whites, too, by nature, were the shrewder race. A man with some evil design would he not be likely to speak well of that stupidity which was blind to his depravity, and malign that intelligence from which it might not be hidden? Not unlikely, perhaps. But if the whites had dark secrets concerning Don Benito, could then Don Benito be any way in complicity with the blacks? But they were too stupid. Besides, who ever heard of a white so far a renegade as to apostatize from his very species almost by leaguing in against it with negroes? These difficulties recalled former ones. Lost in their mazes, Captain Delano, who had now regained the deck, was uneasily advancing along it when he observed a new face, an aged sailor, seated cross-legged near the main hatchway. His skin was shrunk up with wrinkles like a pelican's empty pouch, his hair frosted, his countenance grave and composed. His hands were full of ropes, which he was working into a large knot. Some blacks were about him, obligingly dipping the strands for him here and there as the exigencies of the operation demanded. 
Captain Delano crossed over to him and stood in silence surveying the knot, his mind, by a not uncongenial transition, passing from its own entanglements to those of the hemp. For intricacy such a knot he had never seen in an American ship, nor indeed any other. The old man looked like an Egyptian priest, making Gordian knots for the temple of Ammon. The knot seemed a combination of double bowline knot, treble crown knot, backhanded well knot, knot in and out knot, and jamming knot. At last, puzzled to comprehend the meaning of such a knot, Captain Delano addressed the knotter. "'What are you knotting there, my man?' "'The knot,' was the brief reply, without looking up. "'So it seems, but what is it for?' "'For someone else to undo,' muttered back the old man, plying his fingers harder than ever, the knot being now nearly completed. While Captain Delano stood watching him, suddenly the old man threw the knot toward him, saying in unbroken English, the first heard in the ship, something to this effect, "'Undo it! Cut it! Quick!' It was said lowly, but with such condensation of rapidity that the long, slow words in Spanish which had preceded and followed almost operated as covers to the brief English between. For a moment not in hand, and not in head, Captain Delano stood mute, while without further heeding him the old man was now intent upon other ropes. Presently there was a slight stir behind Captain Delano. Turning, he saw the chained negro, Atafal, standing quietly there. The next moment the old sailor rose, muttering, and followed by his subordinate negroes, removed to the forward part of the ship, where in the crowd he disappeared. An elderly negro in a clout like an infant's, and with a pepper-and-salt head, and a kind of attorney air, now approached Captain Delano. In tolerable Spanish, and with a good-natured knowing wink, he informed him that the old knotter was simple-witted, but harmless, often playing his odd tricks. The negro concluded by begging the knot, for, of course, the stranger would not care to be troubled with it. Unconsciously it was handed to him. With a sort of congé the negro received it, and, turning his back, ferreted into it like a detective custom-house officer after smuggled laces. Soon, with some African word equivalent to pshaw, he tossed the knot overboard. All this is very queer now, thought Captain Delano, with a qualmish sort of emotion. But as one feeling incipient seasickness, he strove, by ignoring the symptoms, to get rid of the malady. Once more he looked off for his boat. To his delight it was now again in view, leaving the rocky spur astern. The sensation here experienced, after at first relieving his uneasiness, with unforeseen efficacy soon began to remove it. The less distant sight of that well-known boat, showing it, not as before, half blended with the haze, but with outline defined, so that its individuality, like a man's, was manifest, that boat, Rover by name, which, though now in strange seas, had often pressed the beach of Captain Delano's home, and brought to its threshold for repairs, had familiarly lain there as a Newfoundland dog. The sight of that household boat evoked a thousand trustful associations, which, contrasted with previous suspicions, filled him not only with lightsome confidence, but somehow with half-humorous self-reproaches at his former lack of it. What, I, Amasa Delano, Jack of the Beach, as they called me when a lad, I, Amasa, the same that, duck satchel in hand, used to paddle along the water-side to the schoolhouse, made from the old hulk, I, little Jack of the Beach, that used to go burying with cousin Nat and the rest, I, to be murdered here at the ends of the earth on board a haunted pirate ship by a horrible Spaniard? Too nonsensical to think of. Who would murder Amasa Delano? His conscience is clean. There is someone above. Fie, 
fie jack of the beach you are a child indeed a child of the second childhood old boy you are beginning to dote and drool i'm afraid light of heart and foot he stepped aft and there was met by don benito's servant who with a pleasing expression responsive to his own present feelings informed him that his master had recovered from the effects of his coughing fit and had just ordered him to go present his compliments to his good guest don massa and say that he don benito would soon have the happiness to rejoin him there now do you mark that again thought captain delano walking the poop what a donkey i was this kind gentleman who here sends me his kind compliments he but ten minutes ago dark lantern in hand was dodging round some old grindstone in the hold sharpening a hatchet for me i thought well well these long calms have a morbid effect on the mind i've often heard though i never believed it before ha glancing towards the boat there's rover good dog a white bone in her mouth a pretty big bone though seems to me what yes she has fallen afoul of the bubbling tide rip there it sets her the other way too for the time patience it was now about noon though from the grayness of everything it seemed to be getting towards dusk the calm was confirmed in the far distance away from the influence of land the leaden ocean seemed laid out and leaded up its course finished soul gone defunct but the current from landward where the ship was increased silently sweeping her further and further towards the tranced waters beyond still from his knowledge of those latitudes cherishing hopes of a breeze and a fair and fresh one at any moment captain delano despite present prospects buoyantly counted upon bringing the san dominic safely to anchor ere night the distance swept over was nothing since with a good wind ten minutes sailing would retrace more than sixty minutes drifting meantime one moment turning to mark rover fighting the tide rip and the next to see don benito approaching he continued walking the poop gradually he felt a vexation arising from the delay of his boat this soon merged into uneasiness and at last his eye falling continually as from a stage box into the pit upon the strange crowd before and below him and by and by recognizing there the face now the composed to indifference of the spanish sailor who had seemed to beckon from the main chains something of his old trepidations returned ah thought he gravely enough this is like the ague because it went off it follows not that it won't come back though ashamed of the relapse he could not altogether subdue it and so exerting his good nature to the utmost insensibly he came to a compromise yes this is a strange craft a strange history too and strange folks on board but nothing more by way of keeping his mind out of mischief till the boat should arrive he tried to occupy it with turning over and over in a purely speculative sort of way some lesser peculiarities of the captain and crew among others four curious points recurred first the affair of the spanish lad assailed with a knife by the slave boy an act winked at by don benito second the tyranny in don benito's treatment of atafal the black as if a child should lead a bull of the nile by the ring in his nose third the trampling of the sailor by the two negroes a piece of insolence passed over without so much as a reprimand fourth the cringing submission to their master of all the ship's underlings mostly blacks as if by the least inadvertence they feared to draw down his despotic displeasure coupling these points they seemed somewhat contradictory but what then thought captain delano glancing towards his now nearing boat what then why don benito is a very capricious commander but he is not the first of the sort i have seen though it's true he rather exceeds any other but as a nation continued he in his reveries these spaniards are all an odd set 
the very word spaniard has a curious conspirator guy fawkish twang to it and yet i dare say spaniards in the main are as good folks as any in duxbury massachusetts ah good at last rover has come as with its welcome freight the boat touched the side the oakum pickers with venerable gestures sought to restrain the blacks who at the sight of three gurried water casks in its bottom and a pile of wilted pumpkins in its bow hung over the bulwarks in disorderly raptures don benito with his servant now appeared his coming perhaps hastened by hearing the noise of him captain delano sought permission to serve out the water so that all might share alike and none injure themselves by unfair excess but sensible and on don benito's account kind as this offer was it was received with what seemed impatience as if aware that he lacked energy as a commander don benito with the true jealousy of weakness resented as an affront any interference so at least captain delano inferred in another moment the casks were being hoisted in when some of the eager negroes accidentally jostled captain delano where he stood by the gangway so that unmindful of don benito yielding to the impulse of the moment with good-natured authority he bade the blacks stand back to enforce his words making use of a half mirthful half menacing gesture instantly the blacks paused just where they were each negro and negress suspended in his or her posture exactly as the word had found them for a few seconds continuing so while as between the responsive posts of a telegraph an unknown syllable ran from man to man among the perched oakum pickers while the visitor's attention was fixed by this scene suddenly the hatchet polishers half rose and a rapid cry came from don benito thinking that at the signal of the spaniard he was about to be massacred captain delano would have sprung for his boat but paused as the oakum pickers dropping down into the crowd with earnest exclamations forced every white and every negro back at the same moment with gestures friendly and familiar almost jocose bidding him in substance not be a fool simultaneously the hatchet polishers resumed their seats quietly as so many tailors and at once as if nothing had happened the work of hoisting in the casks was resumed whites and blacks singing at the tackle captain delano glanced towards don benito as he saw his meager form in the act of recovering itself from reclining in the servant's arms into which the agitated invalid had fallen he could not but marvel at the panic by which himself had been surprised on the darting supposition that such a commander who upon a legitimate occasion so trivial too as it now appeared could lose all self-command was with energetic iniquity going to bring about his murder the casks being on deck captain delano was handed a number of jars and cups by one of the steward's aides who in the name of his captain entreated him to do as he had proposed dole out the water he complied with republican impartiality as to this republican element which always seeks one level serving the oldest white no better than the youngest black excepting indeed poor don benito whose condition if not rank demanded an extra allowance to him in the first place captain delano presented a fair pitcher of the fluid but thirsting as he was for it the spaniard quaffed not a drop until after several grave bows and salutes a reciprocation of courtesies which the sight-loving africans hailed with clapping of hands two of the less wilted pumpkins being reserved for the cabin table the residue were minced up on the spot for the general regalement but the soft bread sugar and bottled cider captain delano would have given the whites alone and in chief don benito but the latter objected which disinterestedness not a little pleased the american and so mouthfuls all around were given alike to whites and blacks excepting one bottle of cider 
which Babo insisted upon setting aside for his master. Here it may be observed that, as on the first visit of the boat, the American had not permitted his men to board the ship, neither did he now, being unwilling to add to the confusion of the decks. Not uninfluenced by the peculiar good humor at present prevailing, and for the first time oblivious of any but benevolent thoughts, Captain Delano, who from recent indications counted upon a breeze within an hour or two at the furthest, dispatched the boat back to the sealer with orders for all the hands that could be spared immediately to set about rafting casks to the watering place and filling them. Likewise he bade word be carried to his chief officer that if, against present expectation, the ship was not brought to anchor by sunset, he need be under no concern, for as there was to be a full moon that night, he, Captain Delano, would remain on board ready to play the pilot come the wind soon or late. As the two captains stood together, observing the departing boat, the servant, as it happened, having just spied a spot on his master's velvet sleeve, and silently engaged rubbing it out, the American expressed his regrets that the San Dominic had no boats, none at least but the unseaworthy old hulk of the longboat, which, warped as a camel's skeleton in the desert, and almost as bleached, lay potwise inverted amidships, one side a little tipped, furnishing a subterraneous sort of den for family groups of the blacks, mostly women and small children, who, squatting on old mats below, or perched above in the dark dome, on the elevated seats, were descried, some distance within, like a social circle of bats, sheltering in some friendly cave, at intervals, ebon flights of naked boys and girls, three or four years old, darting in and out of the den's mouth. "'Had you three or four boats now, Don Benito?' said Captain Delano. "'I think that, by tugging at the oars, your negroes here might help along matters some. Did you sail from port without boats, Don Benito?' "'They were stove in the gales, senor.' "'That was bad.' Many men, too, you lost then. Boats and men. Those must have been hard gales, Don Benito. Past all speech, cringed the Spaniard. Tell me, Don Benito, continued his companion with increased interest, tell me, were these gales immediately off the pitch of Cape Horn? Cape Horn? Who spoke of Cape Horn? "'Yourself did when giving me an account of your voyage,' answered Captain Delano, with almost equal astonishment at this eating of his own words, even as he never seemed eating his own heart on the part of the Spaniard. "'You yourself, Don Benito, spoke of Cape Horn,' he emphatically repeated. The Spaniard turned in a sort of stooping posture, pausing an instant, as one about to make a plunging exchange of elements as from air to water, at this moment a messenger boy, a white, hurried by, in the regular performance of his function carrying the last expired half-hour forward to the forecastle, from the cabin timepiece, to have it struck at the ship's large bell. "'Master,' said the servant, discontinuing his work on the coat-sleeve and addressing the rapt Spaniard with a sort of timid apprehensiveness, as one charged with a duty, the discharge of which it was foreseen would prove irksome to the very person who had imposed it, and for whose benefit it was intended, Master told me never mind where he was, or how engaged, always to remind him to a minute, when shaving time comes. Miguel has gone to strike the half-hour afternoon. It is now, Master. Will Master go into the cuddy? Ah, yes answered the Spaniard, starting, as from dreams into realities. Then, turning upon Captain Delano, he said that ere long he would resume the conversation. "'Then, if Master means to talk more to Don Amasa,' said the servant, "'why not let Don Amasa sit by the Master in the cuddy, and Master can talk and Don Amasa can listen, while Babo here lathers and strops?' "'Yes,' said Captain Delano, not unpleased with this sociable plan. Yes, Don Benito, unless you had rather not, I will go with you. B. 
be it so, senor. As the three passed aft, the American could not but think it another strange instance of his host's capriciousness, this being shaved with such uncommon punctuality in the middle of the day. But he deemed it more than likely that the servant's anxious fidelity had something to do with the matter, inasmuch as the timely interruption served to rally his master from the mood which had evidently been coming upon him. The place called the Cuddy was a light deck cabin formed by the poop, a sort of attic to the large cabin below. Part of it had formerly been the quarters of the officers, but since their death all the partitioning had been thrown down and the whole interior converted into one spacious and airy marine hall. For absence of fine furniture and picturesque disarray of odd appurtenances, somewhat answering to the wide, cluttered hall of some eccentric bachelor squire in the country who hangs his shooting-jacket and tobacco-pouch on deer-antlers and keeps his fishing-rod, tongs, and walking-stick in the same corner. The similitude was heightened, if not originally suggested, by glimpses of the surrounding sea, since in one aspect the country and the ocean seem cousins German. The floor of the cuddy was matted. Overhead four or five old muskets were stuck into horizontal holes along the beams. On one side was a claw-footed old table lashed to the deck, a thumbed missile on it, and over it a small, meager crucifix attached to the bulkhead. Under the table lay a dented cutlass or two, with a hacked harpoon among some melancholy old rigging, like a heap of poor friar's girdles. There were also two long, sharp-ribbed settees of malacca cane, black with age, and uncomfortable to look at as inquisitor's racks, with a large, misshapen armchair, which, furnished with a rude barber's crotch at the back, working with a screw, seemed some grotesque engine of torment. A flag-locker was in one corner, open, exposing various colored bunting, some rolled up, others half unrolled, still others tumbled. Opposite was a cumbrous washstand of black mahogany, all of one block, with a pedestal, like a font, and over it a railed shelf, containing combs, brushes, and other implements of the toilet. A torn hammock of stained grass swung near, the sheets tossed, and the pillow wrinkled up like a brow, as if whoever slept here slept but illy, with alternate visitations of sad thoughts and bad dreams. The furniture extremity of the cuddy, overhanging the ship's stern, was pierced with three openings, windows or portals, according as men or cannon might peer, socially or unsocially, out of them. At present neither men nor cannon were seen, though huge ring-bolts and other rusty iron fixtures of the woodwork hinted of twenty-four pounders. Glancing towards the hammock as he entered, Captain Delano said, "'You sleep here, Don Benito?' "'Yes, senor, since we got into mild weather. This seems a sort of dormitory, sitting-room, sail-loft, chapel, armory, and private closet altogether, Don Benito,' added Captain Delano, looking round. "'Yes, senor. Events have not been favorable to much order in my arrangements.' Here the servant, napkin on arm, made a motion as if waiting his master's good pleasure. Don Benito signified his readiness when seating him in the Malacca armchair, and for the guest's convenience drawing opposite one of the settees, the servant commenced operations by throwing back his master's collar and loosening his cravat. There is something in the negro which in a peculiar way fits him for avocations about one's person. Most negroes are natural valets and hairdressers, taking to the comb and brush congenially as to the castanets, and flourishing them apparently with almost equal satisfaction. There is, too, a smooth tact about them in this employment, with a marvelous, noiseless, gliding briskness, not ungraceful in its way, singularly pleasing to behold, and still more so to be the manipulated subject of. And above all is the great gift of good humor, 
Not the mere grin or laugh is here meant, those were unsuitable, but a certain easy cheerfulness, harmonious in every glance and gesture, as though God had set the whole negro to some pleasant tune. When to this is added the docility arising from the unaspiring contentment of a limited mind, and that susceptibility of blind attachment sometimes inhering in indisputable inferiors, one readily perceives why those hypochondriacs Johnson and Byron, it may be something like the hypochondriac Benito Serrano, took to their hearts, almost to the exclusion of the entire white race, their serving men, the negroes, Barber and Fletcher. But if there be that in the negro which exempts him from the inflicted sourness of the morbid or cynical mind, how in his most prepossessing aspects must he appear to a benevolent one? When at ease with respect to exterior things, Captain Delano's nature was not only benign, but familiarly and humorously so. At home he had often taken rare satisfaction in sitting in his door, watching some free man of color at his work or play. If on a voyage he chanced to have a black sailor, invariably he was on chatty and half-gamesome terms with him. In fact, like most men of a good, blithe heart, Captain Delano took to Negroes, not philanthropically, but genially, just as other men, to Newfoundland dogs. Hitherto the circumstances in which he found the San Dominique had repressed the tendency, but in the Cuddy, relieved from his former uneasiness, and for various reasons, more sociably inclined than at any previous period of the day, and, seeing the colored servant, napkin on arm, so debonair about his master, in a business so familiar as that of shaving, too, all his old weakness for negroes returned. Among other things, he was amused with an odd instance of the African love of bright colors and fine shows in the blacks informally taking from the flag locker a great piece of bunting of all hues and lavishly tucking it under his master's chin for an apron. The mode of shaving among the Spaniards is a little different from what it is with other nations. They have a basin, specifically called a barber's basin, which on one side is scooped out so as accurately to receive the chin, against which it is closely held in lathering, which is done not with a brush but with soap dipped in the water of the basin and rubbed on the face. In the present instance salt water was used for lack of better, and the parts lathered were only the upper lip and low down under the throat, all the rest being cultivated beard. The preliminaries being somewhat novel to Captain Delano, he sat curiously eyeing them, so that no conversation took place, nor, for the present, did Don Benito appear disposed to renew any. Setting down his basin, the negro searched among the razors as for the sharpest, and having found it, gave it an additional edge by expertly strapping it on the firm, smooth, oily skin of his open palm. He then made a gesture as if to begin, but midway stood suspended for an instant, one hand elevating the razor, the other professionally dabbling among the bubbling suds on the Spaniard's lank neck. Not unaffected by the close sight of the gleaming steel, Don Benito nervously shuddered. His usual ghastliness was heightened by the lather, which lather, again, was intensified in its hue by the contrasting sootiness of the negro's body. Altogether the scene was somewhat peculiar, at least to Captain Delano, nor, as he saw the two thus postured, could he resist the vagary that in the black he saw a headsman and in the white a man at the block. But this was one of those antic conceits, appearing and vanishing in a breath, from which perhaps the best regulated mind is not always free. Meantime the agitation of the Spaniard had a little loosened the bunting from around him, so that one broad fold swept curtain-like over the chair-arm to the floor, revealing amid a profusion of armorial bars and ground colors, black, blue, and yellow, a closed castle in a blood-red field diagonal with a lion rampant in a white. 
the castle and the lion exclaimed captain delano why don benito this is the flag of spain you use here it's well it's only i and not the king that sees this he added with a smile but turning towards the black it's all one i suppose so the colors be gay which playful remark did not fail somewhat to tickle the negro now master he said readjusting the flag and pressing the head gently further back into the crotch of the chair now master and the steel glanced nigh the throat again don benito faintly shuddered you must not shake so master see si, don amasa master always shakes when i shave him and yet master knows i never yet have drawn blood though it's true if master will shake so i may some of these times now master he continued and now don amasa please go on with your talk about the gale and all that master can hear and between times master can answer ah yes these gales said captain delano but the more i think of your voyage don benito the more i wonder not at the gales terrible as they must have been but at the disastrous interval following them for here by your account have you been these two months and more getting from cape horn to santa maria a distance which i myself with a good wind have sailed in a few days true you had calms and long ones but to be becalmed for two months that is at least unusual why don benito had almost any other gentleman told me such a story i should have been half disposed to a little incredulity End of section five. Benito Sereno. Benito Sereno, part three. Here an involuntary expression came over the Spaniard, similar to that just before on the deck, and whether it was the start he gave, or a sudden gawky roll of the hull in the calm, or a momentary unsteadiness of the servant's hand, however it was, just then the razor drew blood spots of which stained the creamy lather under the throat. Immediately the black barber drew back his steel, and, remaining in his professional attitude, back to Captain Delano, and face to Don Benito, held up the trickling razor, saying, with a sort of half-humorous sorrow, "'See, master, you shook so. Here's Babo's first blood.' no sword drawn before james i of england no assassination in that timid king's presence could have produced a more terrified aspect than was now presented by don benito poor fellow thought captain delano so nervous he can't even bear the sight of barber's blood and this unstrung sick man is it credible that i should have imagined he meant to spill all my blood who can't endure the sight of one little drop of his own surely amasa delano you have been beside yourself this day tell it not when you get home sappy amasa well well he looks like a murderer doesn't he more like as if himself were to be done for well well this day's experience shall be a good lesson meantime while these things were running through the honest seaman's mind the servant had taken the napkin from his arm and to don benito had said but answer don massa please master while i wipe this ugly stuff off the razor and strop it again as he said the words his face was turned half round so as to be alike visible to the spaniard and the american and seemed by its expression to hint that he was desirous by getting his master to go on with the conversation considerately to withdraw his attention from the recent annoying accident as if glad to snatch the offered relief, Don Benito resumed, rehearsing to Captain Delano that not only were the calms of unusual duration, but the ship had fallen in with obstinate currents, and other things he added, some of which were but repetitions of former statements, to explain how it came to pass that the passage from Cape Horn to Santa Maria had been so exceedingly long now and then mingling with his words incidental praises less qualified than before to the blacks for their general good conduct these particulars were not given consecutively the servant at convenient times using his razor 
and so, between the intervals of shaving, the story and panegyric went on with more than usual huskiness. To Captain Delano's imagination, now and again not wholly at rest, there was something so hollow in the Spaniard's manner, with apparently some reciprocal hollowness in the servant's dusky comment of silence, that the idea flashed across him that possibly master and man, for some unknown purpose, were acting out, both in word and deed, nay, to the very tremor of Don Benito's limbs, some juggling play before him. Neither did the suspicion of collusion lack apparent support from the fact of those whispered conferences before mentioned. But then what could be the object of enacting this play of the barber before him? At last, regarding the notion as a whimsy, insensibly suggested, perhaps, by the theatrical aspect of Don Benito in his Harlequin ensign, Captain Delano speedily banished it. The shaving over, the servant bestirred himself with a small bottle of scented waters, pouring a few drops on the head, and then diligently rubbing, the vehemence of the exercise causing the muscles of his face to twitch rather strangely. His next operation was with comb, scissors, and brush, going round and round, smoothing a curl here, clipping an unruly whisker hair there, giving a graceful sweep to the temple lock, with other impromptu touches evincing the hand of a master. While, like any resigned gentleman in barber's hands, Don Benito bore all, much less uneasily, at least, than he had done the razoring. Indeed, he sat so pale and rigid now that the negro seemed a Nubian sculptor finishing off a white statue-head. All being over, at last, the standard of Spain removed, tumbled up, and tossed back into the flag-locker, the negro's warm breath blowing away any stray hair which might have lodged down his master's neck, collar and cravat readjusted, a speck of lint whisked off the velvet lapel, all this being done, backing off a little space, and pausing with an expression of subdued self-complacency, the servant for a moment surveyed his master as, in toilet at least, the creature of his own tasteful hands. Captain Delano playfully complimented him upon his achievement, at the same time congratulating Don Benito. But neither sweet waters, nor shampooing, nor fidelity, nor sociality delighted the Spaniard. Seeing him relapsing into forbidding gloom and still remaining seated, Captain Delano, thinking that his presence was undesired just then, withdrew on pretense of seeing whether, as he had prophesied, any signs of a breeze were visible. Walking forward to the mainmast, he stood a while thinking over the scene, and not without some undefined misgivings, when he heard a noise near the cuddy, and turning saw the negro his hand to his cheek. Advancing, Captain Delano perceived that the cheek was bleeding. He was about to ask the cause when the negro's wailing soliloquy enlightened him. Ah, when will master get better from his sickness? Only the sour heart that sour sickness breeds made him serve Babo so, cutting Babo with a razor, because only by accident Babo had given master one little scratch, and for the first time in so many a day, too, ah, 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 holding his hand to his face. Is it possible, thought Captain Delano, was it to wreak in private his Spanish spite against this poor friend of his, that Don Benito by his sullen manner impelled me to withdraw? Ah, this slavery breeds ugly passions in man. Poor fellow! He was about to speak in sympathy to the negro, but with a timid reluctance he now re-entered the cuddy. Presently master and man came forth, Don Benito leaning on his servant as if nothing had happened but a sort of love quarrel after all, thought Captain Delano. He accosted Don Benito, and they slowly walked together. They had gone but a few paces, when the steward, a tall Raja-looking mulatto, orientally set off with a pagoda turban formed by three or four madras handkerchiefs wound about his head, tier on tier, approaching with a salam, announced lunch in the cabin. On their way thither the two captains were preceded by the mulatto, 
who, turning round as he advanced, with continual smiles and bows, ushered them on, a display of elegance which quite completed the insignificance of the small, bare-headed babo, who, as if not unconscious of inferiority, eyed askance the graceful steward. But in part Captain Delano imputed his jealous watchfulness to that peculiar feeling which the full-blooded African entertains for the adulterated one. As for the steward, his manner, if not bespeaking much dignity of self-respect, yet evidenced his extreme desire to please, which is doubly meritorious, as at once Christian and Chesterfieldian. Captain Delano observed with interest that, while the complexion of the mulatto was hybrid, his physiognomy was European, classically so. "'Don Benito,' whispered he, "'I am glad to see this usher of the golden rod of yours. The sight refutes an ugly remark once made to me by a Barbados planter, that when a mulatto has a regular European face, look out for him, he is a devil. But see, your steward here has features more regular than King George's of England, and yet there he nods and bows and smiles. A king, indeed, the king of kind hearts and polite fellows. What a pleasant voice he has, too. He has, senor. But tell me, has he not, so far as you have known him, always proved a good, worthy fellow? said Captain Delano, pausing, while with a final genuflection, the steward disappeared into the cabin. Come, for the reason just mentioned, I am curious to know. Francesco is a good man, a sort of sluggishly, responded Don Benito, like a phlegmatic appreciator who would neither find fault nor flatter. Ah, I thought so, for it were strange indeed and not very creditable to us white skins if a little of our blood mixed with the Africans should far from improving the latter's quality, have the sad effect of pouring vitriolic acid into black broth, improving the hue, perhaps, but not the wholesomeness. Doubtless, doubtless, senor, but, glancing at Pablo, not to speak of negroes, your planter's remark I have heard applied to the Spanish and Indian intermixtures in our provinces, but I know nothing about the matter, he listlessly added and here they entered the cabin. The lunch was a frugal one. Some of Captain Delano's fresh fish and pumpkins, biscuit and salt beef, the reserved bottle of cider, and the San Dominic's last bottle of canary. As they entered, Francesco, with two or three colored aides, was hovering over the table giving the last adjustments. Upon perceiving their master, they withdrew, Francesco making a smiling congé, and the Spaniard, without condescending to notice it, fastidiously remarking to his companion that he relished not superfluous attendance. Without companions, host and guest sat down, like a childless married couple, at opposite ends of the table, Don Benito waving Captain Delano to his place, and, weak as he was, insisting upon that gentleman being seated before himself. The negro placed a rug under Don Benito's feet and a cushion behind his back, and then stood behind, not his master's chair, but Captain Delano's. At first this a little surprised the latter, but it was soon evident that in taking his position the black was still true to his master, since by facing him he could the more readily anticipate his slightest want. This is an uncommonly intelligent fellow of yours, Don Benito, whispered Captain Delano across the table. You say true, senor. During the repast, the guest again reverted to parts of Don Benito's story, begging further particulars here and there. He inquired how it was that the scurvy and fever should have committed such wholesale havoc upon the whites while destroying less than half of the blacks as if this question reproduced the whole scene of plague before the Spaniard's eyes, miserably reminding him of his solitude in a cabin where, before he had had so many friends and officers round him, his hand shook, his face became hueless, broken words escaped. But directly the sane memory of the past seemed replaced by insane terrors of the present. With starting eyes, 
he stared before him at vacancy, for nothing was to be seen but the hand of his servant pushing the canary over towards him. At length a few sips served partially to restore him. He made random reference to the different constitutions of races, enabling one to offer more resistance to certain maladies than another. The thought was new to his companion. Presently Captain Delano, intending to say something to his host concerning the pecuniary part of the business he had undertaken for him, especially, since he was strictly accountable to his owners, with reference to the new suit of sails and other things of that sort, and naturally preferring to conduct such affairs in private, was desirous that the servant should withdraw, imagining that Don Benito, for a few minutes, could dispense with his attendance. He, however, waited a while, thinking that, as the conversation proceeded, Don Benito, without being prompted, would perceive the propriety of the step. But it was otherwise. At last, catching his host's eye, Captain Delano, with a slight backward gesture of his thumb, whispered, Don Benito, pardon me, but there is an interference with the full expression of what I have to say to you. Upon this the Spaniard changed countenance, which was imputed to his resenting the hint, as in some way a reflection upon his servant. After a moment's pause he assured his guest that the blacks remaining with them could be of no disservice, because since losing his officers he had made Babo, whose original office, it now appeared, had been captain of the slaves, not only his constant attendant and companion, but in all things his confidant. After this nothing more could be said, though indeed Captain Delano could hardly avoid some little tinge of irritation upon being left ungratified in so inconsiderable a wish by one, two, for whom he intended such solid services. But it is only his carelessness, thought he, and so filling his glass he proceeded to business. The price of the sales and other matters was fixed upon, but while this was being done, the American observed that, though his original offer of assistance had been hailed with hectic animation, yet now, when it was reduced to a business transaction, indifference and apathy were betrayed. Don Benito, in fact, appeared to submit to hearing the details more out of regard to common propriety than from any impression that weighty benefit to himself and his voyage was involved. Soon his manner became still more reserved. The effort was vain to seek to draw him into social talk. Gnawed by his splenetic mood, he sat twitching his beard, while to little purpose the hand of his servant, mute as that on the wall, slowly pushed over the canary. Lunch being over, they sat down on the cushioned transom, the servant placing a pillow behind his master. The long continuance of the calm had now affected the atmosphere. Don Benito sighed heavily, as if for breath. "'Why not adjourn to the cuddy?' said Captain Delano. "'There is more air there.' But the host sat silent and motionless. Meantime his servant knelt before him with a large fan of feathers, and Francesco, coming in on tiptoes, handed the negro a little cup of aromatic waters with which, at intervals, he chafed his master's brow, smoothing the hair along the temples as a nurse does a child's. He spoke no word. He only rested his eye on his master's, as if, amid all Don Benito's distress, a little to refresh his spirit by the silent sight of fidelity. Presently the ship's bell sounded two o'clock, and through the cabin windows a slight rippling of the sea was discerned, and from the desired direction. There! exclaimed Captain Delano. I told you so, Don Benito. Look! He had risen to his feet, speaking in a very animated tone, with a view the more to rouse his companion. But though the crimson curtain of the stern window near him that moment fluttered against his pale cheek, Don Benito seemed to have even less welcome for the breeze than the calm. Poor fellow! thought Captain Delano. Bitter experience has taught him that one ripple does not make a wind any more than one swallow a summer. But he is mistaken for once. I will get his ship in for him and prove it. Briefly alluding to his weak condition, 
he urged his host to remain quietly where he was, since he, Captain Delano, would with pleasure take upon himself the responsibility of making the best use of the wind. Upon gaining the deck, Captain Delano started at the unexpected figure of Atafal, monumentally fixed at the threshold, like one of those sculptured porters of black marble guarding the porches of Egyptian tombs. But this time the start was, perhaps, purely physical. Atafal's presence, singularly attesting docility even in sullenness, was contrasted with that of the hatchet-polishers who in patience evidenced their industry. While both spectacles showed that lax as Don Benito's general authority might be, still, whenever he chose to exert it, no man so savage or colossal but must, more or less, bow. Snatching a trumpet which hung from the bulwarks with a free step, Captain Delano advanced to the forward edge of the poop, issuing his orders in his best Spanish. The few sailors and many negroes, all equally pleased, obediently set about heading the ship towards the harbor. While giving some directions about setting a lower stunnel sail, suddenly Captain Delano heard a voice faithfully repeating his orders. Turning, he saw Babo, now for the first time acting, under the pilot, his original part of captain of the slaves. This assistance proved valuable. Tattered sails and warped yards were soon brought into some trim, and no brace or halyard was pulled but to the blithe songs of the inspirited negroes. Good fellows, thought Captain Delano, a little training would make fine sailors of them. Why, see, the very women pull and sing, too. There must be some of those Ashanti negresses that make such capital soldiers, I've heard. But who's at the helm? I must have a good hand there. He went to sea. The San Dominique steered with a cumbrous tiller, with large horizontal pulleys attached. At each pulley end stood a subordinate black, and between them, at the tiller head, the responsible post. A Spanish seaman, whose countenance evinced his due share in the general hopefulness and confidence at the coming of the breeze. He proved the same man who had behaved with so shamefaced an air on the windlass. "'Ah, it is you, my man!' exclaimed Captain Delano. "'Well, no more sheep's eyes now. Look straight forward and keep the ship so. Good hand, I trust. And want to get into the harbor, don't you?' The man assented with an inward chuckle grasping the tiller-head firmly. Upon this, unperceived by the American, the two blacks eyed the sailor intently. Finding all right at the helm, the pilot went forward to the forecastle to see how matters stood there. The ship now had way enough to breast the current. With the approach of evening the breeze would be sure to freshen. Having done all that was needed for the present, Captain Delano, giving his last orders to the sailors, turned aft to report affairs to Don Benito in the cabin, perhaps additionally incited to rejoin him by the hope of snatching a moment's private chat while the servant was engaged upon deck. From opposite sides there were, beneath the poop, two approaches to the cabin, one further forward than the other, and consequently communicating with a longer passage. Marking the servant still above, Captain Delano, taking the nighest entrance, the one last named, and at whose porch Atiful still stood, hurried on his way till, arrived at the cabin threshold, he paused an instant, a little to recover from his eagerness. Then, with the words of his intended business upon his lips, he entered. As he advanced toward the seated Spaniard, he heard another footstep, keeping time with his. From the opposite door, a salver in hand, the servant was likewise advancing. "'Confound the faithful fellow,' thought Captain Delano. "'What a vexatious coincidence!' Possibly the vexation might have been something different, were it not for the brisk confidence inspired by the breeze. But even as it was, he felt a slight twinge from a sudden indefinite association in his mind of Babo with Atiful. "'Don Benito,' said he, "'I give you joy. The breeze will hold and will increase.' By the way, your tall man and timepiece Atiful stands without, by your order, of course. Don Benito recoiled, as if at some bland satirical touch, delivered with such adroit garnish of apparent good breeding as to present no handle for retort. 
He is like one flayed alive, thought Captain Delano. Where may one touch him without causing a shrink? The servant moved before his master, adjusting a cushion, recalled to civility. The Spaniard stiffly replied, You are right. The slave appears where you saw him, according to my command, which is that if at the given hour I am below, he must take his stand and abide my coming. Ah, now, pardon me, but that is treating the poor fellow like an ex-king indeed. Ah, Don Benito, smiling, for all the license you permit in some things I fear less at bottom, you are a bitter hard master. Again Don Benito shrank, and this time, as the good sailor thought, from a genuine twinge of his conscience. Again conversation became constrained. In vain Captain Delano called attention to the now perceptible motion of the keel gently cleaving the sea. With lackluster eye, Don Benito returned words few and reserved. By and by the wind, having steadily risen and still blowing right into the harbor, bore the San Dominic swiftly on. Sounding a point of land, the sealer at distance came into open view. Meantime Captain Delano had again repaired to the deck, remaining there some time. Having at last altered the ship's course so as to give the reef a wide berth, he returned for a few moments below. "'I will cheer up my poor friend this time,' thought he. "'Better and better, Don Benito,' he cried as he blithely re-entered. "'There will soon be an end to your cares, at least for a while. For when, after a long sad voyage, you know, the anchor drops into the haven, all its vast weight seems lifted from the captain's heart. We are getting on famously, Don Benito. My ship is in sight. Look through this side-light here. There she is, all a tanto. The bachelor's delight, my good friend. Ah, how this wind braces one up. Come, you must take a cup of coffee with me this evening. My old steward will give you as fine a cup as ever any sultan tasted. What say you, Don Benito, will you? At first the Spaniard glanced feverishly up, casting a longing look towards the sealer, while with mute concern his servant gazed into his face. Suddenly the old ague of coldness returned, and dropping back to his cushions he was silent. "'You do not answer. Come, all day you have been my host. Would you have hospitality all on one side?' "'I cannot go,' was the response. "'What? It will not fatigue you. The ships will lie together as near as they can, without swinging fowl. It will be little more than stepping from deck to deck which is but as from room to room. Come, come, you must not refuse me. I cannot go, decisively and repulsively repeated Don Benito. Renouncing all but the last appearance of courtesy with a sort of cadaverous sullenness, and biting his thin nails to the quick, he glanced, almost glared at his guest, as if impatient that a stranger's presence should interfere with the full indulgence of his morbid hour. Meantime the sound of the parted waters came more and more gurglingly and merrily into the windows, as reproaching him for his dark spleen, as telling him that, sulk as he might, and go mad with it, nature cared not a jot, since whose fault was it, pray? But the foul mood was now at its depth, as the fair wind at its height. There was something in the man so far beyond any mere unsociality or sourness previously evinced, that even the forbearing good nature of his guest could no longer endure it. Wholly at a loss to account for such demeanor, and deeming sickness with eccentricity, however extreme, no adequate excuse, well satisfied, too, that nothing in his own conduct could justify it, Captain Delano's pride began to be roused himself became reserved. But all seemed one to the Spaniard. Quitting him, therefore, Captain Delano once more went to the deck. The ship was now within less than two miles of the sealer. The whale-boat was seen darting over the interval. To be brief, the two vessels, thanks to the pilot's skill, ere long neighborly style lay anchored together. Before returning to his own vessel, Captain Delano had intended communicating to Don Benito the smaller details of the proposed services to be rendered, 
but as it was unwilling anew to subject himself to rebuffs, he resolved, now that he had seen the San Dominic safely moored, immediately to quit her without further allusion to hospitality or business. Indefinitely postponing his ulterior plans, he would regulate his future actions according to future circumstances. His boat was ready to receive him, but his host still tarried below. Well, thought Captain Delano, if he has little breeding, the more need to show mine. He descended to the cabin to bid a ceremonious and, it may be, tacitly rebukeful adieu. But, to his great satisfaction, Don Benito, as if he began to feel the weight of that treatment with which his slighted guest had not indecorously retaliated upon him, now supported by his servant, rose to his feet, and grasping Captain Delano's hand, stood tremulous, too much agitated to speak. But the good augury hence drawn was suddenly dashed, by his resuming all his previous reserve, with augmented gloom, as, with half-averted eyes, he silently reseated himself on his cushions. With a corresponding return of his own chilled feelings, Captain Delano bowed and withdrew. He was hardly midway in the narrow corridor, dim as a tunnel, leading from the cabin to the stairs, when a sound, as of the tolling for execution in some jail-yard, fell on his ears. It was the echo of the ship's flawed bell, striking the hour, drearily reverberated in this subterranean vault. Instantly, by a fatality not to be withstood, his mind, responsive to the portent, swarmed with superstitious suspicions. He paused. In images far swifter than these sentences, the minutest details of all his former distrusts swept through him. Hitherto, credulous good nature had been too ready to furnish excuses for reasonable fears. Why was the Spaniard, so superfluously punctilious at times, now heedless of common propriety in not accompanying to the side his departing guest? Did indisposition forbid? Indisposition had not forbidden more irksome exertion that day. His last equivocal demeanor recurred. He had risen to his feet, grasped his guest's hand, motioned toward his hat, then, in an instant, all was eclipsed in sinister muteness and gloom. Did this imply one brief, repentant relenting at the final moment from some iniquitous plot, followed by remorseless return to it? His last glance seemed to express a calamitous, yet acquiescent, farewell to Captain Delano forever. Why decline the invitation to visit the sealer that evening? Or was the Spaniard less hardened than the Jew, who refrained not from supping at the board of him whom the same night he meant to betray? What imported all those day-long enigmas and contradictions, except they were intended to mystify, preliminary to some stealthy blow? Attiful, the pretended rebel, but punctual shadow, that moment lurked by the threshold without. He seemed a century, and more. Who, by his own confession, had stationed him there? Was the negro now lying in wait? The Spaniard behind, his creature before, to rush from darkness to light was the involuntary choice. The next moment, with clenched jaw and hand, he passed Attiful and stood unharmed in the light. As he saw his trim ship lying peacefully at anchor, and almost within ordinary call, as he saw his household boat, with familiar faces in it, patiently rising and falling on the short waves by the San Dominic side, and then, glancing about the decks where he stood, saw the oakum pickers still gravely plying their fingers, and heard the low, buzzing whistle and industrious hum of the hatchet-polishers, still bestirring themselves over their endless occupation, and, more than all, as he saw the benign aspect of nature, taking her innocent repose in the evening, the screened sun in the quiet camp of the west shining out like the mild light from Abraham's tent, as charmed eye and ear took in all these, with the chained figure of the black, clenched jaw and hand relaxed. Once again he smiled at the phantoms which had mocked him, and felt something like a tinge of remorse, that, 
by harboring them even for a moment he should by implication have betrayed an atheist doubt of the ever-watchful providence above. There was a few minutes' delay while, in obedience to his orders, the boat was being hooked along to the gangway. During this interval a sort of saddened satisfaction stole over Captain Delano, at thinking of the kindly offices he had that day discharged for a stranger. Ah, thought he, after good actions one's conscience is never ungrateful, however much so the benefited party may be. Presently his foot, in the first act of descent into the boat, pressed the first round of the side ladder, his face presented inward upon the deck. In the same moment he heard his name courteously sounded, and to his pleased surprise saw Don Benito advancing, an unwanted energy in his air, as if, at the last moment, intent upon making amends for his recent discourtesy. With instinctive good feeling, Captain Delano, withdrawing his foot, turned and reciprocally advanced. As he did so, the Spaniard's nervous eagerness increased, but his vital energy failed, so that, the better to support him, the servant, placing his master's hand on his naked shoulder and gently holding it there, formed himself into a sort of crutch. When the two captains met, the Spaniard again fervently took the hand of the American, at the same time casting an earnest glance into his eyes, but, as before, too much overcome to speak. I have done him wrong, self-reproachfully thought Captain Delano. His apparent coldness has deceived me. In no instance has he meant to offend. Meantime, as if fearful that the continuance of the scene might too much unstring his master, the servant seemed anxious to terminate it, and so, still presenting himself as a crutch and walking between the two captains, he advanced with them towards the gangway, while still, as if full of kindly contrition, Don Benito would not let go the hand of Captain Delano, but retained it in his across the black's body. Soon they were standing by the side, looking over into the boat, whose crew turned up their curious eyes. Waiting a moment for the Spaniard to relinquish his hold, the now embarrassed Captain Delano lifted his foot to overstep the threshold of the open gangway. But still Don Benito would not let go his hand. And yet, with an agitated tone, he said, I can go no further. Here I must bid you adieu. Adieu, my dear, dear Don Amasa. Go, go suddenly tearing his hand loose, go and God guard you better than me, my best friend. Not unaffected, Captain Delano would now have lingered, but catching the meekly admonitory eye of the servant with a hasty farewell he descended into his boat, followed by the continual adieus of Don Benito, standing rooted in the gangway. Seating himself in the stern, Captain Delano, making a last salute, ordered the boat shoved off. The crew had their oars on end. The bowsmen pushed the boat a sufficient distance for the oars to be lengthwise dropped. The instant that was done, Don Benito sprang over the bulwarks, falling at the feet of Captain Delano, at the same time calling towards his ship, but in tones so frenzied that none in the boat could understand him. But as if not equally obtuse, three sailors, from different and distant parts of the ship, splashed into the sea, swimming after their captain as if intent upon his rescue. The dismayed officer of the boat eagerly asked what this meant, to which Captain Delano, turning a disdainful smile upon the unaccountable Spaniard, answered that, for his part, he neither knew nor cared. But it seemed as if Don Benito had taken it into his head to produce the impression among his people that the boat wanted to kidnap him, or else give way for your lives, he wildly added, starting at a clattering hubbub in the ship, above which rang the tocsin of the hatchet polishers, and seizing Don Benito by the throat, he added, This plotting pirate means murder. Here, in apparent verification of the words, the servant, a dagger in his hand, was seen on the rail overhead, poised in the act of leaping, as if with desperate fidelity to befriend his master to the last, while seemingly to aid the black, the three white sailors were trying to clamber into the hampered bow. 
Meantime, the whole host of negroes, as if inflamed at the sight of their jeopardized captain, impended in one sooty avalanche over the bulwarks. All this, with what preceded and what followed, occurred with such involutions of rapidity that past, present, and future seemed one. Seeing the negro coming, Captain Delano had flung the Spaniard aside, almost in the very act of clutching him, and, by the unconscious recoil, shifting his place, with arms thrown up, so promptly grappled the servant in his descent, that with dagger presented at Captain Delano's heart, the black seemed of purpose to have leapt there as to his mark. But the weapon was wrenched away, and the assailant dashed down into the bottom of the boat, which now, with disentangled oars, began to speed through the sea. At this juncture the left hand of Captain Delano on one side again clutched the half-reclined Don Benito, heedless that he was in a speechless faint, while his right foot on the other side ground the prostrate negro, and his right arm pressed for added speed on the after-oar, his eye bent forward, encouraging his men to their utmost. But here the officer of the boat, who had at last succeeded in beating off the towing sailors, and was now with face turned aft assisting the bowsman at his oar, suddenly called to Captain Delano to see what the black was about, while a Portuguese oarsman shouted to him to give heed to what the Spaniard was saying. Glancing down at his feet, Captain Delano saw the freed hand of the servant aiming with a second dagger, a small one, before concealing it in his wool. With this he was snakishly writhing up from the boat's bottom at the heart of his master, his countenance lividly vindictive, expressing the centered purpose of his soul, while the Spaniard, half-choked, was vainly shrinking away with husky words incoherent to all but the Portuguese. That moment, across the long benighted mind of Captain Delano, a flash of revelation swept, illuminating, in an unanticipated clearness, his host's whole mysterious demeanor, with every enigmatic event of the day, as well as the entire past voyage of the San Dominic. He smote Babo's hand down, but his own heart smote him harder. With infinite pity he withdrew his hold from Don Benito. Not Captain Delano, but Don Benito the Black, in leaping into the boat, had intended to stab. Both the Black's hands were held, as, glancing up towards the San Dominic, Captain Delano, now with scales dropped from his eyes, saw the Negroes, not in misrule, not in tumult, not as if frantically concerned for Don Benito, but, with mask torn away, flourishing hatchets and knives, in ferocious piratical revolt. Like delirious black dervishes, the six Ashantis danced on the poop. Prevented by their foes from springing into the water, the Spanish boys were hurrying up to the topmost spars, while such of the few Spanish sailors not already in the sea, less alert, were descried, helplessly mixed in, on deck, with the blacks. Meantime Captain Delano hailed his own vessel, ordering the ports up and the guns run out. But by this time the cable of the San Dominic had been cut, and the fag end, in lashing out, whipped away the canvas shroud about the beak, suddenly revealing, as the bleached hull swung round towards the open ocean, death for the figurehead in a human skeleton. Chalky comment on the chalked words below, follow your leader. At the sight, Don Benito, covering his face, wailed out, "'Tis he, Aranda, my murdered, unburied friend!" Upon reaching the sealer, calling for ropes, Captain Delano bound the negro, who made no resistance, and had him hoisted to the deck. He would then have assisted the now almost helpless Don Benito up the side, but Don Benito, wan as he was, refused to move or be moved until the negro should have been first put below, out of view. When presently assured that it was done, he no more shrank from the ascent. The boat was immediately dispatched back to pick up the three swimming sailors. Meantime the guns were in readiness, though, owing to the San Dominic having glided somewhat astern of the sealer, only the aftermost one could be brought to bear. 
With this they fired six times, thinking to cripple the fugitive ship by bringing down her spars, but only a few inconsiderable ropes were shot away. Soon the ship was beyond the gun's range, steering broad out of the bay. The blacks thickly clustered round the bowsprit, one moment with taunting cries towards the whites, the next with upthrown gestures, hailing the now dusky moors of the ocean, cawing crows escaped from the hand of the fowler. The first impulse was to slip the cables and give chase, but upon second thoughts to pursue with whale-boat and yawl seemed more promising. Upon inquiring of Don Benito what firearms they had on board the San Dominic, Captain Delano was answered that they had none that could be used because in the earlier stages of the mutiny a cabin passenger, since dead, had secretly put out of order the locks of what few muskets there were. But with all his remaining strength Don Benito entreated the American not to give chase, either with ship or boat, for the negroes had already proved themselves such desperadoes that in case of a present assault nothing but a total massacre of the whites could be looked for. But regarding this warning as coming from one whose spirit had been crushed by misery, the American did not give up his design. The boats were got ready and armed. Captain Delano ordered his men into them. He was going himself when Don Benito grasped his arm. "'What? Have you saved my life, senor, and are you now going to throw away your own?' The officers also, for reasons connected with their interests and those of the voyage, and a duty owing to the owners, strongly objected against their commander's going. Weighing their remonstrances a moment, Captain Delano felt bound to remain. Appointing his chief mate, an athletic and resolute man who had been a privateer's man, to head the party. The more to encourage the sailors, they were told, that the Spanish captain considered his ship good as lost, that she and her cargo, including some gold and silver, were worth more than a thousand doubloons. Take her, and no small part should be theirs. The sailors replied with a shout. The fugitives had now almost gained an offing. It was nearly night, but the moon was rising. After hard, prolonged pulling, the boats came up on the ship's quarters, at a suitable distance laying upon their oars to discharge their muskets. Having no bullets to return, the negroes sent their yells. But upon the second volley, Indian-like, they hurtled their hatchets. One took off a sailor's fingers. Another struck the whaleboat's bow, cutting off the rope there, and remaining stuck in the gunwale, like a woodman's axe. Snatching it, quivering from its lodgment, the mate hurled it back. The return gauntlet now struck the ship's broken quarter-gallery, and so remained. The negroes giving too hot a reception, the whites kept a more respectful distance. Hovering now just out of reach of the hurtling hatchets, they, with a view to the close encounter which must soon come, sought to decoy the blacks into entirely disarming themselves of their most murderous weapons in a hand-to-hand -hand fight, by foolishly flinging them as missiles, short of the mark, into the sea. But ere long, perceiving the stratagem, the negroes desisted, though not before many of them had to replace their lost hatchets with handspikes, an exchange which, as counted upon, proved in the end favorable to the assailants. Meantime, with a strong wind, the ship still clove the water, the boats alternately falling behind and pulling up to discharge fresh volleys. The fire was mostly directly towards the stern, since there, chiefly, the negroes at present were clustering. But to kill or maim the negroes was not the object. To take them with the ship was the object. To do it, the ship must be boarded, which could not be done by boats while she was sailing so fast. A thought now struck the mate. Observing the Spanish boys still aloft, high as they could get, he called to them to descend to the yards and cut adrift the sails. It was done. About this time, owing to causes hereafter to be shown, two Spaniards, in the dress of sailors, and conspicuously showing themselves, were killed, not by volleys, but by deliberate marksmen's shots, while 
as it afterwards appeared, by one of the general discharges, Atiful the Black and the Spaniard at the helm likewise were killed. What now, with the loss of the sails and loss of leaders, the ship became unmanageable to the negroes. With creaking masts she came heavily round to the wind, the prow slowly swinging into view of the boats, its skeleton gleaming in the horizontal moonlight, and casting a gigantic ribbed shadow upon the water. One extended arm of the ghost seemed beckoning the whites to avenge it. "'Follow your leader!' cried the mate, and one on each bow, the boats boarded. Sealing spears and cutlasses crossed hatchets and handspikes. Huddled upon the longboat amidships, the negresses raised a wailing chant whose chorus was the clash of the steel. For a time the attack wavered, the negroes wedging themselves to beat it back, the half-repelled sailors, as yet unable to gain a footing, fighting as troopers in the saddle, one leg sideways flung over the bulwarks, and one without plying their cutlasses like carter's whips but in vain. They were almost overborne, when, rallying themselves into a squad as one man, with a huzzah, they sprang inboard, where, entangled, they involuntarily separated again. For a few breaths' space there was a vague, muffled inner sound, as of submerged swordfish rushing hither and thither through shoals of blackfish. Soon, in a reunited band, and joined by the Spanish seamen, the whites came to the surface, irresistibly driving the negroes toward the stern. But a barricade of casks and sacks from side to side had been thrown up by the main mast. Here the negroes faced about, and though scorning peace or truce, yet fain would have had respite. But without pause, overleaping the barrier, the unflagging sailors again closed. Exhausted, the blacks now fought in despair. Their red tongues lolled, wolf-like, from their black mouths but the pale sailor's teeth were set, not a word was spoken, and in five minutes more the ship was won. Nearly a score of the negroes were killed. Exclusive of those by the balls, many were mangled. Their wounds, mostly inflicted by the long-edged sealing spears, resembling those shaven ones of the English at Preston Pans, made by the pulled scythes of the Highlanders. On the other side, none were killed, though several were wounded, some severely, including the mate. The surviving negroes were temporarily secured, and the ship, towed back into the harbor at midnight, once more lay anchored. Omitting the incidents and arrangements ensuing, Syphit that, after two days spent in refitting, the ships sailed in company for Concepcion, in Chile, and thence for Lima, in Peru where, before the vice-regal courts, the whole affair from the beginning underwent investigation. Though midway on the passage, the ill-fated Spaniard, relaxed from constraint, showed some signs of regaining health with free will, yet, agreeably to his own foreboding, shortly before arriving at Lima he relapsed, finally becoming so reduced as to be carried ashore in arms. Hearing of his story and plight, one of the many religious institutions of the City of Kings opened an hospitable refuge to him, where both physician and priest were his nurses, and a member of the order volunteered to be his one special guardian and consular by night and by day. The following extracts, translated from one of the official Spanish documents, will, it is hoped, shed light on the preceding narrative as well as, in the first place, reveal the true port of departure and true history of the San Dominic's voyage, down to the time of her touching at the island of Santa Maria. But ere the extracts come, it may be well to preface them with a remark. The document selected, from among many others, for partial translation, contains the deposition of Benito Sereno, the first taken in the case. Some disclosures therein were, at the time, held dubious for both learned and natural reasons. The tribunal inclined to the opinion that the deponent, not undisturbed in his mind by recent events, raved of some things which could never have happened. But subsequent depositions of the surviving sailors, 
bearing out the revelations of their captain in several of the strangest particulars gave credence to the rest so that the tribunal in its final decision rested its capital sentences upon statements which had they lacked confirmation it would have deemed it but duty to reject end of section six chapter three c benedito sereno part three benito sereno part four i don jose de abos and padilla his majesty's notary for the royal revenue and register of this province and notary public of the holy crusade of this bishopric etc do certify and declare as much as is requisite in law that in the criminal cause commenced the twenty-fourth of the month of september in the year seventeen hundred and ninety-nine against the negroes of the ship san dominique the following declaration before me was made declaration of the first witness don benito sereno the same day and month and year his honor dr juan martinez de rosas counselor of the royal audience of this kingdom and learned in the law of this intendancy ordered the captain of the ship san dominique don benito sereno to appear which he did in his litter attended by the monk infeles of whom he received the oath which he took by god our lord and the sign of the cross under which he promised to tell the truth of whatever he should know and should be asked and being interrogated agreeably to the tenor of the act commencing the process he said that on the twentieth of may last he set sail with his ship from the port of valparaiso bound to that of calao loaded with the produce of the country beside thirty cases of hardware and one hundred and sixty blacks of both sexes mostly belonging to don alejandro aranda gentleman of the city of mendoza that the crew of the ship consisted of thirty-six men beside the persons who went as passengers that the negroes were in part as follows here in the original follows a list of some fifty names descriptions and ages compiled from certain recovered documents of arandas and also from recollections of the deponent from which portions only are extracted one from about eighteen to nineteen years named jose and this was the man that waited upon his master don alejandro and who speaks well the spanish having served him four or five years a mulatto named francesco the cabin steward of a good person and voice having sung in the valparaiso churches native of the province of buenos aires aged about thirty-five years a smart negro named dago who had been for many years a grave-digger among the spaniards aged forty-six years four old negroes born in africa from sixty to seventy but sound caulkers by trade whose names are as follows the first was named muri and he was killed as was also his son named diamelo the second nakta the third yola likewise killed the fourth Gofan, and six full-grown negroes aged from thirty to forty-five all raw and born among the ashantis matiluki jan leche mapenda yambayo akim four of whom were killed a powerful negro named ataful who being supposed to have been a chief in africa his owner set great store by him and a small negro of senegal but some years among the spaniards aged about thirty which negro's name was babo that he does not remember the names of the others but that still expecting the residue of don alejandra's papers will be found will then take due account of them all and remit to the court and thirty-nine women and children of all ages the catalogue over the deposition goes on that all the negroes slept upon the deck as is customary in this navigation and none wore fetters because the owner his friend aranda told him that they were all tractable that on the seventh day after leaving port at three o'clock in the morning all the spaniards being asleep except the two officers on the watch who were the boatswain juan robles and the carpenter juan bautista gallete and the helmsman and his boy the negroes revolted suddenly wounded dangerously the boatswain and the carpenter 
and successively killed eighteen men of those who were sleeping upon the deck, some with handspikes and hatchets, and others by throwing them alive overboard after tying them. That of the Spaniards upon the deck they left about seven, as he thinks, alive and tied, to maneuver the ship, and three or four more, who hid themselves, remained also alive. Although in the act of revolt the negroes made themselves masters of the hatchway, six or seven wounded went through it to the cockpit, without any hindrance on their part, that during the act of revolt the mate and another person whose name he does not recollect attempted to come up through the hatchway, but being quickly wounded were obliged to return to the cabin, that the deponent resolved at break of day to come up the companionway where the negro babo was being the ringleader and ataful who assisted him and having spoken to them exhorted them to cease committing such atrocities asking them at the same time what they wanted and intended to do offering himself to obey their commands that notwithstanding this they threw in his presence three men alive and tied overboard that they told the deponent to come up, and that they would not kill him, which having done, the negro babo asked him whether there were in those seas any negro countries where they might be carried, and he answered them no, that the negro babo afterwards told him to carry them to Senegal, or to the neighboring islands of St. Nicholas, and he answered that this was impossible on account of the great distance, the necessity involved of rounding Cape Horn, the bad condition of the vessel, the want of provisions, sails, and water, and that the negro babo replied to him he must carry them in any way, that they would do, and conform themselves to everything the deponent should require as to eating and drinking, that, after a long conference, being absolutely compelled to please them, for they threatened to kill all the whites if they were not, at all events, carried to Senegal, he told them that what was most wanting for the voyage was water, that they would go near the coast to take it, and thence they would proceed on their course, that the negro babo agreed to it, and the deponent steered towards the intermediate ports, hoping to meet some Spanish or foreign vessel that would save them, that within ten or eleven days they saw the land, and continued their course by it in the vicinity of Nazca that the deponent observed that the negroes were now restless and mutinous, because he did not affect the taking in of water, the negro babo having required, with threats, that it should be done without fail the following day. He told him he saw plainly that the coast was steep, and the rivers designated in the maps were not to be found, with other reasons suitable to the circumstances, that the best way would be to go to the island of Santa Maria, where they might water easily, it being a solitary island, as the foreigners did, that the deponent did not go to Pisco, that was near, nor make any other port of the coast, because the negro babo had intimated to him several times that he would kill all the whites the very moment he should perceive any city, town, or settlement of any kind on the shores to which they should be carried, that having determined to go to the island of Santa Maria, as the deponent had planned, for the purpose of trying whether, on the passage or near the island itself, they could find any vessel that should favor them, or whether he could escape from it in a boat to the neighboring coast of Arroco. To adopt the necessary means, he immediately changed his course, steering for the island. That the negro, babo, and ataful held daily conferences in which they discussed what was necessary for the design of returning to Senegal, whether they were to kill all the Spaniards, and particularly the deponent. That eight days after parting from the coast of Nazca, the deponent, being on the watch a little after daybreak, and soon after the negroes had their meeting, the negro babo came to the place where the deponent was and told him that he had determined to kill his master, Don Alejandro Aranda, both because he and his companions could not otherwise be sure of their liberty, and that to keep the seamen in subjection he wanted to prepare a warning of what road they should be made to take, did they or any of them oppose him, and that, by means of the death of Don Alejandro, that warning would best be given, but that what this last meant the deponent did not at the time comprehend, 
nor could not, further than that the death of Don Alejandro was intended, and, moreover, the negro babo proposed to the deponent to call the mate Raneds, who was sleeping in the cabin, before the thing was done, for fear, as the deponent understood it, that the mate, who was a good navigator, should be killed with Don Alejandro and the rest, that the deponent, who was the friend from youth of Don Alejandro, prayed and conjured, but all was useless, for the negro babo answered him that the thing could not be prevented, and that all the Spaniards risked their death if they should attempt to frustrate his will in this matter, or any other, that in this conflict the deponent called the mate, Ranedz, who was forced to go apart, and immediately the negro babo commanded the Ashanti Martinki and the Ashanti Lekbe to go and commit the murder, that those two went down with hatchets to the birth of Don Alejandro, that, yet half alive and mangled, they dragged him on deck, that they were going to throw him overboard in that state, but the negro babo stopped them, bidding the murder be completed on the deck before him, which was done when by his orders the body was carried below, forward, that nothing more was seen of it by the deponent for three days, that Don Alonso Sidonia, an old man, long resident at Valparaiso, and lately appointed to a civil office in Peru, whither he had taken passage, was at the time sleeping in the berth opposite Don Alejandro's, that awakening at his cries, surprised by them, and at the sight of the negroes with their bloody hatchets in their hands, he threw himself into the sea through a window which was near him, and was drowned, without it being in the power of the deponent to assist or take him up. That a short time after killing Aranda, they brought upon the deck his German cousin of middle age, Don Francisco Massa of Mendoza, and the young Don Joaquin, Marques de Aramboaza, then lately from Spain, with his Spanish servant Ponce, and the three young clerks of Aranda, José Muzairi, Lorenzo Barrias, and Hermenegildo Gandix, all of Cadiz, that Don Joaquin and Hermenelingo Gandix, the negro babo, for purposes hereafter to appear, preserved alive, but Don Francisco Massa, José Mazairi, and Lorenzo Vargas, with Ponce, the servant, beside the boatswain, Juan Robles, the boatswain's mates, Manuel Vizcaya and Rodrigo Hurta, and for the sailors, the negro babo ordered to be thrown alive into the sea, although they made no resistance, nor begged for anything else but mercy, that the boatswain, Juan Robles, who knew how to swim, kept the longest above water, making acts of contrition, and, in the last words he uttered, charged this deponent to cause mass to be said for his soul to Our Lady of Succor. That during the three days which followed, the deponent, uncertain what fate had befallen the remains of Don Alejandro, frequently asked the negro babo where they were, and if still on board, whether they were to be preserved for internment ashore, entreating him so to order it, that the negro babo answered nothing till the fourth day, when at sunrise the deponent coming on deck, the negro babo showed him a skeleton, which had been substituted for the ship's proper figurehead, the image of Christopher Colon, the discoverer of the new world, that the negro babo asked him whose skeleton that was, and whether, from its whiteness, he should not think it a white's, that, Upon discovering his face, the negro babo, coming close, said words to this effect, Keep faith with the blacks from here to Senegal, or you shall in spirit, as now in body, follow your leader, pointing to the prow. That the same morning the negro babo took by succession each Spaniard forward, and asked him whose skeleton that was, and whether from its whiteness he should not think it a white's that each Spaniard covered his face, that then to each the negro babo repeated the words in the first place said to the deponent, that they, the Spaniards, being then assembled aft, the negro babo harangued them, saying that he had now done all, that the deponent, as navigator for the negroes, might pursue his course, warning him and all of them, that they should, soul and body, go the way of Don Alejandro, if he saw them, the Spaniards, speak, 
or plot anything against them, the Negroes. A threat which was repeated every day, that before the events last mentioned they had tied the cook to throw him overboard, for it is not known what thing they heard him speak, but finally the Negro Babo spared his life at the request of the deponent, that a few days after, the deponent endeavoring not to omit any means to preserve the lives of the remaining whites, spoke to the Negro's peace and tranquility, and agreed to draw up a paper, signed by the deponent and the sailors who could write, as also by the Negro Babo for himself and all the blacks, in which the deponent obliged himself to carry them to Senegal and they not to kill any more, and he formally to make over to them the ship, with the cargo, with which they were for that time satisfied and quieted. But the next day, the more surely to guard against the sailors' escape, the negro babo commanded all the boats to be destroyed but the longboat, which was unseaworthy, and another, a cutter in good condition, which, knowing it would yet be wanted for towing the water-casks, he had it lowered down into the hold. Various particulars of the prolonged and perplexed navigation ensuing here follow, with incidents of the calamitous calm from which portions one passage is extracted, to wit, that on the fifth day of the calm, all on board suffering much from the heat and want of water, and five having died in fits and mad, the negroes became irritable, and for a chance gesture which they deemed suspicious, though it was harmless, made by the mate, Raneds, to the deponent in the act of handing him a quadrant, they killed him, but that for this they afterwards were sorry, the mate being the only remaining navigator on board except the deponent. That, omitting other events which daily happened and which can only serve uselessly to recall past misfortunes and conflicts, after seventy-three days' navigation, reckoned from the time they sailed from Nazca, during which they navigated under a scanty allowance of water, and were afflicted with the calms before mentioned, they at last arrived at the island of Santa Maria, on the seventeenth of the month of August, at about six o'clock in the afternoon, at which hour they cast anchor very near the American ship Bachelor's Delight, which lay in the same bay, commanded by the generous Captain Amasa Delano. But at six o'clock in the morning they had already descried the port, and the negroes became uneasy as soon as at distance they saw the ship, not having expected to see one there, that the negro babo pacified them, assuring them that no fear need be had, that straightway he ordered the figure on the bow to be covered with canvas, as for repairs, and had the decks a little set in order, that for a time the negro babo and the negro atiful conferred, that the negro atiful was for sailing away, but the negro babo would not, and, by himself, cast about what to do that at last he came to the deponent, proposing to him to say and do all that the deponent declares to have said and done to the American captain, that the negro babo warned him that if he varied in the least, or uttered any word, or gave any look that should give the least intimation of the past events or present state, he would instantly kill him, with all his companions, showing a dagger which he carried hid saying something which, as he understood it, meant that that dagger would be alert as his eye. That the negro babo then announced the plan to all his companions, which pleased them. That he then, the better to disguise the truth, devised many expedients, in some of them uniting deceit and defense. That of this sort was the device of the six Ashantis before named, who were his bravos, that them he stationed on the break of the poop, as if to clean certain hatchets in cases which were part of the cargo, but in reality to use them and distribute them at need, and at a given word he told them, that among other devices was the device of presenting Atiful, his right-hand man, as chained, though in a moment the chains could be dropped, that in every particular he informed the deponent what part he was expected to enact in every device, 
and what story he was to tell on every occasion, always threatening him with instant death if he varied in the least, that, conscious that many of the negroes would be turbulent, the negro babo appointed the four aged negroes, who were caulkers, to keep what domestic order they could on the decks, that again and again he harangued the Spaniards and his companions, informing them of his intent, and of his devices, and of the invented story that this deponent was to tell, charging them lest any of them varied from that story, that these arrangements were made and matured during the interval of two or three hours between their first sighting the ship and the arrival on board of Captain Amasa Delano, that this happened about half-past seven o'clock in the morning, Captain Amasa Delano coming in his boat, and all gladly receiving him, that the deponent, as well as he could force himself, acting then the part of principal owner and a free captain of the ship, told Captain Amasa Delano, when called upon, that he came from Buenos Aires, bound to Lima, with three hundred negroes, that off Cape Horn, and in subsequent fever, many negroes had died, that also, by similar casualties, all the sea officers and the greatest part of the crew had died. And so the deposition goes on, circumstantially recounting the fictitious story dictated to the deponent by Babo, and through the deponent imposed upon Captain Delano, and also recounting the friendly officers of Captain Delano with other things, but all of which is here omitted. After the fictitious story, etc., the deposition proceeds. That the generous Captain Amasa Delano remained on board all the day till he left the ship anchored at six o'clock in the evening, deponent speaking to him always of his pretended misfortunes under the forementioned principles, without having had it in his power to tell a single word or give him the least hint that he might know the truth and state of things, because the negro babo, performing the office of officious servant with all the appearance of submission of the humble slave, did not leave the deponent one moment, that this was in order to observe the deponent's actions and words, for the negro babo understands well the Spanish, and besides, there were thereabout some others who were constantly on the watch, and likewise understood the Spanish that upon one occasion, while deponent was standing on the deck conversing with Amasa Delano, by a secret sign the negro babo drew him, the deponent, aside, the act appearing as if originating with the deponent, that then, he being drawn aside, the negro babo proposed to him to gain from Amasa Delano full particulars about his ship and crew and arms, that the deponent asked for what, that the negro babo answered he might conceive, that Grieved at the prospect of what might overtake the generous Captain Amasa Delano, the deponent at first refused to ask the desired questions, and used every argument to induce the negro babo to give up this new design, that the negro babo showed the point of his dagger, that after the information had been obtained the negro babo again drew him aside, telling him that that very night he, the deponent, would be captain of two ships, instead of one, for that great part of the American ship's crew being to be absent fishing, the six Ashantis, without any one else, would easily take it, that at this time he said other things to the same purpose, that no entreaties availed, that before Amasa's Delano's coming on board no hint had been given touching the capture of the American ship, that to prevent this project the deponent was powerless, that in some things his memory is confused, he cannot distinctly recall every event, that as soon as they had cast anchor at six of the clock in the evening, as has before been stated, the American captain took leave to return to his vessel, that upon a sudden impulse which the deponent believes to have come from God and his angels, he, after the farewell had been said, followed the generous Captain Amasa Delano as far as the gunwale, where he stayed, under pretense of taking leave, until Amasa Delano should have been seated in his boat, that on shoving off the deponent sprang from the gunwale into the boat and fell into it, he knows not how, God guarding him, that 
Here in the original follows the account of what further happened at the escape, and how the San Dominic was retaken, and of the passage to the coast, including in the recital many expressions of eternal gratitude to the generous Captain Amasa Delano. The deposition then proceeds with recapulatory remarks and a partial remuneration of the Negroes, making record of their individual part in the past events, with a view to furnishing, according to command of the court, the data whereon to found the criminal sentences to be pronounced. From this portion is the following. That he believes that all the Negroes, though not in the first place knowing to the design of revolt, when it was accomplished, approved it that the negro jose eighteen years old and in the personal service of don alejandro was the one who communicated the information to the negro babo about the state of things in the cabin before the revolt that this is known because in the preceding midnight he used to come from his berth which was under his master's in the cabin to the deck where the ringleader and his associates were and had secret conversations with the negro babo in which he was several times seen by the mate, that one night the mate drove him away twice, that this same Negro Jose was the one who, without being commanded to do so by the Negro Babo, as Lecpe and Martinki were, stabbed his master, Don Alejandro, after he had been dragged half lifeless to the deck, that the mulatto steward Francesco was of the first band of revolters, that he was in all things the creature and tool of the negro babo that to make his court he just before a repast in the cabin proposed to the negro babo poisoning a dish for the generous captain amasa delano this is known and believed because the negroes have said it but that the negro babo having another design forbade francesco that the ashanti lecpe was one of the worst of them for that on the day the ship was retaken, he assisted in the defense of her, with a hatchet in each hand, with one of which he wounded, in the breast, the chief mate of Amasa Delano, in the first act of boarding. This all knew, that in sight of the deponent, Lecpe struck, with a hatchet, Don Francisco Massa, when, by the negro babo's orders, he was carrying him to throw him overboard, alive, beside participating in the murder, before mentioned, of Don Alejandro Aranda, and others of the cabin passengers, that owing to the fury with which the Ashantis fought in the engagement with the boats, but this Lecpe and Jan survived, that Jan was bad as Lecpe, that Jan was the man who, by Babo's command, willingly prepared the skeleton of Don Alejandro, in a way the negroes afterwards told the deponent, but which he, so long as reason is left him, can never divulge. That Jan and Lecpe were the two who, in a calm by night, riveted the skeleton to the bow. This also the negroes told him, that the negro babo was he who traced the inscription below it, that the negro babo was the plotter from first to last. He ordered every murder, and was the helm and keel of the revolt that Atafal was his lieutenant in all. But Atafal, with his own hand, committed no murder, nor did the negro babo. That Atafal was shot, being killed in the fight with the boats, ere boarding. That the negresses of age were knowing to the revolt, and testified themselves satisfied at the death of their master, Don Alejandro. That, had the negroes not restrained them, they would have tortured to death, instead of simply killing, the Spaniards slain by command of the Negro Babo, that the negresses used their utmost influence to have the deponent made away with, that in the various acts of murder they sang songs and danced, not gaily but solemnly, and before the engagement with the boats, as well as during the action, they sang melancholy songs to the negroes and that this melancholy tone was more inflaming than a different one would have been, and was so intended. That all this is believed, because the negroes have said it. That of the thirty-six men of the crew, exclusive of the passengers, all of whom are now dead, which the deponent had knowledge of, six only remained alive, with four cabin-boys and ship-boys not included with the crew. 
that the negroes broke an arm of one of the cabin boys and gave him strokes with hatchets then follows various random disclosures referring to various periods of time the following are extracted that during the presence of captain amasa delano on board some attempts were made by the sailors and one by hermenegildo gandix to convey hints to him of the true state of affairs but that these attempts were ineffectual owing to fear of incurring death and furthermore owing to the devices which offered contradictions to the true state of affairs as well as owing to the generosity and piety of amasa delano incapable of sounding such wickedness that luis galgo a sailor about sixty years of age and formerly of the king's navy was one of those who sought to convey tokens to captain amasa delano but his intent though undiscovered being suspected he was on a pretense made to retire out of sight and at last into the hold and there was made away with this the negroes have since said that one of the ship boys feeling from captain amasa delano's presence some hopes of release and not having enough prudence dropped some chance word respecting his expectations which being overheard and understood by a slave boy with whom he was eating at the time the latter struck him on the head with a knife inflicting a bad wound but of which the boy is now healing that likewise not long before the ship was brought to anchor one of the seamen steering at the time endangered himself by letting the blacks remark some expression in his countenance arising from a cause similar to the above but this sailor by his heedful after conduct escaped that these statements are made to show the court that from the beginning to the end of the revolt it was impossible for the deponent and his men to act otherwise than they did that the third clerk hermenegildo gandix who before had been forced to live among the seamen wearing a seaman's habit and in all respects appearing to be one for the time he gandix was killed by a musket ball fired through mistake from the boats before boarding having in his fright run up the mizzen rigging calling to the boats don't board lest upon their boarding the negro should kill him that this inducing the americans to believe he some way favored the cause of the negroes they fired two balls at him so that he fell wounded from the rigging and was drowned in the sea that the young don joaquin marques de arambuelasa like hermenegildo gandix the third clerk was degraded to the office and appearance of a common seaman that upon one occasion when don joaquin shrank the negro babo commanded the ashanti lecbe to take tar and heat him and pour it upon don joaquin's hands that don joaquin was killed owing to another mistake of the americans but one impossible to be avoided as upon the approach of the boats don joaquin with a hatchet tied edge out and upright to his hand was made by the negroes to appear on the bulwarks whereupon seen with arms in his hands and in a questionable attitude he was shot for a renegade seaman that on the person of don joaquin was found secreted a jewel which by papers that were discovered proved to have been meant for the shrine of our lady of mercy in lima a votive offering beforehand prepared and guarded to attest his gratitude when he should have landed in peru his last destination for the safe conclusion of his entire voyage from spain that the jewel with the other effects of the late don joaquin is in the custody of the brethren of the hospital de sacerdotes awaiting the disposition of the honorable court that owing to the condition of the deponent as well as the haste in which the boats departed for the attack the americans were not forewarned that there were among the apparent crew a passenger and one of the clerks disguised by the negro babo that beside the negroes killed in the action some were killed after the capture and re-anchoring at night when shackled to the ring bolts on deck that these deaths were committed by the sailors ere they could be prevented that so soon as informed of it captain amasa delano used all his authority and in particular with his own hand struck down martinez gola who, having found a razor in the pocket of an old jacket of his, which one of the shackled negroes had on, was aiming it into the negro's throat. 
that the noble Captain Amasa Delano also wrenched from the hand of Bartholomew Barlo a dagger, secreted at the time of the massacre of the whites, with which he was in the act of stabbing a shackled negro, who, the same day, with another negro, had thrown him down and jumped upon him. That, for all the events befalling through so long a time, during which the ship was in the hands of the negro Babo, he cannot here give account, but that what he has said is the most substantial of what occurs to him at present, and is the truth under the oath which he has taken, which declaration he affirmed and ratified after hearing it read to him. He said that he is twenty-nine years of age, and broken in body and mind, that when finally dismissed by the court he shall not return home to Chile, but betake himself to the monastery on Mount Agonia without, and signed with his honor and crossed himself, and for the time departed as he came, in his litter, with a monk in Filez, to the hospital of sacerdotes. Benito Sereno, Dr. Rosas. If the deposition have served as the key to fit into the lock of the complications which precede it, then, as a vault whose door has been flung back, the San Dominic Hall lies open today. Hitherto the nature of this narrative, besides rendering the intricacies in the beginning unavoidable, has more or less required that many things, instead of being set down in the order of occurrence, should be retrospectively or irregularly given. This last is the case with the following passages, which will conclude the account. During the long, mild voyage to Lima, there was, as before hinted, a period during which the sufferer a little recovered his health, or at least in some degree his tranquillity. Ere the decided relapse which came, the two captains had many cordial conversations, their fraternal unreserve in singular contrast with former withdrawments. Again and again it was repeated how hard it had been to enact the part forced on the Spaniard by Babo. Ah, my dear friend, Don Benito once said, at those very times when you thought me so morose and ungrateful, nay, when, as you now admit, you half thought me plotting your murder, at those very times my heart was frozen. I could not look at you, thinking of what both on board this ship and your own hung from other hands over my kind benefactor. And as God lives, Don Amasa, I know not whether desire for my own safety alone could have nerved me to that leap into your boat, had it not been for the thought that, did you, unenlightened, return to your ship, you, my best friend, with all who might be with you, stolen upon that night, in your hammocks, would never in this world have wakened again. Do but think how you walked this deck, how you sat in this cabin, every inch of ground mined into honeycombs under you. Had I dropped the least hint, made the least advance towards an understanding between us, death, explosive death, yours as mine, would have ended the scene. True, true, cried Captain Delano, starting, you have saved my life, Don Benito, more than I yours. Saved it, too, against my knowledge and will. Nay, my friend, rejoined the Spaniard, courteous even to the point of religion. God charmed your life, but you saved mine. To think of some things you did, those smilings and chattings, rash pointings and gesturings. For less than these they slew my mate Ranads. But you had the Prince of Heaven's safe conduct through all ambuscades. Yes, all is owing to Providence, I know, but the temper of my mind that morning was more than commonly pleasant, while the sight of so much suffering more apparent than real added to my good nature, compassion, and charity, happily interweaving the three. Had it been otherwise, doubtless, as you hint, some of my interferences might have ended unhappily enough. Besides, those feelings I spoke of enabled me to get the better of momentary distrust at times when acuteness might have cost me my life without saving another's. Only at the end did my suspicions get the better of me, 
and you know how wide of the mark they then proved. Wide indeed, said Don Benito sadly. You were with me all day, stood with me, sat with me, talked with me, looked at me, ate with me, drank with me, and yet your last act was to clutch for a monster, not only an innocent man, but the most pitiable of all men. To such degree may malign machinations and deceptions impose. So far may even the best man err in judging the conduct of one with the recesses of whose condition he is not acquainted, but you were forced to it, and you were in time undeceived. Would that in both respects it was so ever, and with all men. You generalize, Don Benito, and mournfully enough, but the past is past. Why moralize upon it? Forget it. See, yon bright sun has forgotten it all, and the blue sea and the blue sky, these have turned over new leaves. Because they have no memory, he dejectedly replied, because they are not human. But these mild trades that now fan your cheek, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? Warm friends, steadfast friends, are the trades. With their steadfastness they but waft me to my tomb, senor, was the foreboding response. You are saved, cried Captain Delano, more and more astonished and pained. You are saved. What has cast such a shadow upon you? The negro. There was silence, while the moody man sat, slowly and unconsciously gathering his mantle about him, as if it were a pall. There was no more conversation that day. But if the Spaniard's melancholy sometimes ended in muteness upon topics like the above, there were others upon which he never spoke at all, on which, indeed, all his old reserves were piled, pass over the worst, and, only to elucidate, let an item or two of these be cited. The dress, so precise and costly, worn by him on the day whose events have been narrated, had not willingly been put on, and that silver-mounted sword, apparent symbol of despotic command, was not indeed a sword, but a ghost of one. The scabbard, artificially stiffened, was empty. As for the black whose brain, not body, had schemed and led the revolt with the plot, his slight frame, inadequate to that which it held, had at once yielded to the superior muscular strength of his captor in the boat. Seeing all was over, he uttered no sound, and could not be forced to. His aspect seemed to say, since I cannot do deeds, I will not speak words. But in irons, in the hold, with the rest, he was carried to Lima. During the passage Don Benito did not visit him, nor then, nor at any time after, would he look at him. Before the tribunal he refused. When pressed by the judges, he fainted. On the testimony of the sailors alone rested the legal identity of Babo. Some months after, dragged to the gibbet at the tail of a mule, the black met his voiceless end. The body was burned to ashes, but for many days the head, that hive of subtlety, fixed on a pole in the plaza met, unabashed, the gaze of the whites, and across the plaza looked towards St. Bartholomew's church, in whose vaults slept then, as now, the recovered bones of Aranda, and across the Rimac Bridge looked towards the monastery on Mount Agonia without, where, three months after being dismissed by the court, Benito Sereno, born on the bier, did, indeed, follow his leader. End of section 7 and end of Benito Sereno. The Lightning Rod Man. What grand, irregular thunder, thought I, standing on my hearthstone among the Acroceronian hills, as the scattered bolts boomed overhead and crashed down among the valleys, every bolt followed by zigzag irradiations and swift slants of sharp rain, which audibly rang like a charge of spear-points 
on my low shingled roof. I suppose, though, that the mountains hereabouts break and churn up the thunder so that it is far more glorious here than on the plain. Hark! Someone at the door. Who is this that chooses a time of thunder for making calls? And why don't he, man-fashion, use the knocker, instead of making that doleful undertaker's clatter with his fist against the hollow panel? But let him in. Ah, here he comes. Good day, sir, an entire stranger. Pray be seated. What is that strange-looking walking-stick he carries? A fine thunderstorm, sir. Fine? Awful! You are wet. Stand here on the hearth before the fire. Not for worlds. The stranger still stood in the exact middle of the cottage where he had first planted himself. His singularity impelled a closer scrutiny. A lean, gloomy figure, hair dark and lank, mattedly streaked over his brow. His sunken pitfalls of eyes were ringed by indigo halos, and played with an innocuous sort of lightning, the gleam without the bolt. The whole man was dripping. He stood in a puddle on the bare oak floor, his strange walking-stick vertically resting at his side. It was a polished copper rod, four feet long, lengthwise attached to a neat wooden staff, by insertion into two balls of greenish glass, ringed with copper bands. The metal rod terminated at the top, tripod-wise, in three keen tines, brightly gilt. He held the thing by the wooden part alone. Sir, said I, bowing politely, have I the honor of a visit from that illustrious god, Jupiter Tonans? So stood he in the Greek statue of old, grasping the lightning bolt. If you be he, or his viceroy, I have to thank you for this noble storm you have brewed among our mountains. Listen, that was a glorious peal. Ah, to a lover of the majestic, it is a good thing to have the thunderer himself in one's cottage. The thunder grows finer for that. But pray be seated. This old rush-bottomed armchair, I grant, is a poor substitute for your evergreen throne on Olympus, but condescend to be seated. While I thus pleasantly spoke, the stranger eyed me, half in wonder and half in a strange sort of horror, but did not move a foot. Do, sir, be seated. You need to be dried ere going forth again. I planted the chair invitingly on the broad hearth, where a little fire had been kindled that afternoon to dissipate the dampness, not the cold, for it was early in the month of September. But without heeding my solicitation, and still standing in the middle of the floor, the stranger gazed at me pretentiously and spoke. Sir, said he, excuse me, but instead of my accepting your invitation to be seated on the hearth there, I solemnly warn you that you had best accept mine and stand with me in the middle of the room. Good heavens, he cried, starting, there is another of those awful crashes. I warn you, sir, quit the hearth. Mr. Jupiter Tonans, said I, quietly rolling my body on the stone, I stand very well here. Are you so horridly ignorant, then, he cried, as not to know that by far the most dangerous part of a house during such a terrific tempest as this is the fireplace? Nay, I did not know that, involuntarily stepping upon the first board next to the stone. The stranger now assumed such an unpleasant air of successful admonition that, quite involuntarily again, I stepped back upon the hearth, and threw myself into the erectest, proudest posture I could command. But I said nothing. "'For heaven's sake!' he cried, with a strange mixture of alarm and intimidation. "'For heaven's sake, get off the hearth! Know you not that the heated air and soot are conductors?' to say nothing of those immense iron fire-dogs. Quit the spot, I conjure. I command you. Mr. Jupiter Tonans, I am not accustomed to be commanded in my own house. Call me not by that pagan name. You are profane in this time of terror. Sir, will you be so good as to tell me your business? 
if you seek shelter from the storm you are welcome so long as you be civil but if you come on business open it forthwith who are you i am a dealer in lightning rods said the stranger softening his tone my special business is merciful heavens what a crash have you ever been struck your premises i mean no it's best to be provided significantly rattling his metallic staff on the floor by nature there are no castles in thunderstorms yet say but the word and of this cottage i can make a gibraltar by a few waves of this wand hark what himalayas of concussions you interrupt yourself your special business you were about to speak of my special business is to travel the country for orders for lightning rods this is my specimen rod tapping his staff i have the best of references fumbling in his pockets in cricken last month i put up three and twenty rods on only five buildings let me see was it not at cricken last week about midnight on saturday that the steeple the big elm and the assembly room cupola were struck any of your rods there not on the tree and cupola but the steeple of what use is your rod then of life and death use but my workman was heedless in fitting the rod at top to the steeple he allowed a part of the metal to graze the tin sheeting hence the accident not my fault but his hark never mind that clap burst quite loud enough to be heard without finger pointing did you hear of the event at montreal last year a servant girl struck at her bedside with a rosary in her hand the beads being metal does your beat extend into the canadas no and i hear that there iron rods only are in use they should have mine which are copper iron is easily fused then they draw out the rod so slender that it has not body enough to conduct the full electric current the metal melts the building is destroyed my copper rods never act so those canadians are fools some of them knob the rod at the top which risks a deadly explosion instead of imperceptibly carrying down the current into the earth as this sort of rod does mine is the only true rod look at it only one dollar a foot this abuse of your own calling in another might make one distrustful with respect to yourself hark the thunder becomes less muttering it is nearing us and nearing the earth too hark one crammed crash all the vibrations made one by nearness another flash hold what do you do i said seeing him now instantaneously relinquishing his staff lean intently forward towards the window with his right fore and middle fingers on his left wrist but ere the words had well escaped me another exclamation escaped him crash only three pulses less than a third of a mile off yonder somewhere in that wood i passed three stricken oaks there ripped out new and glittering the oak draws lightning more than other timber having iron in solution in its sap your floor here seems oak heart of oak from the peculiar time of your call upon me i suppose you purposely select stormy weather for your journeys when the thunder is roaring you deem it an hour peculiarly favorable for producing impressions favorable to your trade hark awful for one who would arm others with fear you seem unbeseemingly timorous yourself common men choose fair weather for their travels you choose thunderstorms and yet that i travel in thunderstorms i grant but not without particular precautions such as only a lightning-rod man may know hark quick look at my specimen rod only one dollar a foot a very fine rod i dare say but what are these particular precautions of yours yet first let me close yonder shutters the slanting rain is beating through the sash i will bar up are you mad 
Know you not that yon iron bar is a swift conductor? Desist. I will simply close the shutters then and call my boy to bring me a wooden bar. Pray touch the bell pull there. Are you frantic? That bell wire might blast you. Never touch bell wire in a thunderstorm, nor ring a bell of any sort. Nor those in belfries? Pray will you tell me where and how one may be safe in a time like this? Is there any part of my house I may touch with hopes of my life? There is, but not where you now stand. Come away from the wall. The current will sometimes run down a wall, and, a man being a better conductor than a wall, it would leave the wall and run into him. Swoop! That must have fallen very nigh. That must have been globular lightning. Very probably. Tell me at once which is, in your opinion, the safest part of this house. This room, and this one spot in it where I stand. Come hither. The reasons first. Hark! After the flash, the gust. The sashes shiver. The house. The house. Come hither to me. The reasons, if you please. Come hither to me. Thank you again. I think I will try my old stand, the hearth. And now, Mr. Lightning Rod Man, in the pauses of the thunder, be so good as to tell me your reasons for esteeming this one room of the house the safest, and your own one standpoint there the safest spot in it. There was now a little cessation of the storm for a while. The Lightning Rod Man seemed relieved and replied, your house is a one-storied house with an attic and a cellar. This room is between, hence its comparative safety. Because lightning sometimes passes from the clouds to the earth, and sometimes from the earth to the clouds, do you comprehend? And I choose the middle of the room because if the lightning should strike the house at all, it would come down the chimney or walls so obviously the further you are from them the better come hither to me now presently something you just said instead of alarming me has strangely inspired confidence what have i said you said that sometimes lightning flashes from the earth to the clouds ay the returning stroke as it is called when the earth being overcharged with the fluid flashes its surplus upward the returning stroke, that is, from earth to sky. Better and better. But come here on the hearth and dry yourself. I am better here, and better wet. How? It is the safest thing you can do. Hark, again, to get yourself thoroughly drenched in a thunderstorm. Wet clothes are better conductors than the body and so, if the lightning strike, it might pass down the wet clothes without touching the body. The storm deepens again. Have you a rug in the house? Rugs are non-conductors. Get one, that I may stand on it here, and you too. The skies blacken. It is dusk at noon. Hark! The rug! The rug! I gave him one, while the hooded mountain seemed closing and tumbling into the cottage. And now, since our being dumb will not help us, said I, resuming my place, let me hear your precautions in traveling during thunderstorms. Wait till this one is past. Nay, proceed with the precautions. You stand in the safest possible place according to your own account. Go on. Briefly, then, I avoid pine trees, high houses, lonely barns, upland pastures, running water, flocks of cattle and sheep, a crowd of men. If I travel on foot, as today, I do not walk fast. If in my buggy, I touch not its back or sides. If on horseback, I dismount and lead the horse. But of all things, I avoid tall men. Do I dream? Man avoid man? And in danger time, too? Tall men, in a thunderstorm I avoid. Are you so grossly ignorant as not to know that the height of a six-footer is sufficient to discharge an electric cloud upon him? Are not lonely Kentuckians, plowing, smith in the unfinished furrow? 
nay, if the six-footer stand by running water, the cloud will sometimes select him as its conductor to that running water. Hark! Sure young black pinnacle is split. Yes, a man is a good conductor. The lightning goes through and through a man, but only peels a tree. But, sir, you have kept me so long answering your questions that I have not yet come to business. Will you order one of my rods? Look at this specimen one. See, it is of the best of copper. Copper is the best conductor. Your house is low, but being upon the mountains, that lowness does not one whit depress it. You mountaineers are most exposed. In mountainous countries the lightning-rod man should have most business. Look at the specimen, sir. One rod will answer for a house so small as this. Look over these recommendations. Only one rod, sir. Cost only twenty dollars. Hark! There go all the granite taconics and hoosics dashed together like pebbles. By the sound that must have struck something. An elevation of five feet above the house will protect twenty feet radius all about the rod. Only twenty dollars, sir. A dollar a foot. Hark! Dreadful! Will you order? Will you buy? Shall I put down your name? Think of being a heap of charred offal, like a haltered horse burnt in his stall, and all in one flash. You pretended envoy extraordinary, and minister plenipotentiary, to and from Jupiter Tonans, laughed I. You mere man who come here to put you and your pipe-stem between clay and sky, do you think that because you can strike a bit of green light from the laden jar that you can thoroughly avert the supernal bolt? Your rod rusts or breaks, and where are you? Who has empowered you, you Tetzel, to peddle round your indulgences from divine ordinations? The hairs of our heads are numbered, and the days of our lives. In thunder, as in sunshine, I stand at ease in the hands of my God. False negotiator, away! See the scroll of the storm is rolled back, the house is unharmed, and in the blue heavens I read in the rainbow that the deity will not of purpose make war on man's earth. Impious wretch, foamed the stranger, blackening in the face as the rainbow beamed, I will publish your infidel notions. The scowl grew blacker on his face. The indigo circles enlarged round his eyes as the storm rings round the midnight moon. He sprang upon me, his tri-forked thing at my heart. I seized it. I snapped it. I dashed it. I trod it, and dragging the dark lightning king out of my door, flung his elbowed copper scepter after him. But, spite of my treatment, and spite of my dissuasive talk of him to my neighbors, the lightning-rod man still dwells in the land, still travels in storm-time, and drives a brave trade with the fears of man. End of section 8. The Lightning-Rod Man. The Isles at Large. That may not be, said then the ferryman, least we unweeting hapt to be fordoon, for those same islands seeming now and then are not firm land, nor any certain one, uh, but straggling plots which to and fro do roan in the wide waters. Therefore are they height the wandering islands, therefore do them shone, for they have oft drawn many a wandering wight into most deadly danger and distressed plight, for so whoever once hath fastened his foot thereon may never it secure, but wandereth evermore uncertain and unsure. Dark, doleful, dreary, like a greedy grave that still for carrion carcasses doth crave, on top whereof I dwelt, the ghastly owl shrieking his baleful note, which ever drave far from that haunt all other cheerful fowl, and all about it wandering ghosts did wail and howl. 
take five and twenty heaps of cinders dumped here and there in an outside city lot. Imagine some of them magnified into mountains, and the vacant lot the sea, and you will have a fit idea of the general aspect of the Encantadas, or Enchanted Isles. A group rather of extinct volcanoes than of isles, looking much as the world at large might after a penal conflagration. It is to be doubted whether any spot of earth can, in desolateness, furnish a parallel to this group. Abandoned cemeteries of long ago, old cities by piecemeal tumbling to their ruin, these are melancholy enough, but like all else which has but once been associated with humanity, they still awaken in us some thoughts of sympathy, however sad. Hence, even the Dead Sea, along with whatever other emotions it may at times inspire, does not fail to touch in the pilgrim some of his less unpleasurable feelings. And as for solitariness, the great forests of the north, the expanses of unnavigated waters, the Greenland ice-fields, are the profoundest of solitudes to a human observer, still the magic of their changeable tides and seasons mitigates their terror, because, though unvisited by men, those forests are visited by the May. The remotest seas reflect familiar stars even as Lake Erie does, and in the clear air of a fine polar day the irradiated azure ice shows beautifully as malachite. But the special curse, as one may call it, of the Encantadas, that which exalts them in desolation above Idumea and the Pole, is that to them change never comes, neither the change of seasons nor of sorrows. Cut by the equator, they know not autumn, and they know not spring, while already reduced to the lees of fire, ruin itself can work little more upon them. The showers refresh the deserts, but in these isles rain never falls. Like split Syrian gourds left withering in the sun, they are cracked by an everlasting drought beneath a torrid sky. Have mercy upon me, the wailing spirit of the Encantada seems to cry, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Another feature in these isles is their emphatic uninhabitableness. It is deemed a fit type of all-forsaken overthrow that the jackal should den in the wastes of weedy Babylon, but the Encantadas refuse to harbor even the outcasts of the beasts. Man and wolf alike disown them. Little but reptile life is here found. Tortoises, lizards, immense spiders, snakes, and that strangest anomaly of outlandish nature, the aguano. No voice, no low, no howl is heard. The chief sound of life here is a hiss. On most of the isles where vegetation is found at all, it is more ungrateful than the blankness of Atacama. Tangled thickets of wiry bushes, without fruit and without a name, springing up among deep fissures of calcined rock and treacherously masking them, or a parched growth of distorted cactus trees. In many places the coast is rock-bound, or more properly clinker-bound, tumbled masses of blackish or greenish stuff like the dross of an iron furnace, forming dark clefts and caves here and there, into which a ceaseless sea pours a fury of foam. Overhanging them with a swirl of gray, haggard mist, amidst which sail screaming flights of unearthly birds heightening the dismal din. However calm the sea without, there is no rest for these swells and those rocks. They lash and are lashed, even when the outer ocean is most at peace with itself. On the oppressive, clouded days, such as are peculiar to this part of the watery equator, the dark, vitrified masses, 
many of which raise themselves among white whirlpools and breakers in detached and perilous places off the shore, present a most Plutonian sight. In no world but a fallen one could such lands exist. Those parts of the strand free from the marks of fire stretch away in wide level beaches of multitudinous dead shells, with here and there decayed bits of sugar-cane, bamboos, and coconuts, washed upon this other and darker world from the charming palm isles to the westward and southward, all the way from paradise to Tartarus, while mixed with the relics of distant beauty you will sometimes see fragments of charred wood and moldering ribs of wrecks. Neither will any one be surprised at meeting these last, after observing the conflicting currents which eddy throughout nearly all the wide channels of the entire group. The capriciousness of the tides of air sympathizes with those of the sea. Nowhere is the wind so light, baffling, and every way unreliable, and so given to perplexing calms as at the Encantadas. Nigh a month has been spent by a ship going from one isle to another, though but ninety miles between, for owing to the force of the current the boats employed to tow barely suffice to keep the craft from sweeping upon the cliffs, but do nothing towards accelerating her voyage. Sometimes it is impossible for a vessel from afar to fetch up with the group itself, unless large allowances for prospective leeway have been made ere its coming in sight. And yet, at other times, there is a mysterious indraft which irresistibly draws a passing vessel among the isles, though not bound to them. True, at one period, as to some extent at the present day, large fleets of whalemen cruised for spermaceti upon what some seamen call the enchanted ground. But this, as in due place will be described, was off the great outer isle of Albemarle, away from the intricacies of the smaller isles, where there is plenty of sea-room, and hence to that vicinity the above remarks do not altogether apply, though even there the current runs at times with singular force, shifting too with as singular a caprice. Indeed there are seasons when currents quite unaccountable prevail for a great distance round about the total group, and are so strong and irregular as to change a vessel's course against the helm, though sailing at the rate of four or five miles the hour. The difference in the reckonings of navigators produced by these causes, along with the light and variable winds, long nourished a persuasion that there existed two distinct clusters of isles in the parallel of the Encantadas, about a hundred leagues apart. Such was the idea of their earlier visitors, the buccaneers, and as late as 1750, the charts of that part of the Pacific accorded with the strange delusion, and this apparent fleetingness and unreality of the locality of the isles was most probably one reason for the Spaniards calling them the Encantada, or Enchanted Group. But not uninfluenced by their character, as they now confessedly exist, the modern voyager will be inclined to fancy that the bestowal of this name might have in part originated in that air of spellbound desertness which so significantly invests the isles. Nothing can better suggest the aspect of once living things malignly crumbled from ruddiness into ashes. Apples of Sodom, after touching, seem these isles. However wavering their place may seem by reason of the currents, they themselves, at least to one upon the shore, appear invariably the same, fixed, cast, glued into the very body of cadaverous death. Nor would the appellation, enchanted, seem misapplied in still another sense, for concerning the peculiar reptile inhabitant of these wilds, whose presence gives the group its second Spanish name, Gallipagos, concerning the tortoises found here, most mariners have long cherished a superstition not more frightful than grotesque. 
they earnestly believe that all wicked sea officers, more especially commodores and captains, are at death, and in some cases before death, transformed into tortoises, thenceforth dwelling upon these hot aridities, so solitary lords of asphaltum. Doubtless so quaintly dolorous a thought was originally inspired by the woe-begone landscape itself, but more particularly perhaps by the tortoises, for apart from their strictly physical features, there is something strangely self-condemned in the appearance of these creatures. Lasting sorrow and penal hopelessness are in no animal form so suppliantly expressed as in theirs, while the thought of their wonderful longevity does not fail to enhance the impression. Nor even at the risk of meriting the change of absurdly believing in enchantments can I restrain the admission that sometimes, even now, when leaving the crowded city to wander out July and August among the Adirondack Mountains, far from the influences of towns and proportionally nigh to the mysterious ones of nature, when at such times I sit me down in the mossy head of some deep-wooded gorge, surrounded by prostrate trunks of blasted pines, and recall, as in a dream, my other and far distant rovings in the baked heart of the charmed isles, and remember the sudden glimpses of dusky shells and long languid necks protruded from the leafless thickets, and again have beheld the vitreous inland rocks worn down and grooved into deep ruts by ages and ages of the slow draggings of tortoises in quest of pools of scanty water. I can hardly resist the feeling that in my time I have indeed slept upon evilly enchanted ground. Nay, such is the vividness of my memory, or the magic of my fancy, that I know not whether I am not the occasional victim of optical delusion concerning the Gallipagos. For often in scenes of social merriment, and especially at revels held by candlelight in old-fashioned mansions, so that shadows are thrown into the further recesses of an angular and spacious room, making them put on a look of haunted undergrowth of lonely woods, I have drawn the attention of my comrades by my fixed gaze and sudden change of air, as I have seemed to see, slowly emerging from those imagined solitudes, and heavily crawling along the floor, the ghost of a gigantic tortoise, with memento blank, burning in live letters upon his back. End of section 9, The Encantadas, sketch first, The Isles at Large. Two Sides to a Tortoise Most ugly shapes and horrible aspects, such as Dame Nature self-mote fear to see, or shame, that ever should so foul defects from her most cunning hand escaped be, all dreadful portraits of deformity. No wonder if these do a man appall, for all that here at home we dreadful hold be but as bugs to fearin' babes withal, compared to the creatures in these isles and trawl. Fear not, then said the palmer, a well avised, for these same monsters are not there indeed, but are into these fearful shapes disguised and lifting up his virtuous staff on high, then all that dreadful army fast can fly into great Zethi's bosom, where they hidden lie. In view of the description given, may one be gay upon the Encantadas? Yes, that is, find one the gaiety, and he will be gay. And, indeed, sac cloth and ashes as they are, the isles are not perhaps unmitigated gloom, for while no spectator can deny their claims to a most solemn and superstitious consideration, no more than my firmest resolutions can decline to behold the spectre tortoise when emerging from its shadowy recess, yet even 
The tortoise, dark and melancholy as it is upon the back, still possesses a bright side, its calipi or breastplate being sometimes of a faint yellowish or golden tinge. Moreover, everyone knows that tortoises, as well as turtle, are of such a make that if you but put them on their backs you thereby expose their bright sides without the possibility of their recovering themselves and turning into view the other. But after you have done this, and because you have done this, you should not swear that the tortoise has a dark side. Enjoy the bright. Keep it turned up perpetually if you can, but be honest, and don't deny the black. Neither should he who cannot turn the tortoise from its natural position so as to hide the darker and expose his livelier aspect, like a Greek October pumpkin in the sun, for that cause declare the creature to be one total inky blot. The tortoise is both black and bright. But let us to particulars. Some months before my first stepping ashore upon the group, my ship was cruising in its close vicinity. One noon we found ourselves off the south head of Albemarle, and not very far from the land, partly by way of freak and partly by way of spying out so strange a country, a boat's crew was sent ashore with orders to see all they could, and besides bring back whatever tortoises they could conveniently transport. It was after sunset when the adventurers returned. I looked down over the ship's high side as if looking down over the curb of a well, and dimly saw the damp boat deep in the sea with some unwanted weight. Ropes were dropped over, and presently three huge antediluvian-looking tortoises, after much straining, were landed on deck. They seemed hardly of the seed of earth. We had been broad upon the waters for five long months, a period amply sufficient to make all things of the land wear a fabulous hue to the dreamy mind. Had three Spanish custom-house officers boarded us then, it is not unlikely that I should have curiously stared at them, felt of them, and stroked them much as savages serve civilized guests. But instead of three custom-house officers, behold these really wondrous tortoises, none of your schoolboy mud-turtles, but black as widower's weeds, heavy as chests of plate, with vast shells, medallioned and orbed like shields, and dented and blistered like shields that have breasted a battle, shaggy, too, here and there, with dark green moss, and slimy with the spray of the sea. These mystic creatures, suddenly translated by night from unutterable solitudes to our peopled deck, affected me in a manner not easy to unfold. They seemed newly crawled forth from beneath the foundations of the world. Yea, they seemed the identical tortoises whereon the Hindu plants this total sphere. With a lantern I inspected them more closely. Such a worshipful venerableness of aspect! such furry greenness mantling the rude peelings and healing the fissures of their shattered shells. I no more saw three tortoises. They expanded, became transfigured. I seemed to see three Roman coliseums in magnificent decay. Ye oldest inhabitants of this or any other isle, said I, Pray give me the freedom of your three-walled towns. The great feeling inspired by these creatures was that of age, dateless, indefinite endurance, and, in fact, that any other creature can live and breathe as long as the tortoises of the Encantadas, I will not readily believe. Not to hint of their known capacity of sustaining life, while going without food for an entire year, Consider that impregnable armor of their living male. What other bodily being possesses such a citadel wherein to resist the assaults of time? As lantern in hand I scraped among the moss and beheld the ancient scars of bruises received in many a sullen fall among the marly mountains of the isle, scars strangely widened, swollen, 
half obliterate, and yet distorted like those sometimes found in the bark of very hoary trees, I seemed an antiquary of a geologist, studying the bird tracks and ciphers upon the exhumed slates trod by incredible creatures whose very ghosts are now defunct. As I lay in my hammock that night, overhead I heard the slow, weary draggings of the three ponderous strangers along the encumbered deck. Their stupidity, or their resolution, was so great that they never went aside for any impediment. One ceased his movements altogether just before the mid-watch. At sunrise I found him butted like a battering ram against the immovable foot of the foremast, and still striving, tooth and nail, to force the impossible passage. That these tortoises are the victims of a penal or malignant or perhaps a downright diabolical enchanter seems in nothing more likely than in that strange infatuation of hopeless toil which so often possesses them. I have known them in their journeyings ram themselves heroically against rocks, and long abide there nudging, wriggling, wedging, in order to displace them, and so hold on their inflexible path. Their crowning curse is their drudging impulse to straightforwardness in a belittered world. Meeting with no such hindrance as their companion did, the other tortoises merely fell foul of small stumbling blocks, buckets, blocks, and coils of rigging, and at times in the act of crawling over them would slip with an astounding rattle to the deck. Listening to these draggings and concussions, I thought me of the haunt from which they came, an isle full of metallic ravines and gulches, sunk bottomlessly into the hearts of splintered mountains, and covered for many miles with inextricable thickets. I then pictured these three straightforward monsters, century after century, writhing through the shades, grim as blacksmiths, crawling so slowly and ponderously that not only did toadstools and all fungus things grow beneath their feet, but a sooty moss sprouted upon their backs. With them I lost myself in volcanic mazes, brushed away endless boughs of rotting thickets, till finally in a dream I found myself sitting cross-legged upon the foremost, a Brahmin similarly mounted upon either side, forming a tripod of foreheads which upheld the universal cope. Such was the wild nightmare begot by my first impression of the Encantada's tortoise. But next evening, strange to say, I sat down with my shipmates and made a merry repast from tortoise steaks and tortoise stews, and, supper over, out knife and helped convert the three mighty concave shells into three fanciful soup terrines and polish the three flat yellowish calipes into three gorgeous salvers. End of section 10. The Encatas sketch 2. Two sides to a tortoise. Rock Rodondo. For they this tight, the rock of vile reproach, a dangerous and dreadful place, to which nor fish nor fowl did once approach, but yelling meows with seagulls, whores, and base, and cormorants with birds of ravenous race, which still sit waiting on that dreadful cliff. With that the rolling sea resounding soft in his big bass them fitly answered, and on the rock the waves breaking aloft, a solemn inane unto them measured. Then he the boatman bade row easily, and let him hear some part of that rare melody. Suddenly an innumerable flight of harmful fowls about them fluttering cried, and with their wicked wings them oft did smite and sore annoyed, groping in that grisly night. Even all the nation of unfortunate and fatal birds about them flocked were. To go up into a high stone tower is not only a very fine thing in itself, but the very best mode of gaining a comprehensive view of the region round about, 
It is all the better if this tower stands solitary and alone, like that mysterious Newport one, or else be sole survivor of some perished castle. Now, with reference to the Enchanted Isles, we are fortunately supplied with just such a noble point of observation in a remarkable rock, from its peculiar figure called of old by the Spaniards Roque Rodondo, or Round Rock, some two hundred and fifty feet high, rising straight from the sea ten miles from land, with the whole mountainous group to the south and east. Roque Rotondo occupies, on a large scale, very much the position which the famous Campanile, or detached bell tower of St. Mark, does with respect to the tangled group of hoary edifices around it. Ere ascending, however, to gaze abroad upon the Encantadas, this sea tower itself claims attention. It is visible at the distance of thirty miles, and fully participating in that enchantment which pervades the group when first seen afar invariably is mistaken for a sail. Four leagues away, of a golden hazy noon, it seems some Spanish admiral's ship, stacked up with glittering canvas, sail ho, sail ho, sail ho, from all three masts. But coming nigh, the enchanted frigate is transformed apace into a craggy keep. My first visit to the spot was made in the gray of the morning. With a view of fishing, we had lowered three boats, and, pulling some two miles from our vessel, found ourselves just before dawn of day close under the moon-shadow of Rodondo. Its aspect was heightened, and yet softened, by the strange double twilight of the hour. The great full moon burnt in the low west like a half-spent beacon, casting a soft mellow tinge upon the sea like that cast by a waning fire of embers upon a midnight hearth, while along the entire east the invisible sun sent pallid intimations of his coming. The wind was light, the waves languid, the stars twinkled with faint effulgence, all nature seemed supine with a long night watch, and half suspended in jaded expectation of the sun. This was the critical hour to catch Rodondo in his perfect mood. The twilight was just enough to reveal every striking point without tearing away the dim vestiture of wonder. From a broken stair-like base, washed as the steps of a water-palace by the waves, the tower rose in entablatures of strata to a shaven summit. These uniform layers, which compose the mass, form its most peculiar feature, for at their lines of junction they project flatly into encircling shelves from top to bottom, rising one above another in graduated series. And as the eaves of any old barn or abbey are alive with swallows, so were all these rocky ledges with unnumbered sea-fowl, eaves upon eaves, and nests upon nests. Here and there were long bird-lime streaks of ghostly white staining the tower from sea to air, readily accounting for its sail-like look afar. All would have been bewitchingly quiescent, were it not for the demoniac din created by the birds. Not only were the eaves rustling with them, but they flew densely overhead, spreading themselves into a winged and continually shifting canopy. The tower is the resort of aquatic birds for hundreds of leagues around. To the north, to the east, to the west, stretches nothing but eternal ocean, so that the man-of-war hawk coming from the coasts of North America, Polynesia, or Peru, makes his first land at Rodondo. And yet, though Rodondo be terra firma, no land bird ever lighted on it. Fancy a red robin, or a canary there. What a falling into the hands of the Philistines, when the poor warbler should be surrounded by such locust flights of strong bandit birds, with long bills cruel as daggers. I know not where one can better study the natural history of strange sea-fowl than at Rodondo. It is the aviary of ocean. Birds light here which never touched mast or tree, hermit-birds which ever fly alone, 
cloud-birds familiar with unpierced zones of air. Let us first glance low down to the lowermost shelf of all, which is the widest, too, and but a little space from high watermark. What outlandish beings are these? Erect as men, but hardly as symmetrical, they stand all round the rock like sculptured caryatids, supporting the next range of eaves above. Their bodies are grotesquely misshapen, their bills short, their feet seemingly legless, while the members at their sides are neither fin, wing, nor arm, and truly neither fish, flesh, nor fowl is the penguin, as an edible pertaining neither to carnival nor lent, without exception the most ambiguous and least lovely creature yet discovered by man though dabbling in all three elements and indeed possessing some rudimental claims to all the penguin is at home in none on land it stumps afloat it skulls in the air it flops as if ashamed of her failure nature keeps this ungainly child hidden away at the ends of the earth in the straits of magellan and on the abased sea story of rodondo but look what are yon woebegone regiments drawn up on the next shelf above? What rank and file of large strange fowl? What sea friars of orders gray? Pelicans. Their elongated bills and heavy leathern pouches suspended thereto give them the most lugubrious expression. A pensive race, they stand for hours together without motion. Their dull, ashy plumage imparts an aspect as if they had been powdered over with cinders. A penitential bird, indeed, fitly haunting the shores of the clinkered encantadas, whereon tormented Job himself might have well sat down and scraped himself with potsherds. Higher up now we mark the goni or gray albatross, anomalously so called, an unsightly unpoetic bird unlike its storied kinsman, which is the snow-white ghost of the haunted capes of Hope and Horn. As we still ascend from shelf to shelf we find the tenants of the tower serially disposed in order of their magnitude. Gannets, black and speckled haglets, jays, sea-hens, sperm-whale-birds, gulls of all varieties, thrones, princedoms, powers dominating one above another in senatorial array, while sprinkled over all, like an ever-repeated fly in a great piece of broidery, the stormy petrel or Mother Carey's chicken sounds his continual challenge and alarm, that this mysterious hummingbird of ocean, which, had it but brilliancy of hue, might, from its evanescent liveliness, be almost called its butterfly, yet whose chirrup under the stern is ominous to mariners as to the peasant the death-tick sounding from behind the chimney-jam, should have its special haunt at the Encantadas contributes, in the seaman's mind, not a little to their dreary spell. As day advances, the dissonant din augments. With ear-splitting cries, the wild birds celebrate their matins. Each moment, flights push from the tower and join the aerial choir hovering overhead while their places below are supplied by darting myriads but down through all this discord of commotion i hear clear silver bugle-like notes unbrokenly falling like oblique lines of swift slanting rain in a cascading shower I gaze far up and behold a snow-white angelic thing with one long lance-like feather thrust out behind. It is the bright, inspiriting chanticleer of ocean, the beauteous bird, from its bestirring whistle of musical invocation, fitly styled the boatswain's mate. The winged, life-clouding Rodondo had its full counterpart in the finny hosts which peopled the waters at its base. Below the waterline the rock seemed one honeycomb of grottoes, affording labyrinthine lurking-places for swarms of fairy fish. All were strange, many exceedingly beautiful, 
and would have well graced the costliest glass globes in which goldfish are kept for a show. Nothing was more striking than the complete novelty of many individuals of this multitude. Here hues were seen as yet unpainted, and figures which are unengraved. To show the multitude, avidity, and nameless fearlessness and tameness of these fish, let me say that often, marking through clear spaces of water, temporarily made so by the concentric dartings of the fish above the surface, certain larger and less unwary whites, which swam slow and deep, our anglers would cautiously essay to drop their lines down to these last but in vain. There was no passing the uppermost zone. No sooner did the hook touch the sea than a hundred infatuates contended for the honor of capture. Poor fish of Rotondo! In your victimized confidence you are of the number of those who inconsiderately trust, while they do not understand, human nature. But the dawn is now fairly day, band after band, the sea-fowls sail away to forage the deep for their food. The tower is left solitary, save the fish-caves at its base. Its bird-lime gleams in the golden rays like the whitewash of a tall lighthouse, or the lofty sails of a cruiser. This moment, doubtless, while we know it to be a dead desert rock, other voyagers are taking oaths it is a glad populous ship. But ropes now, and let us ascend. Yet soft, this is not so easy. End of section 11, the A Pisca View from the Rock That done, he leads him to the highest mount, from whence far off he unto him did show. If you seek to ascend Rock Rodondo, take the following prescription. Go three voyages round the world as a main royal man of the tallest frigate that floats, then serve a year or two apprenticeship to the guides who conduct strangers up the peak of Tenerife, and as many more respectively to a rope dancer, an Indian juggler, and a chamois. This done, come and be rewarded by the view from our tower. How we get there we alone know if we sought to tell others, what the wiser were they? Suffice it that here at the summit you and I stand. Does any balloonist, does the outlooking man in the moon take a broader view of space? Much thus, one fancies, looks the universe from Milton's celestial battlements. A boundless watery Kentucky, here Daniel Boone would have dwelt content. Never heed for the present yonder burnt district of the enchanted isles. Look edgewise, as it were, past them to the south. You see nothing, but permit me to point out the direction, if not the place, of certain interesting objects in the vast sea, which, kissing this tower's base, we behold unscrolling itself towards the Antarctic Pole. We stand now ten miles from the equator. Yonder, to the east, some six hundred miles, lies the continent, this rock being just about on the parallel of Quito. Observe another thing here. We are at one of three uninhabited clusters, which, at pretty nearly uniform distances from the main sentinel, at long intervals from each other, the entire coast of South America. In a peculiar manner, also, they terminate the South American character of the country. Of the unnumbered Polynesian chains to the westward, not one partakes of the qualities of the Encantadas or Gallipicos, the Isles of St. Felix and St. Ambrose, the Isles of Juan Fernandez and Mazafuero. Of the first it need not here to speak. The second lie a little above the southern tropic lofty, inhospitable, and uninhabitable rocks, one of which, presenting two round hummocks connected by a low reef, exactly resembles a huge double-headed shot. The last lie in the latitude of thirty-three degrees, high, wild, and cloven. 
Juan Fernandez is sufficiently famous without further description. Masafuero is a Spanish name, expressive of the fact that the isle so called lies more without, that is, further off the main, than its neighbor Juan. This isle, Masafuero, has a very imposing aspect at a distance of eight or ten miles. Approached in one direction, in cloudy weather, its great overhanging height and rugged contour, and more especially a peculiar slope of its broad summits, give it much the air of a vast iceberg, drifting in tremendous poise. Its sides are split with dark cavernous recesses, as an old cathedral with its gloomy lateral chapels. Drawing nigh one of these gorges from sea, after a long voyage, and beholding some tatterdemalion outlaw, staff in hand, descending its steep rocks toward you, conveys a very queer emotion to a lover of the picturesque. On fishing parties from ships at various times I have chanced to visit each of these groups. The impression they give to the stranger pulling close up in his boat under their grim cliffs is that surely he must be their first discoverer, such for the most part is the unimpaired, silence, and solitude. And here, by the way, the mode in which these isles were really first lighted upon by Europeans is not unworthy of mention, especially as what is about to be said likewise applies to the original discovery of our Encantadas. Prior to the year 1563, the voyages made by Spanish ships from Peru to Chile were full of difficulty. Along this coast the winds from the south most generally prevail, and it had been an invariable custom to keep close in with the land, from a superstitious conceit on the part of the Spaniards, that were they to lose sight of it, the eternal trade wind would waft them into unending waters, from whence would be no return. Here, involved among tortuous capes and headlands, shoals and reefs, beating, too, against a continual headwind, often light, and sometimes for days and weeks sunk into utter calm, the provincial vessels, in many cases, suffered the extremest hardships in passages, which at the present day seem to have been incredibly protracted. There is on record in some collections of nautical disasters an account of one of these ships, which, starting on a voyage whose duration was estimated at ten days, spent four months at sea, and indeed never again entered harbor, for, in the end, she was cast away. Singular to tell, this craft never encountered a gale, but was the vexed sport of malicious calms and currents. Thrice out of provisions she put back to an intermediate port and started afresh, but only yet again to return. Frequent fogs enveloped her, so that no observation could be had of her place, and once, when all hands were joyously anticipating sight of their destination, lo, the vapors lifted, and disclosed the mountains from which they had taken their first departure. In the like deceptive vapors she had last struck upon a reef, whence ensued a long series of calamities too sad to detail. It was the famous pilot Juan Fernandez, immortalized by the island named after him, who put an end to these coasting tribulations by boldly venturing the experiment, as de Gama did before him with respect to Europe, of standing broad out from land. Here he found the winds favorable for getting to the south, and by running westward till beyond the influences of the trades, he regained the coast without difficulty making the passage which, though in a high degree circuitous, proved far more expeditious than the normally direct one. Now it was upon these new tracks, and about the year 1670 or thereabouts, that the Enchanted Isles, and the rest of the sentinel groups, as they may be called, were discovered. Though I know of no account as to whether any of them were found inhabited or no, it may be reasonably concluded that they have been immemorial solitudes. But let us return to Rodondo. Southwest from our tower lies all Polynesia, hundreds of leagues away, but straight west, on the precise line of his parallel, 
no land rises till your keel is beached upon the king's mills a nice little sail of say five thousand miles having thus by such distant references with redondo the only possible ones settled our relative place on the sea let us consider objects not quite so remote behold the grim and charred enchanted isles this nearest crater-shaped headland is part of albamaro the largest of the group being some sixty miles or more long and fifteen broad did you ever lay eye on the real genuine equator have you ever in the largest sense towed the line well that identical crater-shaped headland there all yellow lava is cut by the equator exactly as a knife cuts straight through the center of a pumpkin pie if you could only see so far just to one side of that same headland across yon low dikey ground you would catch sight of the isle of narborough the loftiest land of the cluster no soil whatever one seamed clinker from top to bottom abounding in black caves like smithies its metallic shore ringing underfoot like plates of iron its central volcanoes standing grouped like a gigantic chimney stack narborough and albemarle are neighbors after a quite curious fashion a familiar diagram will illustrate this strange neighborhood cut a channel at the above letter joint and the middle transverse limb is narborough and all the rest is albemarle volcanic narborough lies in the black jaws of albemarle like a wolf's red tongue in his open mouth if now you desire the population of albemarle i will give you in round numbers the statistics according to the most reliable estimates made upon the spot men none anteaters unknown man haters unknown lizards five hundred thousand snakes five hundred thousand spiders ten million salamanders unknown devils ditto making a clean total of eleven million exclusive of an incomputable host of fiends anteaters man-haters and salamanders albemarle opens his mouth towards the setting sun his distended jaws form a great bay which narborough his tongue divides into halves one whereof is called weather bay the other lee bay while the volcanic promontories terminating his coasts are styled south head and north head i note this because these bays are famous in the annals of the sperm whale fishery the whales come here at certain seasons to calve when ships first cruised hereabouts i am told they used to blockade the entrance of lee bay when their boats going round by weather bay passed through narborough channel and so had the leviathans very neatly in a pen the day after we took fish at the base of this round tower we had a fine wind and shooting round the north headland suddenly descried a fleet of full thirty sail all beating to windward like a squadron in line a brave sight as ever man saw a most harmonious concord of rushing keels their thirty kelsons hummed like thirty harp-strings and looked as straight whilst they left their parallel traces on the sea but there proved too many hunters for the game the fleet broke up and went their separate ways out of sight leaving my own ship and two trim gentlemen of london these last finding no luck either likewise vanished and lee bay with all its appurtenances and without a rival devolved to us the way of cruising here is this you keep hovering about the entrance of the bay in one beat and out the next but at times not always as in other parts of the group a racehorse of a current sweeps right across its mouth so with all sails set you carefully ply your tacks how often standing at the foremast head at sunrise with our patient prow pointed in between these isles did i gaze upon that land not of cakes but of clinkers not of streams of sparkling water but arrested torrents of 
tormented lava. As the ship runs in from the open sea, Narborough presents its side in one dark craggy mass, soaring up some five or six thousand feet, at which point it hoods itself in heavy clouds, whose lowest level fold is as clearly defined against the rocks as the snow line against the Andes. There is dire mischief going on in that upper dark. There toil the demons of fire, who, at intervals, irradiate the nights with a strange spectral illumination for miles and miles around, but unaccompanied by any further demonstration, or else suddenly announce themselves by terrific concussions, and the full drama of a volcanic eruption. The blacker that cloud by day, the more may you look for light by night. Often whalemen have found themselves cruising nigh that burning mountain, when all aglow with a ballroom blaze, or, rather, glassworks. You may call this same vitreous isle of Narborough with its tall chimney stacks. Where we still stand here on Rodondo we cannot see all the other isles, but it is a good place from which to point out where they lie. Yonder, though, to the east-northeast, I mark a distant dusky ridge. It is Abington Isle, one of the most northerly of the group. So solitary, remote, and blank, it looks like no man's land seen off our northern shore. I doubt whether two human beings ever touched upon that spot. So far as yon Abington Isle is concerned, Adam and his billions of posterity remain uncreated. Ranging south of Abington, and quite out of sight behind the long spine of Albemarle, lies James Isle, so called by the early buccaneers after the luckless Stuart, Duke of York. Observe here, by the way, that, excepting the isles particularized in comparatively recent times, and which mostly received the names of famous admirals, the Encantadas were first christened by the Spaniards but these Spanish names were generally effaced on English charts by the subsequent christenings of the buccaneers, who in the middle of the seventeenth century called them after English noblemen and kings. Of these loyal freebooters and the things which associate their name with the Encantadas, we shall hear anon. Nay, for only one little item immediately, for between James Isle and Albemarle lies a fantastic islet strangely known as Cowley's Enchanted Isle. But, as all the group is deemed enchanted, the reason must be given for the spell within a spell involved by this particular designation. The name was bestowed by that excellent buccaneer himself on his first visit here. Speaking in his published voyages of this spot, he says, My fancy led me to call it Cowley's Enchanted Isle for we, having had a sight of it upon several points of the compass, it appeared always in so many different forms, sometimes like a ruined fortification, upon another point like a great city, etc. No wonder, though, that among the Encantadas all sorts of ocular deceptions and mirages should be met. That Cowley linked his name with this self-transforming and bemocking isle, suggests the possibility that it conveyed to him some meditative image of himself. At least, as is not impossible, if he were any relative of the mildly thoughtful and self-abrading poet Cowley, who lived about his time, the conceit might seem unwarranted. For that sort of thing evinced in the naming of this isle runs in the blood, and may be seen in pirates as in poets. Still, south of James Isle lie Jervis Isle, Duncan Isle, Grossman's Isle, Brattle Isle, Woods Isle, Chatham Isle, and various lesser isles, for the most part an archipelago of aridities, without inhabitant, history, or hope of either, in all time to come. But not far from these are rather notable isles, Barrington, Charles's, Norfolk, and Hood's. Succeeding chapters will reveal some ground for their notability. End of section 12. Sketch 4th. A Pisgah view from the rock.
the frigate and the flyaway. Looking far forth into the ocean wide, a goodly ship with banners bravely dight, and flag in her top-gallant I espied, through the main sea making her merry flight. Ere quitting Rodondo, it must not be omitted that here, in 1813, the U.S. frigate Essex, Captain David Porter, came near leaving her bones. Lying becalmed one morning with a strong current setting her rapidly toward the rocks, a strange sail was descried, which, not out of keeping with alleged enchantments of the neighborhood, seemed to be staggering under a violent wind while the frigate lay lifeless, as if spellbound. But a light air springing up, all sail was made by the frigate in chase of the enemy, as supposed, he being deemed an English whale-ship, but the rapidity of the current was so great that soon all sight was lost of him, and at Meridian the Essex, spite of her drags, was driven so close under the foam-lashed cliffs of Rodondo that for a time all hands gave her up. A smart breeze, however, at last helped her off, though the escape was so critical as to seem almost miraculous. Thus saved from destruction herself, she now made use of that salvation to destroy the other vessel, if possible. Renewing the chase in the direction in which the stranger had disappeared, sight was caught of him the following morning. Upon being descried, he hoisted American colors and stood away from the Essex. A calm ensued, when, still confident that the stranger was an Englishman, Porter dispatched a cutter, not to board the enemy, but drive back his boats engaged in towing him. The cutter succeeded. Cutters were subsequently sent to capture him, the stranger now showing English colors in place of American. But when the frigate's boats were within a short distance of their hoped-for prize, another sudden breeze sprang up. The stranger, under all sail, bore off to the westward, and ere night was hull down ahead of the Essex, which all this time lay perfectly becalmed. This enigmatic craft, American in the morning and English in the evening, her sails full of wind in a calm, was never again beheld. An enchanted ship, no doubt. So at least the sailors swore. This cruise of the Essex in the Pacific during the War of 1812 is perhaps the strangest and most stirring to be found in the history of the American Navy. She captured the furthest wandering vessels, visited the remotest seas and isles, long hovered in the charmed vicinity of the enchanted group, and, finally, valiantly gave up the ghost fighting two English frigates in the harbor of Valparaiso. Mention is made of her here for the same reason that the buccaneers will likewise receive record, because, like them, by long cruising among the isles, tortoise hunting upon their shores and generally exploring them, for these and other reasons the Essex is peculiarly associated with the Encantadas. Here be it said that you have but three eyewitness authorities worth mentioning touching the Enchanted Isles. Cowley the Buccaneer, 1684, Colnett the Whaling Ground Explorer, 1798, Porter the Post Captain, 1813. Other than these you have but barren, bootless illusions from some few passing voyagers or compilers. End of sketch fifth, The Frigate and Ship Flyaway Barrington Isle and the Buccaneers Let us all servile base subjection scorn, and as we be sons of the earth so wide, let us our father's heritage divide, and challenge to ourselves our portions due of all the patrimony which a few hold on hugger-mugger in their hand. Lords of the world, and so will wander free, where so us listeth, uncontrolled of any. How bravely now we live, how jocund, how near the first inheritance, without fear, how free from little troubles. Near two centuries ago, Barrington Isle was the resort of that famous wing of the West Indian buccaneers, which, upon their repulse from the Cuban waters,
crossing the Isthmus of Darien, ravaged the Pacific side of the Spanish colonies, and with the regularity and timing of a modern mail, waylaid the royal treasure ships plying between Manila and Acapulco. After the toils of piratic war, here they came to say their prayers, enjoy their free and easies, count their crackers from the cask, their doubloons from the keg, and measure their silks of Asia with long Toledos for their yardsticks. As a secure retreat, an undiscoverable hiding-place, no spot in those days could have been better fitted. In the center of a vast and silent sea, but very little traversed, surrounded by islands, whose inhospitable aspect might well drive away the chance navigator, and yet within a few days' sail of the opulent countries which they made their prey, the unmolested buccaneers found here that tranquillity which they fiercely denied to every civilized harbor in that part of the world. Here, after stress of weather, or a temporary drubbing at the hands of their vindictive foes, or in swift flight with golden booty, those old marauders came and lay snugly out of all harm's reach. But not only was the place a harbor of safety and a bower of ease, but for utility and other things it was most admirable. Barrington Isle is, in many respects, singularly adapted to careening, refitting, refreshing, and other seamen's purposes. Not only has it good water and good anchorage, well sheltered from all winds by the high land of Albemarle, but it is the least unproductive isle of the group. Tortoises good for food, trees good for fuel, and long grass good for bedding abound here, and there are pretty natural walks and several landscapes to be seen. Indeed, though in its locality belonging to the enchanted group, Barrington Isle is so unlike most of its neighbors that it would hardly seem of kin to them. "'I once landed on its western side,' says a sentimental voyager long ago, "'where it faces the black buttress of Albemarle. I walked beneath groves of trees, not very lofty, and not palm-trees, or orange-trees, or peach-trees, to be sure, but for all that, after long seafaring, very beautiful to walk under, even though they supplied no fruit. And here, in calm spaces at the heads of glades, and on the shaded tops of slopes commanding the most quiet scenery, what do you think I saw? Seats, which might have served Brahmins and presidents of peace societies, fine old ruins of what had once been symmetric lounges of stone and turf, they bore every mark both of artificialness and age, and were undoubtedly made by the buccaneers. One had been a long sofa with back and arms, just such a sofa as the poet Gray might have loved to throw himself upon his sebrilon in hand. Though they sometimes tarried here for months at a time, and used the spot for a storing place for spare spars, sails, and casks, yet it is highly improbable that the buccaneers ever erected dwelling-houses upon the isle. They never were here except their ships remained, and they would most likely have slept on board. I mention this because I cannot avoid the thought that it is hard to impute the construction of these romantic seats to any other motive than one of pure peacefulness and kindly fellowship with nature. That the buccaneers perpetrated the greatest outrages is very true. That some of them were mere cutthroats is not to be denied. But we know that here and there among their host was a dampier, a wafer, and a cowley and likewise other men whose worst reproach was their desperate fortunes, whom persecution or adversity or secret and unavengeable wrongs had driven from Christian society to seek the melancholy solitude or the guilty adventures of the sea. At any rate, long as those ruins of seats on Barrington remain, the most singular monuments are furnished to the fact 
that all of the buccaneers were not unmitigated monsters. But during my ramble on the isle I was not long in discovering other tokens of things quite in accordance with those wild traits, popularly and no doubt truly enough imputed to the freebooters at large. Had I picked up old sails and rusty hoops, I would only have thought of the ship's carpenter and cooper. But I found old cutlasses and daggers reduced to mere threads of rust which, doubtless, had stuck between Spanish ribs ere now. These were signs of the murderer and robber. The reveler likewise had left his trace. Mixed with shells, fragments of broken jars were lying here and there, high up upon the beach. They were precisely like the jars now used upon the Spanish coast for the wine and pisco spirits of that country. With a rusty dagger fragment in one hand and a bit of wine jar in another, I sat me down on the ruinous green sofa I have spoken of, and bethought me long and deeply of these same buccaneers. Could it be possible that they robbed and murdered one day, reveled the next, and rested themselves by turning meditative philosophers, rural poets, and seat-builders on the third? Not very improbable, after all, for consider the vacillations of a man. Still, strange as it may seem, I must also abide by the more charitable thought, namely, that among these adventurers were some gentlemanly, companionable souls, capable of genuine tranquillity and virtue. End of section 14. Sketch 6. Bar Charles Island and the Dog King. So, with outrageous cry, a thousand villains round about him swarmed out of the rocks and caves adjoining nigh, vile caitive wretches, ragged, rude, deformed, all threatening death, all in strange manner armed, some with unwieldy clubs, some with long spears, some rusty knives, some staves in fire warmed. We will not be of any occupation. Let such vile vassals born to base vocation drudge in the world, and for their living droil, which have no wit to live without an toil. Southwest of Barrington lies Charles Isle, and hereby hangs a history which I gathered long ago from a shipmate learned in all the lore of outlandish life. During the successful revolt of the Spanish provinces from old Spain, there fought on behalf of Peru a certain Creole adventurer from Cuba, who, by his bravery and good fortune, at length advanced himself to high rank in the Patriot Army. The war being ended, Peru found itself, like many valorous gentlemen, free and independent enough, but with few shot in the locker. In other words, Peru had not wherewithal to pay off its troops. But the Creole, I forget his name, volunteered to take his pay in lands. So they told him he might have his pick of the enchanted isles, which were then, as they still remain, the nominal appendage of Peru. The soldier straightway embarks thither, explores the group, returns to Calao, and says he will take the deed of Charles Isle. Moreover, this deed must stipulate that, thenceforth, Charles Isle is not only the sole property of the Creole, but is forever free of Peru, even as Peru of Spain. To be short, this adventurer procures himself to be made, in effect, supreme lord of the island, one of the princes of the powers of the earth. Note 1. The American Spaniards have long been in the habit of making presents of islands to deserving individuals. The pilot Juan Fernandez procured a deed of the isle named after him, and for some years resided there before Selkirk came. It is supposed, however, that he eventually contracted the blues upon his princely property, for after a time he returned to the main, and as report goes, 
became a very garrulous barber in the city of Lima. He now sends forth a proclamation inviting subjects to his as yet unpopulated kingdom. Some eighty souls, men and women, respond, and being provided by their leader with necessaries and tools of various sorts, together with a few cattle and goats, take ship for the promised land, the last arrival on board prior to sailing being the Creole himself, accompanied, strange to say, by a disciplined cavalry company of large, grim dogs. These, it was observed on the passage, refusing to consort with the emigrants, remained aristocratically grouped around their master on the elevated quarter-deck, casting disdainful glances forward upon the inferior rabble there, much as from the ramparts the soldiers of a garrison thrown into a conquered town eye the inglorious citizen mob over which they are set to watch. Now, Charles Isle not only resembles Barrington Isle in being much more inhabitable than other parts of the group, but it is double the size of Barrington, say forty or fifty miles in circuit. Safely debarked at last, the company, under direction of their lord and patron, forthwith proceeded to build their capital city. They make considerable advance in the way of walls of clinkers and lava floors, nicely sanded with cinders. On the least barren hills they pasture their cattle, while the goats, adventurers by nature, explore the far inland solitudes for a scanty livelihood of lofty herbage. Meantime, abundance of fish and tortoises supply their other wants. The disorders incident to settling all primitive regions, in the present case, were heightened by the peculiarly untoward character of many of the pilgrims. His Majesty was forced at last to proclaim martial law, and actually hunted and shot with his own hand several of his rebellious subjects, who, with most questionable intentions, had clandestinely encamped in the interior, whence they stole by night to prowl barefooted on tiptoe round the precincts of the lava palace. It is to be remarked, however, that prior to such stern proceedings, the more reliable men had been judiciously picked out for an infantry bodyguard, subordinate to the cavalry bodyguard of dogs. But the state of politics in this unhappy nation may be somewhat imagined, from the circumstance that all who were not of the bodyguard were downright plotters and malignant traitors. At length the death penalty was tacitly abolished, owing to the timely thought that were strict sportsmen's justice to be dispensed among such subjects, ere long the Nimrod King would have little or no remaining game to shoot. The human part of the lifeguard was now disbanded, and set to work cultivating the soil and raising potatoes, the regular army now solely consisting of the dog regiment. These, as I have heard, were of a singularly ferocious character, though by severe training rendered docile to their master. Armed to the teeth, the Creole now goes in state, surrounded by his canine janissaries, whose terrific bayings prove quite as serviceable as bayonets in keeping down the surgings of revolt. But the census of the isle, sadly lessened by the dispensation of justice, and not materially recruited by matrimony, began to fill his mind with sad mistrust. Some way the population must be increased. Now from its possessing a little water, and its comparative pleasantness of aspect, Charles Isle at this period was occasionally visited by foreign whalers. These His Majesty had always levied upon for port charges, thereby contributing to his revenue. But now he had additional designs. By insidious arts he, from time to time, cajoles certain sailors to desert their ships, and enlist beneath his banner. Soon as missed, their captains crave permission to go and hunt them up, whereupon His Majesty first hides them very carefully away, and then freely permits the search. In consequence the delinquents are never found, and the ships retire without them. Thus, by a two-edged policy of this crafty monarch, foreign nations were crippled in the number of their subjects, and his own were greatly multiplied. 
He particularly petted these renegado strangers, but alas for the deep-laid schemes of ambitious princes, and alas for the vanity of glory. As the foreign-born Praetorians, unwisely introduced into the Roman state, and still more unwisely made favorites of the emperors, at last insulted and overturned the throne, even so these lawless mariners, with all the rest of the bodyguard and all the populace, broke out into a terrible mutiny, and defied their master. He marched against them with all his dogs. A deadly battle ensued upon the beach. It raged for three hours, the dogs fighting with determined valor, and the sailors reckless of everything but victory. Three men and thirteen dogs were left dead upon the field, many on both sides were wounded, and the king was forced to fly with the remainder of his canine regiment. The enemy pursued, stoning the dogs with their master into the wilderness of the interior. Discontinuing the pursuit, the victors returned to the village on the shore, stove the spirit casks, and proclaimed a republic. The dead men were interred with the honors of war, and the dead dogs ignominiously thrown into the sea. At last, forced by stress of suffering, the fugitive Creole came down from the hills and offered to treat for peace. But the rebels refused it on any other terms than his unconditional banishment. Accordingly, the next ship that arrived carried away the ex-king to Peru. The history of the king of Charles Island furnishes another illustration of the difficulty of colonizing barren islands with unprincipled pilgrims. Doubtless for a long time the exiled monarch, pensively ruralizing in Peru, which afforded him a safe asylum in his calamity, watched every arrival from the Encantadas to hear news of the failure of the Republic, the consequent penitence of the rebels, and his own recall to royalty. Doubtless he deemed the Republic but a miserable experiment which would soon explode. But no, the insurgents had confederated themselves into a democracy, neither Grecian, Roman, nor American. Nay, it was no democracy at all, but a permanent riotricacy, which gloried in having no law but lawlessness. Great inducements being offered to deserters, their ranks were swelled by accessions of scamps from every ship which touched their shores. Charles Island was proclaimed the asylum of the oppressed of all navies. Each runaway tar was hailed as a martyr in the cause of freedom, and became immediately installed a ragged citizen of this universal nation. In vain the captains of absconding seamen strove to regain them. Their new compatriots were ready to give any number of ornamental eyes in their behalf. They had few cannon, but their fists were not to be trifled with. So at last it came to pass that no vessels acquainted with the character of that country durst touch there, however sorely in want of refreshment. It became anathema, a sea alsatia, the unassailed lurking-place of all sorts of desperadoes, who, in the name of liberty, did just what they pleased. They continually fluctuated in their numbers, sailors, deserting ships at other islands, or in boats at sea anywhere in that vicinity, steered for Charles Isle as to their sure home of refuge. While sated with the life of the isle, numbers from time to time crossed the water to the neighboring ones, and there presenting themselves to strange captains as shipwrecked seamen, often succeeded in getting on board vessels bound to the Spanish coast, and having a compassionate purse made up for them on landing there. One warm night, during my first visit to the group, our ship was floating along in languid stillness, when someone on the forecastle shouted, Light ho! We looked and saw a beacon burning on some obscure land off the beam. Our third mate was not intimate with this part of the world, Going to the captain, he said, Sir, shall I put off in a boat? There must be shipwrecked men. The captain laughed rather grimly, as, shaking his fist towards the beacon, he rapped out an oath and said, No, no, you precious rascals! You don't juggle one of my boats ashore this blessed night! You do well, you thieves! 
you do benevolently to hoist a light yonder as on a dangerous shoal it tempts no wise man to pull off and see what's the matter but bids him steer small and keep off shore that is charles island brace up mr mate and keep the light astern end of section fifteen sketch seventh charles isle and the dog king norfolk isle and the chola widow at last they in an island did espy a seemly woman sitting by the shore that with great sorrow and sad agony seemed some great misfortune to deplore and loud to them for succor called evermore black his eye as the midnight sky white his neck as the driven snow red his cheek as the morning light cold he lies in the ground below my love is dead gone to his deathbed yes all under the cactus tree each lonely scene shall thee restore for thee the tear be duly shed beloved till life can charm no more and mourned till pity's self be dead far to the northeast of charles isle sequestered from the rest lies norfolk isle and however insignificant to most voyagers to me through sympathy that lone island has become a spot made sacred by the strangest trials of humanity it was my first visit to the encantadas two days had been spent ashore in hunting tortoises there was not time to capture many so on the third afternoon we loosed our sails we were just in the act of getting under way the uprooted anchor yet suspended and invisibly swaying beneath the wave as the good ship gradually turned her heel to leave the isle behind when the seaman who heaved with me at the windlass paused suddenly and directed my attention to something moving on the land not along the beach but somewhat back fluttering from a height in view of the sequel of this little story be it here narrated how it came to pass that an object which partly from its being so small was quite lost to every other man on board still caught the eye of my handspike companion the rest of the crew myself included merely stood up to our spikes in heaving whereas unwontedly exhilarated at every turn of the ponderous windlass my belted conrad leaped atop of it with might and main giving a downward thewy perpendicular heave his raised eye bent in cheery animation upon the slowly receding shore being high lifted above all others was the reason he perceived the object otherwise unperceivable and this elevation of his eye was owing to the elevation of his spirits and this again for truth must out to a dram of peruvian pisco in guerdon for some kindness done secretly administered to him that morning by our mulatto steward now certainly pisco does a deal of mischief in the world yet seeing that in the present case it was the means though indirect of rescuing a human being from the most dreadful fate must we not also needs admit that sometimes pisco does a deal of good glancing across the water in the direction pointed out i saw some white thing hanging from an inland rock perhaps half a mile from the sea it is a bird a white-winged bird perhaps a uh, no it is it is a handkerchief ay a handkerchief echoed my comrade and with a louder shout apprised the captain quickly now like the running out and training of a great gun the long cabin spyglass was thrust through the mizzen rigging from the high platform of the poop whereupon a human figure was plainly seen upon the inland rock eagerly waving towards us what seemed to be the handkerchief our captain was a prompt good fellow dropping the glass he lustily ran forward ordering the anchor to be dropped again hands to stand by a boat and lower away in a half hour's time the swift boat returned it went with six and came back with seven and the seventh was a woman it is not artistic heartlessness 
but I wish I could but draw in crayons, for this woman was a most touching sight, and crayons, tracing softly melancholy lines, would best depict the mournful image of the dark damasked Chola widow. Her story was soon told, and though given in her own strange language, was as quickly understood, for our captain, from long trading on the Chilean coast, was well versed in the Spanish. A cholo, or half-breed Indian woman of Peta in Peru, three years gone by, with her young new-wedded husband Felipe, of pure Castilian blood, and her one only Indian brother, Truxil, Hunila had taken passage on the main in a French whaler, commanded by a joyous man, which vessel, bound to the cruising grounds beyond the enchanted isles, proposed passing close by their vicinity. The object of the little party was to procure tortoise oil, a fluid which for its great purity and delicacy is held in high estimation wherever known, and it is well known all along this part of the Pacific coast. With a chest of clothes, tools, cooking utensils, a rude apparatus for trying out the oil, some casks of biscuit and other things, not omitting two favorite dogs, of which faithful animal all the cholos are very fond, Hunila and her companions were safely landed at their chosen place. The Frenchman, according to the contract made ere sailing, engaged to take them off upon returning from a four months' cruise in the westward seas, which interval the three adventurers deemed quite sufficient for their purposes. On the isle's lone beach they paid him in silver for their passage out, the stranger having declined to carry them at all except upon that condition, though willing to take every means to ensure the due fulfillment of his promise. Felipe had striven hard to have this payment put off to the period of the ship's return, but in vain. Still they thought they had, in another way, ample pledge of the good faith of the Frenchman. It was arranged that the expenses of the passage home should not be payable in silver, but in tortoises, one hundred tortoises, ready captured, to the returning captain's hand. These the cholos meant to secure after their own work was done, against the probable time of the Frenchman's coming back, and no doubt in prospect already felt that in those hundred tortoises, now somewhere ranging the isle's interior, they possessed one hundred hostages. Enough, the vessel sailed. The gazing three on shore answered the loud glee of the singing crew, and ere evening the French craft was hull down in the distant sea, its masts three faintest lines which quickly faded from Hunila's eye. The stranger had given a blithesome promise, and anchored it with oaths, but oaths and anchors equally will drag, naught else abides on fickle earth but unkept promises of joy. Contrary winds from out unstable skies, or contrary moods of his more varying mind, or shipwreck and sudden death in solitary waves. Whatever was the cause, the blithe stranger never was seen again. Yet, however dire a calamity was here in store, misgivings of it ere due time never disturbed the cholo's busy mind, now all intent upon the toilsome matter which had brought them hither. Nay, by swift doom, coming like the thief at night, ere seven weeks went by two of the little party, were removed from all anxieties of land or sea. No more they sought to gaze with feverish fear, or still more feverish hope, beyond the present's horizon line, but into the furthest future their own silent spirits sailed. By persevering labor beneath that burning sun, Felipe and Truxil had brought down to their hut many scores of tortoises, and tried out the oil, when, elated with their good success and to reward themselves for such hard work, they too hastily made a catamaran, or Indian raft, much used on the Spanish main, and merrily started on a fishing trip, just without a long reef with many jagged gaps running parallel with the shore about half a mile from it. By some bad tide or hap, or natural negligence of joyfulness, 
for though they could not be heard, yet by their gestures they seemed singing at the time. Forced in deep water against that iron bar, the ill-made catamaran was overset, and came all to pieces when dashed by broad-chested swells between their broken logs and the sharp teeth of the reef, both adventurers perished before Hunila's eyes. Before Hunila's eyes they sank. The real woe of this event passed before her sight as some sham tragedy on the stage. She was seated on a rude bower among the withered thickets, crowning a lofty cliff a little back from the beach. The thickets were so disposed that in looking upon the sea at large she peered out from among the branches as from the lattice of a high balcony. But upon the day we speak of here, the better to watch the adventure of those two hearts she loved, Hunila had withdrawn the branches to one side and held them so. They formed an oval frame, through which the bluely boundless sea rolled like a painted one, and there the invisible painter painted to her view the wave-tossed and disjointed raft, its once level logs slantingly upheaved as raking masts, and the four struggling arms indistinguishable among them, and then all subsided into smooth flowing creamy waters, slowly drifting the splintered wreck, while first and last no sound of any sort was heard. Death in a silent picture a dream of the eye, such vanishing shapes as the mirage shows. So instant was the scene, so trance-like its mild pictorial effect, so distant from her blasted bower and her common sense of things, that Hunila gazed and gazed, nor raised a finger or a wail, but as good to sit thus dumb in stupor staring on that dumb show, for all that otherwise might be done. With half a mile of sea between, how could her two enchanted arms aid those four fated ones? The distance long, the time one sand. After the lightning is beheld, what fool shall stay the thunderbolt? Felipe's body was washed ashore, but Truxel's never came, only his gay braided hat of golden straw, that same sunflower thing he waved to her, pushing from the strand, and now to the last gallant it still saluted her. But Felipe's body floated to the marge, with one arm encircling outstretched. Lock-jawed in grim death, the lover-husband softly clasped his bride, true to her even in death's dream. Ah, heaven, when man thus keeps his faith, wilt thou be faithless, who created the faithful one? but they cannot break faith who never plighted it. It needs not to be said what nameless misery now wrapped the lonely widow. In telling her own story she passed this almost entirely over, simply recounting the event. Construe the comment of her features as you might. From her mere words, little would you have weened that Hunilla was herself the heroine of her tale. But not thus did she defraud us of our tears. All hearts bled that grief could be so brave. She but showed us her soul's lid, and the strange ciphers thereon engraved. All within, with pride's timidity, was withheld. Yet was there one exception. Holding out her small olive hand before her captain, she said in mild and slowest Spanish, Senor, I buried him. Then paused struggled as against the writhed coilings of a snake, and cringing suddenly, leapt up, repeating in impassioned pain, I buried him, my life, my soul. Doubtless it was by half-unconscious automatic motions of her hands that this heavy-hearted one performed the final office for Felipe, and planted a rude cross of withered sticks, no green ones might be had, at the head of that lonely grave, where rested now in lasting uncomplaint and quiet haven he whom untranquil seas had overthrown. But some dull sense of another body that should be interred, of another cross that should hallow another grave, unmade as yet, some dull anxiety and pain touching her undiscovered brother now haunted the oppressed Hunila. 
her hands fresh from the burial earth she slowly went back to the beach with unshaped purposes wandering there her spellbound eye bent upon the incessant waves but they bore nothing to her but a dirge which maddened her to think that murderers should mourn as time went by and these things came less dreamingly to her mind the strong persuasions of her romish faith which sets peculiar store by consecrated urns prompted her to resume in waking earnest that pious search which had but been begun as in somnambulism day after day week after week she trod the cindery beach till at length a double motive edged every eager glance with equal longing she now looked for the living and the dead the brother and the captain alike vanished never to return little accurate note of time had hunila taken under such emotions as were hers and little outside herself served for calendar or dial as to poor crusoe in the self-same sea no saint's bell pealed forth the lapse of week or month each day went by unchallenged no chanticleer announced those sultry dawns no lowing herds those poisonous nights all wanted and steadily recurring sounds human or humanized by sweet fellowship with man but one stirred that torrid trance the cry of dogs save which naught but the rolling sea invaded it an all-pervading monotone and to the widow that was the least loved voice she could have heard no wonder that as her thoughts now wandered to the unreturning ship and were beaten back again the hope against hope so struggled in her soul that at length she desperately said not yet not yet my foolish heart runs on too fast so she forced patience for some further weeks but to those whom earth's sure indraft draws patience or impatience is still the same hunila now sought to settle precisely in her mind to an hour how long it was since the ship had sailed and then with the same precision how long a space remained to pass but this proved impossible what present day or month it was she could not say time was her labyrinth in which hunila was entirely lost and now follows against my own purposes a pause descends upon me here one knows not whether nature doth not impose some secrecy upon him who has been privy to certain things at least it is to be doubted whether to be good to blazon such if some books are deemed most baneful and their sale forbid how then with deadlier facts not dreams of doting men those whom books will hurt will not be proof against events events not books should be forbid but in all things man sows upon the wind which bloweth just there whither it listeth for ill or good man cannot know often ill comes from the good as good from ill when hunilla oh, dire sight it is to see some silken beast long dally with a golden lizard ere she devour more terrible to see how feline fate will sometimes dally with a human soul and by a nameless magic make it repulse a sane despair with a hope which is but mad unwittingly i imp this cat-like thing sporting with the heart of him who reads for if he feel not he reads in vain the ship sails this day to-day at last said hunilla to herself this gives me certain time to stand on without certainty i go mad in loose ignorance i have hoped and hoped now in firm knowledge i will but wait now i live and no longer perish in bewilderings holy virgin aid me thou wilt waft back the ship o oh, past length of weary weeks all to be dragged over to buy the certainty of to-day i freely give ye though i tear ye from me as mariners tossed in tempest on some desolate ledge patch them a boat out of the remnants of their vessel's wreck and launch it in the self-same waves 
See here Hunilla, this lone shipwrecked soul, out of treachery, invoking trust. Humanity, though strong thing, I worship thee, not in the laureled victor, but in this vanquished one. Truly Hunilla leaned upon a reed, a real one, no metaphor, a real eastern reed, a piece of hollow cane, drifted from unknown isles, and found upon the beach, its once jagged ends rubbed smoothly even as by sandpaper, its golden glazing gone, long ground between the sea and land, upper and nether stone. The unvarnished substance was filed bare, and wore another polish now, one with itself the polish of its agony. Circular lines at intervals cut all around this surface, divided it into six panels of unequal length. In the first were scored the days, each tenth one marked by a longer and deeper notch. The second was scored by the number of sea-fowl eggs for sustenance, picked out from the rocky nests. The third, how many fish had been caught from the shore. The fourth, how many small tortoises found in land. The fifth, how many days of sun. The sixth, of clouds, which last of the two was the greater one, long night of busy numbering misery's mathematics too weary her too wakeful soul to sleep yet sleep for that was none the panel of the days was deeply worn the long tenths notches half effaced as alphabets of the blind ten thousand times the longing widow had traced her fingers over the bamboo dull flute which played on gave no sound as if counting birds flown by in air would hasten tortoises creeping through the woods. After the one hundred and eightieth day no further mark was seen. That last one was the faintest, as the first the deepest. There were more days, said our captain, many, many more. Why did you not go on and notch them too, Hunilla? Senor, ask me not. And meantime, did no other vessel pass the isle? Nay, senor, but... You do not speak, but what, Hunilla? Ask me not, senor. You saw ships pass far away. You waved to them. They passed on. Was that it, Hunilla? Senor, be it as you say. Braced against her woe, Hunilla would not, durst not trust the weakness of her tongue. Then, when our captain asked whether any whale-boats had but no, I will not file this thing complete for scoffing souls to quote, and call it firm proof upon their side, the half shall here remain untold. Those two unnamed events which befell Hunilla on this isle, let them abide between her and her god. In nature, as in law, it may be libelous to speak some truths. Still, how it was that, although our vessel had lain three days anchored nigh the isle, its one human tenant should not have discovered us till just upon the point of sailing, never to revisit so lone and far a spot, this needs explaining ere the sequel come. The place where the French captain had landed the little party was on the further and opposite end of the isle. There, too, it was that they had afterwards built their hut. Nor did the widow in her solitude desert the spot where her loved ones had dwelt with her, and where the dearest of the twain now slept in his last long sleep, and all her plaints awakened him not, and he of husbands the most faithful during life. Now high, broken land rises between the opposite extremities of the isle. A ship anchored at one side is invisible from the other. Neither is the isle so small, but a considerable company might wander for days through the wilderness of one side, and never be seen, or their halloos heard, by any stranger holding aloof on the other. Hence Hunilla, who naturally associated the possible coming of ships with her own part of the isle, might to the end have remained quite ignorant of the presence of our vessel, were it not for a mysterious presentiment born to her, so our mariners averred, by this isle's enchanted air. Nor did the widow's answer undo the thought. 
"'How did you come to cross the isle this morning, then, Hunila?' said our captain. "'Senor, something came flitting by me. It touched my cheek, my heart, senor. "'What do you say, Hunila? "'I have said, senor, something came through the air.' It was a narrow chance, for when in crossing the isle Hunila gained the high land in the center, she must then for the first have perceived our masts, and also marked that their sails were being loosed, perhaps even heard the echoing chorus of the windless song. The strange ship was about to sail, and she behind. With all haste she now descends the height on the hither side, but soon loses sight of the ship among the sunken jungles at the mountain's base. She struggles on through the withered branches which seek at every step to bar her path, till she comes to the isolated rock, still some way from the water. This she climbs to reassure herself. The ship is still in plainest sight. But now, worn out with over-tension, Hunila all but faints. She fears to step down from her giddy perch. She is fain to pause there where she is, and, as a last resort catches the turban from her head, unfurls and waves it over the jungles towards us. During the telling of her story the mariners formed a voiceless circle round Hunila and the captain, and when at length the word was given to man the fastest boat, and pull round to the isle's thither side to bring away Hunila's chest and the tortoise oil, such alacrity of both cheery and sad obedience seldom before was seen little ado was made already the anchor had been recommitted to the bottom and the ship swung calmly to it but hunilla insisted upon accompanying the boat as indispensable pilot to her hidden hut so being refreshed with the best the steward could supply she started with us nor did ever any wife of the most famous admiral in her husband's barge receive more silent reverence of respect than poor Hunila from this boat's crew. Rounding many a vitreous cape and bluff, in two hours' time we shot inside the fatal reef, wound into a secret cove, looked up along a green, many-gabled lava wall, and saw the island's solitary dwelling. It hung upon an impending cliff, sheltered on two sides by tangled thickets, and half screened from view in front by jutting of the rude stairway, which climbed the precipice from the sea. Built of canes, it was thatched with long, mildewed grass. It seemed an abandoned hayrick, whose haymakers were now no more. The roof inclined but one way, the eaves coming to within two feet of the ground, and here was a simple apparatus to collect the dews, or rather doubly distilled and finest winnowed rains, which in mercy or in mockery the night skies sometimes drop upon these blighted encantadas. All along beneath the eaves a spotted sheet, quite weather-stained, was spread, pinned to short upright stakes set in the shallow sand, a small clinker thrown into the cloth, weighed its middle down, thereby straining all moisture into a calabash placed below. This vessel supplied each drop of water ever drunk upon the isle by the cholos. Hunilla told us the calabash would sometimes, but not often, be half-filled overnight. It held six quarts, perhaps. But, said she, we were used to thirst. At Sandy Peta, where I live, no shower from heaven ever fell. All the water there is brought on mules from the inland vales. Tied among the thickets were some twenty moaning tortoises, supplying Hunila's lonely larder, while hundreds of vast tableted black bucklers, like displaced shattered tombstones of dark slate, were also scattered round. These were the skeleton backs of those great tortoises from which Philippe and Truxil had made their precious oil. Several large calabashes and two goodly kegs were filled with it. In a pot near by were the caked crusts of a quantity which had been permitted to evaporate. They meant to have strained it off next day, said Hunilla, as she turned aside. I forgot to mention the most singular sight of all, though the first that greeted us after landing. 
some ten small soft-haired ringleted dogs of a beautiful breed peculiar to peru set up a concert of glad welcomings when we gained the beach which was responded to by hunila some of these dogs had since their widowhood been born upon the isle the progeny of the two brought from peta owing to the jagged steeps and pitfalls tortuous thickets sunken clefts and perilous intricacies of all sorts in the interior hunila admonished by the loss of one favorite among them never allowed these delicate creatures to follow her in her occasional bird's nest climbs and other wanderings so that through long habituation they offered not to follow when that morning she crossed the land and her own soul was then too full of other things to heed their lingering behind yet all along she had so clung to them that besides what moisture they lapped up at early daybreak from the small scoop holes among the adjacent rocks she had shared the dew of her calabash among them never laying by any considerable store against those prolonged and utter droughts which in some disastrous seasons warp these isles having pointed out at our desire what few things she would like transported to the ship her chest the oil not omitting the live tortoises which she intended for a grateful present to our captain we immediately set to work carrying them to the boat down the long sloping stair of deeply shadowed rock while my comrades were thus employed i looked and hunilla had disappeared it was not curiosity alone but it seems to me something different mingled with it which prompted me to drop my tortoise and once more gaze slowly around i remembered the husband buried by hunilla's hands a narrow pathway led into a dense part of the thickets following it through many mazes i came out upon a small round open space deeply chambered there the mound rose in the middle a bare heap of finest sand like that unverdured heap found at the bottom of an hourglass run out at its head stood the cross of withered sticks the dry peeled bark still fraying from it its transverse limb tied up with rope and forlornly adroop in the silent air Unilla was partly prostrate upon the grave, her dark head bowed and lost in her long loosened Indian hair, her hands extended to the cross foot, with a little brass crucifix clasped between, a crucifix worn featureless, like an ancient graven knocker long plied in vain. She did not see me, and I made no noise, but slid aside and left the spot a few moments ere all was ready for our going she reappeared among us i looked into her eyes but saw no tear there was something which seemed strangely haughty in her air and yet it was the air of woe a spanish and an indian grief which would not visibly lament pride's height in vain abased to proneness on the rack nature's pride subduing nature's torture like pages the small and silken dogs surrounded her as she slowly descended towards the beach she caught the two most eager creatures in her arms mia tita mia tomotita and fondling them inquired how many could we take on board the mate commanded the boat's crew not a hard-hearted man but his way of life had been such that in most things even in the smallest simple utility was his leading motive we cannot take them all, Hunila. Our supplies are short. The winds are unreliable. We may be a good many days going to Tombez. So take those you have, Hunila, but no more. She was in the boat. The oarsmen, too, were seated, all save one who stood ready to push off and then spring himself. With the sagacity of their race, the dogs now seemed aware that they were in the very instant of being deserted upon a barren strand the gunwales of the boat were high its prow presented inland was lifted so owing to the water which they seemed instinctively to shun the dogs could not well leap into the little craft but their busy paws hard scraped the prow as it had been some farmer's door shutting them out from shelter in a winter storm a clamorous agony of alarm 
They did not howl or whine. They all but spoke. "'Push off! Give way!' cried the mate. The boat gave one heavy drag and lurch, and next moment shot swiftly from the beach, turned on her heel, and sped. The dogs ran howling along the water's marge, now pausing to gaze at the flying boat, then motioning as if to leap in chase, but mysteriously withheld themselves, and again ran howling along the beach. Had they been human beings, hardly would they have more vividly inspired the sense of desolation. The oars were plied as confederate feathers of two wings. No one spoke. I looked back upon the beach and then upon Hunila, but her face was set in a stern, dusky calm. The dogs crouching in her lap vainly licked her rigid hands. She never looked behind her, but sat motionless till we turned a promontory of the coast and lost all sights and sounds astern. She seemed as one who, having experienced the sharpest of mortal pangs, was henceforth content to have all lesser heartstrings riven one by one. To Hunilla, pain seemed so necessary that pain in other beings, though by love and sympathy made her own, was unrepiningly to be born, a heart of yearning in a frame of steel, a heart of earthly yearning, frozen by the frost which falleth from the sky. The sequel is soon told. After a long passage vexed by calms and baffling winds, we made the little port of Tombez in Peru, there to recruit the ship. Peta was not very distant. Our captain sold the tortoise oil to a Tombez merchant, and adding to the silver a contribution from all hands, gave it to our silent passenger, who knew not what the mariners had done. The last scene of lone Hunila, she was passing into Peta town, riding upon a small gray ass, and before her on the ass's shoulders she eyed the jointed workings of the beast's armorial cross. End of section 16, sketch 8, Norfolk Isle and the Chola Widow. Hood's Isle and the Hermit Oberlus. That darksome glen they enter where they find that cursed man, low sitting on the ground, musing full sadly in his sullen mind. His grisly locks, long grown and unbound, disordered hung about his shoulders round, and hid his face through which his hollow eyne looked deadly dull and stared as astound his raw-boned cheeks through penury and pine were shrunk into the jaws as he did never dine his garments naught but many ragged clouts with thorns together pinned and patched reeds the which his naked sides he wrapped about Southeast of Crossman's Isle lies Hood's Isle, or McCain's Beclouded Isle, and upon its south side is a vitreous cove with a wide strand of dark pounded black lava called Black Beach, or Oberlus's Landing. It might fitly have been styled Charon's. It received its name from a wild white creature who spent many years here in the person of a European bringing into this savage region qualities more diabolical than are to be found among any of the surrounding cannibals. About a half-century ago Oberlus deserted at the above-named island, then, as now, a solitude. He built himself a den of lava and clinkers about a mile from the landing, subsequently called after him, in a vale or expanded gulch containing here and there among the rocks about two acres of soil, capable of rude cultivation, the only place on the isle not too blasted for that purpose. Here he succeeded in raising a sort of degenerate potatoes and pumpkins, which from time to time he exchanged with needy whalemen passing for spirits or dollars. His appearance, from all accounts, was that of the victim of some malignant sorceress, he seemed to have drunk of Circe's cup, beast-like, rags insufficient to hide his nakedness, his befreckled skin blistered by continual exposure to the sun, nose flat, 
countenance contorted, heavy, earthy, hair and beard unshorn, profuse, and of fiery red. He struck strangers much as if he were a volcanic creature thrown up by the same convulsion which exploded into sight the isle. All bespatched and coiled asleep in his lonely lava den among the mountains, he looked, they say, as a heaped drift of withered leaves, torn from autumn trees, and so left in some hidden nook by the whirling halt for an instant of a fierce night wind, which then ruthlessly sweeps on somewhere else to repeat the capricious act. It is also reported to have been the strangest sight, this same Oberlus, of a sultry, cloudy morning, hidden under his shocking old black tarpaulin hat, hoeing potatoes among the lava. So warped and crooked was his strange nature that the very handle of his hoe seemed gradually to have shrunk and twisted in his grasp, being a wretched bent stick, elbowed more like a savage's war-sickle than a civilized hoe-handle. It was his mysterious custom upon a first encounter with a stranger ever to present his back, possibly because that was his better side, since it revealed the least. If the encounter chanced in his garden, as it sometimes did, the new-landed strangers going from the seaside straight through the gorge to hunt up the queer green grocer reported doing business here, Oberlus for a time hoed on, unmindful of all greeting, jovial or bland. As the curious stranger would turn to face him, the recluse, hoe in hand, as diligently would avert himself, bowed over and sullenly revolving round his Murphy Hill. Thus far for hoeing, when planting, his whole aspect and all his gestures were so malevolently and uselessly sinister and secret that he seemed rather an act of dropping poison into wells than potatoes into soil. But among his lesser and more harmless marvels was an idea he ever had that his visitors came equally as well led by longings to behold the mighty hermit Oberlus in his royal state of solitude as simply to obtain potatoes, or find whatever company might be upon a barren isle. It seems incredible that such a being should possess such vanity. A misanthrope be conceited, but he really had his notion, and upon the strength of it often gave himself amusing airs to captains. But, after all, this is somewhat of a piece with the well-known eccentricity of some convicts, proud of that very hatefulness which makes them notorious. At other times another unaccountable whim would seize him, and he would long dodge advancing strangers round the clinkered corners of his hut. Sometimes, like a stealthy bear, he would slink through the withered thickets up the mountains, and refuse to see the human face. Except his occasional visitors from the sea, for a long period, the only companions of Oberlus were the crawling tortoises, and he seemed more than degraded to their level, having no desires for a time beyond theirs, unless it were for the stupor brought on by drunkenness. But sufficiently debased as he appeared, there yet lurked in him, only awaiting occasion for discovery, a still further proneness. Indeed, the sole superiority of Oberlus over the tortoises was his possession of a larger capacity of degradation, and along with that something like an intelligent will to it. Moreover, what is about to be revealed, perhaps will show, that selfish ambition, or the love of rule for its own sake, far from being the peculiar infirmity of noble minds, is shared by beings which have no mind at all. No creatures are so selfishly tyrannical as some brutes, as any one who has observed the tenants of the pasture must occasionally have observed. This island's mine by Sikorax, my mother, said Oberlus to himself, glaring round upon his haggard solitude, by some means, barter or theft, for in those days ships at intervals still kept touching at his landing, he obtained an old musket with a few charges of powder and ball. Possessed of arms, he was stimulated to enterprise as a tiger that first feels the coming of its claws. 
the long habit of sole dominion over every object round him, his almost unbroken solitude, his never encountering humanity except on terms of misanthropic independence or mercantile craftiness, and even such encounters being comparatively but rare, all this must have gradually nourished in him a vast idea of his own importance, together with a pure animal sort of scorn for all the rest of the universe. The unfortunate Creole, who enjoyed his brief term of royalty at Charles Isle, was perhaps in some degree influenced by not unworthy motives, such as prompt other adventurous spirits to lead colonists into distant regions and assume political preeminence over them. His summary execution of many of his Peruvians is quite pardonable, considering the desperate characters he had to deal with, while his offering canine battle to the banded rebels seems under the circumstances altogether just. But for this King Oberlus, and what shortly follows, no shade of palliation can be given. He acted out of mere delight in tyranny and cruelty, by virtue of a quality in him inherited from Sycorax, his mother. Armed now with that shocking blunderbuss, strong in the thought of being master of that horrid isle, he panted for a chance to prove his potency upon the first specimen of humanity which should fall unbefriended into his hands. Nor was he long without it. One day he spied a boat upon the beach, with one man, a negro, standing by it. Some distance off was a ship, and Oberlus immediately knew how matters stood. The vessel had put in for wood, and the boat's crew had gone into the thickets for it. From a convenient spot he kept watch of the boat, till presently a straggling company appeared loaded with billets. Throwing these on the beach, they again went into the thickets while the negro proceeded to load the boat. Oberlus now makes all haste and accosts the negro, who, aghast at seeing any living being inhabiting such a solitude, and especially so horrific a one, immediately falls into a panic, not at all lessened by the ursine suavity of Oberlus, who begs the favor of assisting him in his labors. The negro stands with several billets on his shoulder, in act of shouldering others, and Oberlus, with a short cord concealed in his bosom, kindly proceeds to lift those other billets to their place. In so doing, he persists in keeping behind the negro, who, rightly suspicious of this, in vain dodges about to gain the front of Oberlus. But Oberlus dodges also till at last, weary of his bootless attempt at treachery, or fearful of being surprised by the remainder of the party, Oberlus runs off a little space to a bush, and, fetching his blunderbuss, savagely commands the negro to desist work and follow him. He refuses. Whereupon presenting his piece, Oberlus snaps at him. Luckily the blunderbuss misses fire, but by this time, frightened out of his wits, the negro, upon a second intrepid summons, drops his billets, surrenders at discretion, and follows on. By a narrow defile familiar to him, Oberlus speedily removes out of sight of the water. On their way up the mountains he exultingly informs the negro that henceforth he is to work for him, and be his slave, and that his treatment would entirely depend on his future conduct. But Oberlus, deceived by the first impulsive cowardice of the black, in an evil moment slackens his vigilance. Passing through a narrow way and perceiving his leader quite off his guard, the negro, a powerful fellow, suddenly grasps him in his arms, throws him down, wrests his musketoon from him, ties his hands with the monster's own cord, shoulders him, and returns with him down to the boat. When the rest of the party arrive, Oberlus is carried on board the ship. This proved an Englishman, and a smuggler, a sort of craft not apt to be over-charitable. Oberlus is severely whipped, then handcuffed, taken ashore, and compelled to make known his habitation and produce his property. His potatoes, pumpkins, and tortoises, with a pile of dollars he had hoarded from his mercantile operations, were secured on the spot but while the two vindictive smugglers were busy destroying his hut and garden, Oberlus makes his escape into the mountains, 
and conceals himself there in impenetrable recesses only known to himself till the ship sails when he ventures back and by means of an old file which he sticks into a tree contrives to free himself from his handcuffs brooding among the ruins of his hut and the desolate clinkers and extinct volcanoes of this outcast isle the insulted misanthrope now meditates a signal revenge upon humanity but conceals his purposes vessels still touch the landing at times and by and by oberlus is enabled to supply them with some vegetables warned by his former failure in kidnapping strangers he now pursues a quite different plan when seamen come ashore he makes up to them like a free and easy comrade invites them to his hut and with whatever affability his red-haired grimness may assume entreats them to drink his liquor and be merry but his guests need little pressing and so soon as rendered insensible are tied hand and foot and pitched among the clinkers are there concealed till the ship departs when finding themselves entirely dependent upon oberlus alarmed at his changed demeanor his savage threats and above all that shocking blunderbuss they willingly enlist under him becoming his humble slaves and oberlus the most incredible of tyrants so much so that two or three perish beneath his initiating process he sets the remainder four of them to breaking the caked soil transporting upon their backs loads of loamy earth scooped up in moist clefts among the mountains keeps them on the roughest fare presents his peace at the slightest hint of insurrection and in all respects converts them into reptiles at his feet plebeian garter snakes to his lord anaconda at last oberlus contrives to stock his arsenal with four rusty cutlasses and an added supply of powder and ball intended for his blunderbuss remitting in good part the labor of his slaves he now approves himself a man or rather devil of great abilities in the way of cajoling or coercing others into acquiescence with his own ulterior designs however at first abhorrent to them but indeed prepared for almost any eventual evil by their previous lawless life as a sort of ranging cowboys of the sea which had dissolved within them the whole moral man so that they were ready to concrete in the first offered mold of baseness now rotted down from manhood by their hopeless misery on the isle wanted to cringe in all things to their lord himself the worst of slaves these wretches were now become wholly corrupted to his hands he used them as creatures of an inferior race in short he gaffles his four animals and makes murderers of them out of cowards fitly manufacturing bravos now sword or dagger human arms are but artificial claws and fangs tied on like false spurs to the fighting cock so we repeat oberlus czar of the isle gaffles his four subjects that is with intent of glory puts four rusty cutlasses into their hands like any other autocrat he had a noble army now it might be thought a servile war would hereupon ensue arms in the hands of trodden slaves how indiscreet of emperor oberlus nay they had but cutlasses sad old sighs enough he a blunderbuss which by its blind scatterings of all sorts of boulders clinkers and other scoria would annihilate all four mutineers like four pigeons at one shot besides at first he did not sleep in his accustomed hut every lurid sunset for a time he might have been seen wending his way among the riven mountains there to secrete himself till dawn in some sulphurous pitfall undiscoverable to his gang but finding this at last too troublesome he now each evening tied his slaves hand and foot hid the cutlasses and thrusting them into his barracks shut to the door and lying down before it beneath a rude shed lately added slept out the night blunderbuss in hand it is supposed that not content with daily parading over a cindery solitude at the head of his fine army oberlus now meditated the most active mischief his probable object being to surprise some passing ship 
touching at his dominions, massacre the crew, and run away with her to parts unknown. While these plans were simmering in his head, two ships touching company at the isle, on the opposite side to his, when his designs undergo a sudden change. The ships are in want of vegetables, which Overless promises in great abundance, provided they send their boats round to his landing, so that the crews may bring the vegetables from his garden, informing the two captains at the same time that his rascals, slaves and soldiers, had become so abominably lazy and good for nothing of late that he could not make them work by ordinary inducements, and did not have the heart to be severe with them. The arrangement was agreed to, and the boats were sent and hauled upon the beach. The crews went to the lava hut, but to their surprise nobody was there. After waiting till their patience was exhausted, they returned to the shore, when, lo, some stranger, not the good Samaritan either, seems to have very recently passed that way. Three of the boats were broken in a thousand pieces, and the fourth was missing. By hard toil over the mountains and through the clinkers, some of the strangers succeeded in returning to that side of the isle where the ships lay, when fresh boats are sent to the relief of the rest of the hapless party. However amazed at the treachery of Oberlis, the two captains, afraid of new and still more mysterious atrocities, and indeed half imputing such strange events to the enchantments associated with these isles, perceive no security but in instant flight, leaving Oberlis and his army in quiet possession of the stolen boat. On the eve of sailing they put a letter in a keg, giving the Pacific Ocean intelligence of the affair, and moored the keg in the bay. Some time subsequent the keg was opened by another captain chancing to anchor there, but not until after he had dispatched a boat round to Oberlis's landing. As may be readily surmised, he felt no little inquietude till the boat's return, when another letter was handed him, giving Oberlis's version of the affair. This precious document had been found pinned half-mildewed to the clinker wall of the sulphurous and deserted hut. It ran as follows, showing that Oberlis was at least an accomplished writer, and no mere boor, and what is more, was capable of the most tristful eloquence. Sir, I am the most unfortunate, ill-treated gentleman that lives. I am a patriot, exiled from my country by the cruel hand of tyranny. Banished to these enchanted isles, I have again and again besought captains of ships to sell me a boat, but always have been refused, though I offered the handsomest prices in Mexican dollars. At length an opportunity presented of possessing myself of one, and I did not let it slip. I have been long endeavoring by hard labor and much solitary suffering to accumulate something to make myself comfortable in a virtuous though unhappy old age, but at various times have been robbed and beaten by men professing to be Christians. Today I sailed from the enchanted group in the good boat charity bound to the Fiji Isles. Fatherless Oberless. P.S. Behind the clinkers, nigh the oven, you will find the old fowl. Do not kill it. Be patient. I leave it setting. If it shall have any chicks, I hereby bequeath them to you, whoever you may be. But don't count your chicks before they are hatched. The fowl proved a starveling rooster, reduced to a sitting posture by sheer debility. Oberlis declares that he was bound to the Fiji Isles, but this was only to throw pursuers on a false scent, for after a long time he arrived alone in his open boat at Guayaquil. As his miscreants were never again beheld on Hood's Isle, it is supposed either that they perished for want of water on the passage to Guayaquil, or, what is quite as probable, were thrown overboard by Oberlis when he found the water growing scarce. From Guayaquil Oberlis proceeded to Peta, and there, with that nameless witchery peculiar to some of the ugliest animals, wound himself into the affections of a tawny damsel, prevailing upon her to accompany him back to his enchanted isle, which doubtless he painted as a paradise of flowers, not as a tartarus of clinkers. 
but unfortunately for the colonization of Hood's Isle, with a choice variety of animated nature, the extraordinary and devilish aspect of Oberlus made him to be regarded in Peta as a highly suspicious character. So that being found concealed one night, with matches in his pocket under the hull of a small vessel just ready to be launched, he was seized and thrown into jail. The jails in most South American towns are generally of the least wholesome sort, built of huge cakes of sunburnt brick, and containing but one room without windows or yard, and but one door heavily grated with wooden bars, they present both within and without the grimmest aspect. As public edifices, they conspicuously stand upon the hot and dusty plaza, offering to view, through the gratings, their villainous and hopeless inmates, burrowing in all sorts of tragic squalor. And here for a long time Oberlus was seen, the central figure of a mongrel and assassin band, a creature whom it is religion to detest, since it is philanthropy to hate a misanthrope. Note, they who may be disposed to question the possibility of the character above depicted are referred to the second volume of Porter's Voyage into the Pacific, where they will recognize many sentences, for expedition's sake derived verbatim from thence, and incorporated here. The main difference, save a few passing reflections, between the two accounts being that the present writer has added to Porter's facts accessory ones picked up in the Pacific from reliable sources, and, where facts conflict, has naturally preferred his own authorities to Porter's. As, for instance, his authorities place Oberlus on Hood's Isle, Porter's on Charles's Isle. The letter found in the hut is also somewhat different, for while at the Encantadas he was informed that not only did it evince a certain clerkliness, but was full of the strangest satiric effrontery which does not adequately appear in Porter's version. I accordingly altered it to suit the general character of its author. End of section 17. The Encantadas, sketch ninth, Hood's Isle and the Hermit Oberlus. Runaways, castaways, solitaries, gravestones, etc and all about old stocks and stubs of trees, whereon nor fruit nor leaf was ever seen, did hang upon ragged, knotty knees, on which had many wretches hanged been. Some relics of the hut of Oberlus partially remain to this day at the head of the clinkered valley, nor does the stranger, wandering among other of the enchanted isles, fail to stumble upon still other solitary abodes, long abandoned to the tortoise and the lizard. Probably few parts of earth have in modern times sheltered so many solitaries. The reason is that these isles are situated in a distant sea, and the vessels which occasionally visit them are mostly all whalers, or ships bound on dreary and protracted voyages, exempting them in a good degree from both the oversight and the memory of human law. Such is the character of some commanders and some seamen, that under these untoward circumstances it is quite impossible but that scenes of unpleasantness and discord should occur between them. A sullen hatred of the tyrannic ship will seize the sailor, and he gladly exchanges it for isles, which, though blighted, as by a continual sirocco and burning breeze, still offer him, in their labyrinthine interior, a retreat beyond the possibility of capture. To flee the ship in any Peruvian or Chilean port, even the smallest and most rustical, is not unattended with great risk of apprehension, not to speak of jaguars. A reward of five pesos sends fifty dastardly Spaniards into the wood, who, with long knives, scour them day and night in eager hopes of securing their prey. Neither is it in general much easier to escape pursuit at the Isles of Polynesia. Those of them which have felt a civilizing influence present the same difficulty to the runaway with the Peruvian ports, the advanced natives being quite as mercenary and keen of knife and scent as the retrograde Spaniards 
while owing to the bad odor in which all Europeans lie, in the minds of aboriginal savages who have chanced to hear aught of them, to desert the ship among primitive Polynesians is, in most cases, a hope not unforlorn. Hence the enchanted isles become the voluntary tarrying places of all sorts of refugees, some of whom too sadly experience the fact that flight from tyranny does not of itself ensure a safe asylum, far less a happy home. Moreover, it has not seldom happened that hermits have been made upon the isles by the accidents incident to tortoise hunting. The interior of most of them is tangled and difficult of passage beyond description. The air is sultry and stifling. An intolerable thirst is provoked, for which no running stream offers its kind relief. In a few hours, under an equatorial sun, reduced by these causes to entire exhaustion, woe betide the straggler at the enchanted isles. Their extent is such as to forbid an adequate search unless weeks are devoted to it. The impatient ship waits a day or two, when, the missing man remaining undiscovered, up goes a stake on the beach with a letter of regret and a keg of crackers and another of water tied to it, and away sails the craft. Nor have there been wanting instances where the inhumanity of some captains has led them to wreak a secure revenge upon seamen who have given their caprice or pride some singular offense. Thrust ashore upon the scorching marl, such mariners are abandoned to perish outright, unless by solitary labors they succeed in discovering some precious driblets of moisture oozing from a rock or stagnant in a mountain pool. I was well acquainted with a man who, lost upon the Isle of Narborough, was brought to such extremes by thirst that at last he only saved his life by taking that of another being. A large hair seal came upon the beach. He rushed upon it, stabbed it in the neck, and then, throwing himself upon the panting body, quaffed at the living wound. The palpitations of the creature's dying heart injected life into the drinker. Another seaman thrust ashore in a boat upon an isle at which no ship ever touched, owing to its peculiar sterility and the shoals about it, and from which all other parts of the group were hidden, this man, feeling that it was sure death to remain there, and that nothing worse than death menaced him in quitting it, killed seals, and inflating their skins, made a float upon which he transported himself to Charles Island, and joined the Republic there but men not endowed with courage equal to such desperate attempts find their only resource in forthwith seeking some watering-place however precarious or scanty building a hut catching tortoises and birds and in all respects preparing for a hermit life till tide or time or a passing ship arrives to float them off at the foot of precipices on many of the isles Small, rude basins in the rocks are found, partly filled with rotted rubbish or vegetable decay, or overgrown with thickets, and sometimes a little moist, which upon examination reveal plain tokens of artificial instruments employed in hollowing them out by some poor castaway or still more miserable runaway. These basins are made in places where it was supposed some scanty drops of dew might exude into them from the upper crevices. The relics of hermitages and stone basins are not the only signs of vanishing humanity to be found upon the isles, and, curious to say, that spot which of all others in settled communities is most animated at the enchanted isles presents the most dreary of aspects and though it may seem very strange to talk of post-offices in this barren region, yet post-offices are occasionally to be found there. They consist of a stake and a bottle, the letters being not only sealed but corked, and they are generally deposited by captains of Nantucketers for the benefit of passing fishermen, and contain statements as to what luck they had in whaling or tortoise-hunting. Frequently, however, long months and months, 
whole years glide by and no applicant appears. The stake rots and falls, presenting no very exhilarating object. If now it be added that gravestones, or rather grave boards, are also discovered upon some of the aisles, the picture will be complete. Upon the beach of James Isle, for many years, was to be seen a rude finger-post pointing inland, and perhaps, taking it for some signal of possible hospitality in this otherwise desolate spot, some good hermit living there with his maple-dish, the stranger would follow on in the path thus indicated, till at last he would come out in a noiseless nook, and find his only welcome, a dead man, his sole greeting in the inscription over a grave. Here in 1813 fell, in a daybreak duel, a lieutenant of the U.S. frigate Essex, aged twenty-one, attaining his majority in death. It is but fit that, like those old monastic institutions of Europe, whose inmates go not out of their own walls to be inured, but are entombed there where they die, the Encantadas, too, should bury their own dead, even as the great general monastery of earth does hers. It is known that burial in the ocean is a pure necessity of seafaring life, and that it is only done when land is far astern, and not clearly visible from the bow. Hence to vessels cruising in the vicinity of the Enchanted Isles they afford a convenient potter's field. The internment over, some good-natured forecastle poet and artist seizes his paintbrush and inscribes a doggerel epitaph. When, after a long lapse of time, other good-natured seamen chance to come upon the spot, they usually make a table of the mound and quaff a friendly can to the poor soul's repose. As a specimen of these epitaphs, take the following found in a bleak gorge of Chatham Isle. Oh, Brother Jack, as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I, just so game and just so gay, but now, alack, they've stopped my pay. No more I peep out of my blinkers. Here I be, tucked in with clinkers. End of section 18. The Encantada Sketch Tenth. Runaways, Castaways, Solitaries, Gravestones, etc. Chapter 6. The Bell Tower. In the south of Europe, nigh a once frescoed capital, now with dank mold cankering its bloom, central in the plain, stands what, at distance, seems the black mossed stump of some immeasurable pine, fallen in forgotten days with Anak and the Titan. As all along where the pine tree falls, its dissolution leaves a mossy mound, last flung shadow of the perished trunk, never lengthening, never lessening, unsubject to the fleet falsities of the sun, shade immutable, and true gauge which cometh by prostration, so westward from what seems the stump one steadfast spear of lichened ruin veins the plain. From that treetop what birded chimes of silver throats had sung, a stone pine, a metallic aviary in its crown, the bell-tower, built by the great mechanician, the unblessed foundling, Banadona. Like Babel's, its base was laid in a high hour of renovated earth, following the second deluge, when the waters of the dark ages had dried up, and once more the green appeared. No wonder that after so long and deep submersion the jubilant expectation of the race should, as with Noah's sons, soar into shiner aspiration. In firm resolve, no man in Europe at that period went beyond Banadona. Enriched through commerce with the Levant, the state in which he lived voted to have the noblest bell-tower in Italy. His repute assigned him to be architect. Stone by stone, month by month, the tower rose, higher, higher, snail-like in pace, but torch or rocket in its pride. After the masons would depart, the builder, standing alone upon its ever-ascending summit, 
at close of every day, saw that he overtopped still higher walls and trees. He would tarry till a late hour there, wrapped in schemes of other and still loftier piles. Those who of saints' days thronged the spot, hanging to the rude poles of scaffolding, like sailors on yards or bees on boughs, unmindful of lime and dust, and falling chips of stone, their homage not the less inspired him to self-esteem. At length the holiday of the tower came. To the sound of vials the climax stone slowly rose in air, and, amid the firing of ordnance, was laid by Banadona's hands upon the final course. Then, mounting it, he stood erect, alone, with folded arms, gazing upon the white summits of blue inland Alps, and whiter crests of bluer Alps offshore, sights invisible from the plain. Invisible, too, from thence was that eye he turned below, when, like the cannon booms, came up to him the people's combustions of applause. That which stirred them so was seeing with what serenity the builder stood three hundred feet in the air upon an unrailed perch. This none but he durst do, but his periodic standing upon the pile in each stage of its growth, such discipline had its last result. Little remained now but the bells. These, in all respects, must correspond with their receptacle. The minor ones were prosperously cast. A highly enriched one followed, of singular make, intended for suspension in a manner before unknown. The purpose of this bell, its rotary motion and connection with the clockwork, also executed at the time, will, in the sequel, receive mention. In the one erection, bell-tower and clock-tower were united, though before that period such structures had commonly been built distinct, as the Campanile and Torre de Orologio of St. Mark to this day attest. But it was upon the great state bell that the founder lavished his more daring skill. In vain did some of the less elated magistrates here caution him, saying that, though truly the tower was titanic, yet limits should be set to the dependent weight of its swaying masses but undeterred he prepared his mammoth mold, dented with mythological devices, kindled his fires of balsamic furs, melted his tin and copper, and, throwing in much plate, contributed by the public spirit of the nobles, let loose the tide. The unleashed metals bayed like hounds, the workmen shrunk, through their fright fatal harm to the bell was dreaded. Fearless as Shadrach, Benedona, rushing through the glow, smote the chief culprit with his ponderous ladle. From the smitten part a splinter was dashed into the seething mass, and at once was melted in. Next day a portion of the work was heedfully uncovered. All seemed right. Upon the third morning, with equal satisfaction, it was bared still lower. At length, like some old Theban king, the whole cooled casting was disinterred. All was fair, except in one strange spot. But as he suffered no one to attend him in these inspections, he concealed the blemish by some preparation which none knew better to devise. The casting of such a mass was deemed no small triumph for the caster, one, too, in which the state might not scorn to share the homicide was overlooked. By the charitable, that deed was but imputed to sudden transports of aesthetic passion, not to any flagidious quality. A kick from an Arabian charger, not sign of vice, but blood. His felony remitted by the judge, absolution given him by the priest, what more could even a sickly conscience have desired? Honoring the tower and its builder with another holiday, the Republic witnessed the hoisting of the bells and clockwork amid shows and pomps superior to the former. Some months of more than usual solitude on Banadona's part ensued. It was not unknown that he was engaged upon something for the belfry, intended to complete it, and surpass all that had gone before. Most people imagined that the design would involve a casting like the bells. 
but those who thought they had some further insight would shake their heads with hints that not for nothing did the mechanician keep so secret. Meantime, his seclusion failed not to invest his work with more or less of that sort of mystery pertaining to the forbidden. Ere long he had a heavy object hoisted to the belfry, wrapped in a dark sack or cloak, a procedure sometimes had in the case of an elaborate piece of sculpture or statue, which, being intended to grace the front of a new edifice, the architect does not desire exposed to critical eyes till set up, finished, in its appointed place. Such was the impression now. But as the object rose, a statuary present observed, or thought he did, that it was not entirely rigid, but was, in a manner, pliant. At last, when the hidden thing had attained its final height, and, obscurely seen from below, seemed almost of itself to step into the belfry, as if with little assistance from the crane. A shrewd old blacksmith present ventured the suspicion that it was but a living man. This surmise was thought a foolish one, while the general interest failed not to augment. Not without demure from Banadona, the chief magistrate of the town, with an associate, both elderly men, followed what seemed the image up the tower. But arrived at the belfry they had little recompense. Plausibly entrenching himself behind the conceded mysteries of his art, the mechanician withheld present explanation. The magistrates glanced toward the cloaked object, which, to their surprise, seemed now to have changed its attitude, or else had before been more perplexingly concealed by the violent muffling action of the wind without. It seemed now seated upon some sort of frame or chair contained within the domino. They observed that nigh the top, in a sort of square, the web of the cloth, either from accident or design, had its warp partly withdrawn, and the cross threads plucked out here and there so as to form a sort of woven grating. Whether it were the low wind or no, stealing through the stone lattice work, or only their own perturbed imaginations, is uncertain, but they thought they discerned a slight sort of fitful spring-like motion in the domino. Nothing, however incidental or insignificant, escaped their uneasy eyes. Among other things they pried out, in a corner, an earthen cup, partly corroded and partly encrusted, and one whispered to the other that this cup was just such a one as might in mockery be offered to the lips of some brazen statue, or perhaps still worse. But being questioned, the mechanician said that the cup was simply used in his founder's business, and described the purpose. In short, a cup to test the condition of metals in fusion. He added that it had got into the belfry by the merest chance. Again and again, they gazed at the domino, as at some suspicious incognito at a Venetian mask. All sorts of vague apprehensions stirred them. They even dreaded lest, when they should descend, the mechanician, though without a flesh-and-blood companion for all that, would not be left alone. Affecting some merriment at their disquietude, he begged to relieve them by extending a coarse sheet of workman's canvas between them and the object. Meantime he sought to interest them in his other work. Nor, now that the domino was out of sight, did they long remain insensible to the artistic wonders lying round them, wonders hitherto beheld but in their unfinished state, because, since hoisting the bells, none but the caster had entered within the belfry. It was one trait of his that, even in details, he would not let another do what he could, without too great loss of time, accomplish for himself. So for several preceding weeks, whatever hours were unemployed in his secret design, had been devoted to elaborating the figures on the bells. The clock bell in particular now drew attention. Under a patient chisel, the latent beauty of its enrichments, before obscured by the cloudings incident to casting, that beauty in its shyest grace, was now revealed. Round and round the bell, twelve figures of gay girls, garlanded, hand in hand, danced in a choral ring. 
the embodied hours. Banadona, said the chief, this bell excels all else. No added touch could here improve. Hark, hearing a sound, was that the wind? The wind, Excellenza, was the light response. But the figures, they are not yet without their faults. They need some touches yet. When those are given, and the block yonder, pointing towards the canvas screen, when Haman there, as I merrily call him, him, it, I mean, when Haman is fixed on this, his lofty tree, then, gentlemen, will I be most happy to receive you here again. The equivocal reference to the object caused some return of restlessness. However, on their part, the visitors forbore further allusion to it, unwilling, perhaps, to let the foundling see how easily it lay within his plebeian art to stir the placid dignity of nobles. "'Well, Bonadonna," said the chief, "'how long ere you are ready to set the clock going, so that the hour shall be sounded? Our interest in you, not less than in the work itself, makes us anxious to be assured of your success.' The people, too, why, they are shouting now. Say the exact hour when you will be ready. Tomorrow, Excellenza, if you listen for it, or should you not, all the same, strange music will be heard. The stroke of one shall be the first from yonder bell. Pointing to the bell, adorned with girls and garlands, that stroke shall fall there where the hand of Una clasps Duas. The stroke of one shall sever that loved clasp. Tomorrow, then, at one o'clock, as struck here, precisely here, advancing and placing his finger upon the clasp, the poor mechanic will be most happy once more to give you liege audience in this his littered shop. Farewell till then, illustrious magnificos, and hark ye for your vassal's stroke." his still volcanic face hiding its burning brightness like a forge he moved with ostentatious deference towards the scuttle as if so far to escort their exit but the junior magistrate a kind-hearted man troubled at what seemed to him a certain sardonical disdain lurking beneath the foundling's humble mien and in christian sympathy more distressed at it on his account than on his own dimly surmising what might be the final fate of such a cynic solitaire, nor perhaps uninfluenced by the general strangeness of surrounding things, this good magistrate had glanced sadly sideways from the speaker, and there upon his foreboding eye had started at the expression of the unchanging face of the hour Una. "'How is this, Bonadonna? he lowly asked. Una looks unlike her sisters. In Christ's name, Bonadonna impulsively broke in the chief, his attention for the first attracted to the figure by his associate's remark. Una's face looks just like that of Deborah, the prophetess, as painted by Florentine del Fonca. Surely, Bonadonna, lowly resumed the milder magistrate, you meant the twelve should wear the same jocundly abandoned air, but see, the smile of Una seems but a fatal one. Tis different." While his mild associate was speaking, the chief glanced inquiringly from him to the caster, as if anxious to mark how the discrepancy would be accounted for. As the chief stood, his advanced foot was on the scuttle's curb. Bonadonna spoke. "'Excellenza, now that, uh, following your keener eye, I glance upon the face of Una, I do indeed perceive some little variance, but look all round the bell and you will find no two faces entirely correspond, because there is a law in art, but the cold wind is rising more, these lattices are but a poor defense. Suffer me, magnificos, to conduct you, at least, partly on your way. Those in whose well-being there is a public stake should be heedfully attended. Touching the look of Una, you were saying, Bonadonna, that there was a certain law in art, observed the chief, as the three now descended the stone shaft. Pray tell me, then, pardon, another time, Excellenza, the tower is damp. Nay, I must rest and hear it now. Here, here is a wide landing. 
and through this leeward slit no wind but ample light tell us of your law and at large since excellenza you insist know that there is a law in art which bars the possibility of duplicates some years ago you may remember i graved a small seal for your republic bearing for its chief device the head of your own ancestor its illustrious founder it becoming necessary for the customs use to have innumerable impressions for bales and boxes i graved an entire plate containing one hundred of the seals now though indeed my object was to have those hundred heads identical and though i dare say people think them so yet upon closely scanning an uncut impression from the plate no two of those five score faces side by side will be found alike gravity is the heir of all but diversified in all in some benevolent in some ambiguous in two or three to a close scrutiny all but incipiently malign the variation of less than a hair's breadth in the linear shadings round the mouth sufficing to all this now excellenza transmute that general gravity into joyousness and subject it to twelve of those variations i have described and tell me will you not have my hours here and una one of them but i like hark is that a footfall above mortar excellenza sometimes it drops to the belfry floor from the arch where the stonework was left undressed i must have it seen to as i was about to say for one i like this law forbidding duplicates it evokes fine personalities yes excellenza that strange and to you uncertain smile and those forelooking eyes of una suit banadona very well hark sure we left no soul above no soul excellenza rest assured no soul again the mortar it fell not while we were there ah in your presence it better knew its place excellenza blandly bowed benedona but una said the milder magistrate she seemed intently gazing on you one would have almost sworn that she picked you out from among us three if she did possibly it might have been her finer apprehension excellenza how benedona i, I do not understand you no consequence no consequence excellenza but the shifted wind is blowing through the slit suffer me to escort you on and then pardon but the toiler must to his tools it may be foolish senor said the milder magistrate as from the third landing the two now went down unescorted but somehow our great mechanician moves me strangely why just now when he so superciliously replied his walk seemed Cicera's, god's vain foe in delfonca's painting and that young sculptured deborah too ay and that tush tush signor returned the chief a passing whim deborah oh, where's jael pray ah said the other as they now stepped upon the sod ah signor i see you leave your fears behind you with the chill and gloom but mine even in this sunny air remain hark it was a sound from just within the tower door whence they had emerged turning they saw it closed he has slipped down and barred us out smiled the chief but it is his custom proclamation was now made that the next day at one hour after meridian the clock would strike and thanks to the mechanician's powerful art with unusual accompaniments but what those should be none as yet could say the announcement was received with cheers by the looser sort who encamped about the tower all night lights were seen gleaming through the topmost blindwork only disappearing with the morning sun strange sounds too were heard or were thought to be by those whom anxious watching might not have left mentally undisturbed sounds not only of some ringing implement but also so they said half suppressed screams and planings such as might have issued from some ghostly engine overplied 
Slowly the day drew on, part of the concourse chasing the weary time with songs and games, till at last the great blurred sun rolled like a football against the plain. At noon the nobility and principal citizens came from the town in cavalcade, a guard of soldiers also, with music, the more to honor the occasion. Only one hour more. Impatience grew. Watches were held in hands of feverish men, who stood now scrutinizing their small dial plates, and then, with neck thrown back, gazing toward the belfry, as if the eye might foretell that which could only be made sensible to the ear, for as yet there was no dial to the tower clock. The hour hands of a thousand watches now verged within a hair's breadth of the figure one. A silence, as of the expectation of some Shiloh, pervaded the swarming plain. Suddenly a dull, mangled sound, not ringing in it, scarcely audible, indeed to the outer circle of the people, that dull sound dropped heavily from the belfry. At the same moment each man stared at his neighbor blankly. All watches were upheld, all our hands were at, had passed, the figure one. No bell stroke from the tower, the multitude became tumultuous. Waiting a few moments, the chief magistrate, commanding silence, hailed the belfry to know what thing unforeseen had happened there. No response. He hailed again, and yet again. All continued hushed. By his order the soldiers burst in the tower door, when, stationing guards to defend it from the now surging mob, the chief, accompanied by his former associate, climbed the winding stairs. Halfway up they stopped to listen. No sound. Mounting faster, they reached the belfry, but at the threshold started at the spectacle disclosed. A spaniel, which, unbeknown to them, had followed them thus far, stood shivering as before some unknown monster in a brake or, rather, as if it snuffed footsteps leading to some other world. Banadona lay, prostrate and bleeding, at the base of the bell which was adorned with girls and garlands. He lay at the feet of the hour Una, his head coinciding in a vertical line with her left hand clasped by the hour Dua. With downcast face impending over him, like Jael over nailed Sisera in the tent, was the domino, now no more becloaked. It had limbs, and seemed clad in a scaly mail lustrous as a dragon beetle's. It was manacled, and its clubbed arms were uplifted, as if with its manacles once more to smite its already smitten victim. One advanced foot of it was inserted beneath the dead body, as if in the act of spurning it. Uncertainty falls on what now followed. It were but natural to suppose that the magistrates would at first shrink from immediate personal contact with what they saw. At the least, for a time, they would stand in involuntary doubt, it may be in more or less of horrified alarm. Certain it is that an arquebus was called for from below, and some add that its report, followed by a fierce whiz, as of the sudden snapping of a mainspring, with a steely din, as if a stack of sword-blades should be dashed upon a pavement. These blended sounds came ringing to the plain, attracting every eye far upward to the belfry, whence, through the lattice-work, thin wreaths of smoke were curling. Some averred that it was the spaniel, gone mad by fear, which was shot. This others denied. True it was, the spaniel never more was seen, and probably, for some unknown reason, it shared the burial now to be related of the domino. For whatever the preceding circumstances may have been, the first instinctive panic over, or else all ground of reasonable fear removed, the two magistrates by themselves quickly re-hooded the figure in the dropped cloak wherein it had been hoisted. The same night it was secretly lowered to the ground, smuggled to the beach, pulled far out to sea, and sunk. Nor to any after urgency, even in free convivial hours, 
would the twain ever disclose the full secrets of the belfry. From the mystery unavoidably investing it, the popular solution of the foundling's fate involved more or less of supernatural agency. But some few less unscientific minds pretended to find little difficulty in otherwise accounting for it. In the chain of circumstantial inferences drawn there may, or may not, have been some absent or defective links. But as the explanation in question is the only one which tradition has explicitly preserved, in dearth of better, it will here be given. But, in the first place, it is requisite to present the supposition entertained as to the entire motive and mode with their origin of the secret design of Bonadonna, the minds above mentioned assuming to penetrate as well into his soul as into the event. The disclosure will indirectly involve reference to peculiar matters, none of, the clearest, beyond the immediate subject. At that period no large bell was made to sound otherwise than as at present, by agitation of a tongue within, by means of ropes, or percussion from without, either from cumbrous machinery or stalwart watchmen, armed with heavy hammers, stationed in the belfry or in sentry-boxes on the open roof, according as the bell was sheltered or exposed. It was from observing these exposed bells with their watchmen that the foundling, as was opined, derived the first suggestion of his scheme. Perched on a great mast or spire, the human figure viewed from below undergoes such a reduction in its apparent size as to obliterate its intelligent features. It evinces no personality. Instead of bespeaking volition, its gestures rather resemble the automatic ones of the arms of a telegraph. Musing, therefore, upon the purely Punchinello aspect of the human figure thus beheld, it had indirectly occurred to Bonadonna to devise some metallic agent which should strike the hour with its mechanic hand with even greater precision than the vital one, and, moreover, as the vital watchman on the roof, sallying from his retreat at the given periods, walked to the bell with uplifted mace to smite it, Bonadonna had resolved that his invention should likewise possess the power of locomotion, and, along with that, the appearance, at least, of intelligence and will. If the conjectures of those who claimed acquaintance with the intent of Bonadonna be thus far correct, no unenterprising spirit could have been his. But they stopped not here, intimating that though, indeed, his design had, in the first place, been prompted by the sight of the watchman, and confined to the devising of a subtle substitute for him, yet, as is not seldom the case with projectors, by insensible gradations, proceeding from comparatively pygmy aims to titanic ones, the original scheme had, in its anticipated eventualities, at last attained to an unheard-of degree of daring. He still bent his efforts upon the locomotive figure for the belfry, but only as a partial type of an ulterior creature, a sort of elephantine helot, adapted to further, in a degree scarcely to be imagined, the universal conveniences and glories of humanity, supplying nothing less than a supplement to the six days' work, stalking the earth with a new surf, more useful than the ox, swifter than the dolphin, stronger than the lion, more cunning than the ape, for industry an ant, more fiery than serpents, and yet, in patience, another ass. All excellences of all God-made creatures which served man were here to receive advancement, and then to be combined in one. Talus was to have been the all-accomplished helot's name, Talus, iron slave to Benadona, and through him to man. Here it might well be thought that, were these last conjectures as to the foundling's secrets not erroneous, then must he have been hopelessly infected with the craziest chimeras of his age, far outgoing Albert Magus and Cornelius Agrippa. But the contrary was averred. However marvelous his design, however apparently transcending not alone the bounds of human invention, but those of divine creation, 
yet the proposed means to be employed were alleged to have been confined within the sober forms of sober reason. It was affirmed that, to a degree of more than skeptic scorn, Bonadonna had been without sympathy for any of the vainglorious irrationalities of his time. For example, he had not concluded with the visionaries among the metaphysicians that between the finer mechanic forces and the ruder animal vitality some germ of correspondence might prove discoverable. As little did his scheme partake of the enthusiasm of some natural philosophers who hoped, by physiological and chemical inductions, to arrive at a knowledge of the source of life, and so qualify themselves to manufacture and improve upon it. Much less had he aught in common with the tribe of alchemists, who sought by a species of incantations to evoke some surprising vitality from the laboratory. Neither had he imagined with certain sanguine theosophists that by faithful adoration of the highest unheard of powers would be vouchsafed to man. A practical materialist, what Bannadonna had aimed at, was to have been reached not by logic, not by crucible, not by conjuration, not by altars, but by plain vice-bench and hammer. In short, to solve nature, to steal into her, to intrigue upon her, to procure some one else to bind her to his hand. These, one and all, had not been his objects but asking no favors from any element or any being of himself to rival her, outstrip her, and rule her. He stooped to conquer. With him common sense was theurgy, machinery, miracle, Prometheus, the heroic name for machinist, man, the true god. Nevertheless, in his initial step, so far as the experimental automaton for the belfry was concerned, he allowed fancy some little play, or perhaps what seemed his fancifulness was but his utilitarian ambition collaterally extended. In figure the creature for the belfry should not be likened after the human pattern, nor any animal one, or after the ideals, however wild, of ancient fable, but equally in aspect as in organism be an original production the more terrible to behold, the better. Such, then, were the suppositions as to the present scheme and the reserved intent. How, at the very threshold, so unlooked for a catastrophe overturned all, or rather, what was the conjecture here, is now to be set forth. It was thought that on the day preceding the fatality, his visitors having left him, Bonadonna had unpacked the belfry image adjusted it, and placed it in the retreat provided, a sort of sentry-box in one corner of the belfry. In short, throughout the night, and for some part of the ensuing morning, he had been engaged in arranging everything connected with the domino, the issuing from the sentry-box each sixty minutes, sliding along a grooved way like a railway, advancing to the clock-bell with uplifted manacles, striking it at one of the twelve junctions of the four-and-twenty hands, then wheeling, circling the bell, and retiring to its post, there to abide for another sixty minutes, when the same process was to be repeated. The bell, by a cunning mechanism, meantime turning on its vertical axis, so as to present to the descending mace the clasped hands of the next two figures, when it would strike two, three, and so on, to the end. The musical metal in this time-bell being so managed in the fusion by some art perishing with its originator, that each of the clasps of the four-and-twenty hands should give forth its own peculiar resonance when parted. But on the magic metal the magic and metallic stranger never struck but that one stroke, drove but that one nail, served but that one clasped, by which Bonadonna clung to his ambitious life. For after winding up the creature in the sentry-box, so that, for the present, skipping the intervening hours, it should not emerge till the hour of one, but should then infallibly emerge, 
and, after deftly oiling the grooves whereon it was to slide, it was surmised that the mechanician must then have hurried to the bell to give his final touches to its sculpture. True artist he here became absorbed, and absorption still further intensified, it may be, by his striving to abate that strange look of Una, which, though before others, he had treated with such unconcern, might not, in secret, have been without its thorn. And so, for the interval, he was oblivious of his creature, which, not oblivious of him, and true to its creation, and true to its heedful winding up, left its post precisely at the given moment, along its well-oiled route, slid noiselessly towards its mark, and, aiming at the hand of Una, to ring one clangorous note, dully smote the intervening brain of Banadona, turned backwards to it. The manacled arms then instantly upspringing to their hovering poise. The falling body clogged the thing's return. So there it stood, still impending over Banadona, as if whispering some post-mortem terror. The chisel lay dropped from the hand, but beside the hand the oil-flask spilled across the iron track. In his unhappy end, not unmindful of the rare genius of the mechanician, the Republic decreed him a stately funeral. It was resolved that the great bell, the one whose casting had been jeopardized through the timidity of the ill-starred workman, should be rung upon the entrance of the bier into the cathedral. The most robust man of the country round was assigned the office of bell-ringer. As the pallbearers entered the cathedral porch, naught but a broken and disastrous sound, like that of some lone alpine landslide, fell from the tower upon their ears, and then all was hushed. Glancing backwards they saw the groined belfry crashed sideways in. It afterwards appeared that the powerful peasant, who had the bell-rope in charge, wishing to test at once the full glory of the bell, had swayed down upon the rope with one concentrated jerk. The mass of quaking metal, too ponderous for its frame, and strangely feeble somewhere at its top, loosed from its fastening, tore sideways down, and tumbling in one sheer fall three hundred feet to the soft sward below, buried itself inverted and half out of sight. Upon its disinternment the main fracture was found to have started from a small spot in the ear, which, being scraped, revealed a defect, deceptively minute in the castings, which defect must subsequently have been pasted over with some unknown compound. The remolten metal soon reassumed its place in the tower's repaired superstructure. For one year, the metallic choir of birds sang musically in its belfry bow-work of sculptured blinds and traceries. But on the first anniversary of the tower's completion, at early dawn, before the concourse had surrounded it, an earthquake came. One loud crash was heard. The stone pine, with all its bower of songsters, lay overthrown upon the plain so the blind slave obeyed its blinder lord, but in obedience slew him. So the creator was killed by the creature. So the bell was too heavy for the tower. So the bell's main weakness was where man's blood had flawed it. And so pride went before the fall. End of chapter 6 The Bell Tower and End of the Piazza Tales by Herman Melville